preface of Our Cats and All About Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in March 2011. Our Cats and All About Them Their Varieties, Habits, and Management, and for show, the Standard of Excellence and Beauty described and pictured by harrison weir f r h s to my dear wife alice mary i dedicate this book in token of my appreciation of her gentle and tender kindness towards all animal life more particularly the cat itsley seven oaks preface what is odd but as tis valued Troilus and Cressida, Act Two. The following notes and illustrations of and respecting the cat are the outcome of over fifty years' careful, thoughtful, heedful observation, much research, and not unprofitable attention to the facts and fancies of others. From a tiny child to the present, the love of nature has been my chief delight. Animals and birds have not only been objects of study, but of deep and absorbing interest. I have noted their habits, watched their ways, and found lasting pleasure in their companionship. This love of animal life and nature, with all its moods and phases, has grown with me from childhood to manhood, and is not the least enjoyable part of my old age. Among animals, possibly the most perfect, and certainly the most domestic, is the cat. I did not think so always, having had a bias against it, and was some time coming to this belief. Nevertheless, such is the fact. It is a veritable part of our household, and is both useful, quiet, affectionate, and ornamental. The small or large dog may be regarded and petted, but is generally useless. The cat, a pet or not, is of service. Were it not for our cats, rats and mice would overrun our house, buildings, cultivated, and other lands. If there were not millions of cats, there would be billions of vermin. Long ages of neglect, ill-treatment, and absolute cruelty, with little or no gentleness, kindness, or training, have made the cat self-reliant, and from this emanates the marvelous powers of observation, the concentration of which has produced a state analogous to reasoning, not unmixed with timidity, caution, wildness, and a retaliative nature. But should a new order of things arise, and it is nurtured, petted, cosseted, talked to, noticed, and trained, with mellowed firmness and tender gentleness, then, in but a few generations, much evil that bygone cruelty has stamped into its often wretched existence will disappear, and it will be more than ever not only a useful, serviceable helpmate, but an object of increasing interest, admiration, and cultured beauty, and, thus being of value, profitable. Having said this much, I turn to the pleasurable duty of recording my deep sense of the kindness of those warm-hearted friends who have assisted me in my labor of love, not the least among these being those publishers who, with a generous and prompt alacrity, gave me permission to make extracts, excerpts, notes, and quotations from the following high-class works, their property. My best thanks are due to Messrs. Longmans and Company, Blaine's Encyclopedia of British Sports, Allen and Company, Rev. J. F. Thistleton Dyer's English Folklore, Castle and Company Limited, Dr. Brewer's Dictionary of Phrase and Fable, and Old and New London, Messrs. Chateau and Windus, History of Signboards, Mr. J. Murray, Jameson's Scottish Dictionary, and others. I am also indebted to Messrs. Walker and Bootle and the Phototype Company for the able manner in which they have rendered my drawings and for the careful printing to my good friends Messrs. Charles Dickens and Evans. Harrison Weir, Idsley, Sevenoaks, May 5, 1889.
Preface to New Edition. Twas pitiful, twas wondrous pitiful. Othello. Some time has passed since I published my book, Our Cats and All About Them, in 1889, and much has taken place regarding these household pets. All know as well as myself that each and everything about us changes, nothing stands still, that which is of today is past, and that which was hidden often revealed, sometimes by mere accident, at others by scientific research but one was scarcely prepared in any way for so wonderful a find as that of the large number of mummy cats at Beni Hassan, central Egypt. They were discovered by an Egyptian fella employed in husbandry who tumbled into a pit which, on further examination, proved to be a large subterranean cave completely filled with mummy cats, every one of which had been separately embalmed and wrapped in cloth after the manner of the Egyptian human mummies, all being laid out carefully in rows, and here they had lain probably about three or four thousand years. The totem of a section of the ancients, as is well known, was the cat. Hence, when a cat died, it was buried with due honours, being embalmed and often decorated in various ways, and, in short, had as much attention paid to it as a human being. It had long been believed that a cat cemetery existed on the east bank of the Nile, and in the autumn of 1889 the lucky Egyptian, about 100 miles from Cairo, came unexpectedly upon it. Immediately on the find becoming known, specimen mummy cats were written for to agents in Egypt, one friend of mine sending for four, and it appeared for a while that much money would be realized by the owner of the cave, or land, in this way, but the number was too great, and the prices and the interest gave way, and, sad to relate, these former deities were dug out of their resting place by hundreds of thousands, and quickly sold to local farmers, being used for enriching the land. Other lots found their way to an Alexandrian merchant, and were by him sent to Liverpool on board the steamer Ferris and Thebes. The consignment consisted of nineteen and a half tons, and were sold by auction, mostly being bought by a local fertilizer merchant. The auction was only known to the trade, and the lots were knocked down at the giving away sums of three pounds thirteen shillings nine pence, three pounds seventeen shillings to four pounds five shillings per ton the big and the perfect ones being picked out for the museum and private collections. The broker who sold used the head of one of these cats in lieu of an auctioneer's hammer. And now these tons of deified cats are used for manure, and in our English soil plants grow into them, and on them, and off them, and if it be true, as chemists assert, these plants take into their system that on which they feed, and so, if so, possibly in our very bread that we have eaten, we have swallowed a little at a time part of, if not the whole, of a deified cat. I made several endeavours to find out from those on the spot at Liverpool whether there was any hair of colours in existence among the mass of bodies, but in no case could I succeed in getting any, as I had hoped by this means, to possibly come to some conclusion as to the kind of breed. Of course, it is well known from mummies long in this country what form, size, and general appearance the Egyptian possessed, but as yet, as far as I can learn, no one has found so much, if any, of the fur as to be able to determine the color. Apropos with the above, as applying the bodies of the mummy cats for manure comes the modern idea of keeping cats for their fur. It is stated that a company has been formed in America for that purpose in Washington, and an island of some size has been bought or leased for the purpose. The intention is to raise entirely black cats, and as their place of abode will be surrounded by water, it is conjectured that after the first importation they will go on propagating and producing only cats of that beautiful though somber dark hue. The cats with which the island is to be stocked are to be procured from Holland, where already the industry is at work. 
so much so that a friend of mine an elderly gentleman sending to a furrier in holland to know what kind of fur he would recommend as the best for warmth received the reply that cat skins were the most useful and warmest a few days ago he called on me wrapped in a cloth coat with fur collar and cuffs and lining throughout of black cat's skins and i am bound to say that the general appearance was much in its favour he also stated that he was in every way perfectly satisfied by the by the cat company intend to feed their cats on fish which abound about the shores of their island and so they affirm the food will cost nothing and their profits consequently be very large but in this i hope they have been well informed as to the adaptability of the cat to feed entirely on fish for of this i have my doubts certainly those i have had did not appear to thrive if they had fish too often again as the cats are to roam the island at their own sweet will i take it there will be at times some damaging of fur by the playful way in which they so often engaged when jealousy incites them to mortal combat but possibly this has been considered and duly entered in the profit and loss account while writing that portion of my book in which i referred to the superstitions connected with the domestic cat and the amazing stories told of the witches cats i felt convinced that in those darkened and foolish times the very fact of the wonderful faculty the cat possesses of applying what it observes to its own purposes was in some way the cause of the ignorant and superstitious considering that it was possessed of an evil spirit i therefore searched for proofs among the evidence given at the trial of witches and was as i expected rewarded for my trouble what a cat would do now would not unreasonably be thought clever and showing much sagacity if not attributes of a deeper kind yet i find that at a trial for witchcraft the following questions were put to a man well and what did you see well i saw her cat walk up and try to open the door by the latch what did you do i immediately killed it this which is now regarded as an everyday example of the intelligence of the cat bore hardly in the evidence against the witch sir walter scott in his letter on demonology and witchcraft tells of a poor old woman condemned as usual on her own confession and on the testimony of a neighbor who deposed that he saw a cat jump in the accused person's cottage through the window at twilight one evening and that he verily believed the cat to be the devil on which precious testimony the poor wretch was hanged one more note and i leave the subject a certain carpenter named william montgomery was so infested with cats which as his servant maid reported spoke among themselves that he fell in a rage upon a party of these animals which had assembled in his house at irregular hours and betwixt his highland arms of knife dirk and broadsword and his professional weapon of an axe he made such a dispersion that they were quiet for the night in consequence of his blows two witches are said to have died since writing of the english wildcat i had the pleasure of meeting mr francis darwin brother of mr charles darwin on board the steamboat going to st servan when in the course of conversation he informed me that a wild cat was killed at bramhope moor plantation in eighteen forty one a keeper having caught it in two traps in february of this year eighteen ninety one my kind friend mr dresser of orpington the well-known naturalist wrote to me to know whether i would like to have a kitten half-bred between the british wildcat and a domestic she-cat which i was unfortunately obliged to decline fearing it would make matters unpleasant with what i had he very kindly supplied me with the following particulars forwarded to him by o h mactire esq mr harrison weir can see the papa of the kitten at the zoo he is a young cat under a year old we thought by the teeth he was seen one moonlight night in company with my stalker's small lean black cat right away in my deer forest 
we caught the papa in a trap after he had killed a number of grouse and not being badly hurt i sent him to bartlett at the zoo we are thoroughly up to real wild cats here i have caught them forty-three inches from nose to tail end tails as thick at the point as at the root the ears are also differently set on martin cats pole cats and badgers are all extinct here and it is ten years since we got the last wild cat but three have been killed in this district this winter i insert the foregoing as being of much interest it having been frequently stated that the wild cat will not mate with the domestic cat the kitten offered to me is now at folly court bucks among the numerous letters i have received from america is one from mrs mary a c livermore of cambridge massachusetts u s a who writes i have just come possessed of a black long-haired cat from maine it is neither persian angora nor indian they are called here coon cats and it is vulgarly supposed to be a cross between a common cat and a coon mine is a rusty bare brown colour but his relatives have been black and white blue and white and fawn and white the latter the gentlest prettiest cat i know his tail is very bushy and a fine ruff adorns his neck a friend of mine has a pair of these cats all black and the female consorts with no one but her mate yet often she has in her litter a common short-haired kitten since the above reached me i have received from another correspondent in the united states a very beautiful photograph of what is termed a coon cat it certainly differs much from the ordinary long-haired cat in appearance but as to its being a cross with the raccoon such a supposition is totally out of the question and the idea cannot be entertained the photographs sent to me show that the ears are unusually large the head long the length being in excess from the eyes to the tip of the nose the legs and feet are large and evenly covered with long somewhat coarse hair the latter being devoid of tufts between and at the extremity of the toes there are no long hairs of any consequence either within the ears or at their apex the frill or mane is considerable as is the length of the hair covering the body the tail is rather short and somewhat thick well covered with hair of equal length and in shape like a fox's brush the eyes are large round and full with a wild staring expression certainly the breed however it may be obtained is most interesting to the cat naturalist and the colour as before stated being peculiar must of course attract his attention independently of its general appearance since the above was written i have received the following from mr henry brooker the elms west midford massachusetts united states of america after asking for information respecting cats of certain breeds he says i have had for a number of years a peculiar strain of long-haired cats they come from the islands off the coast of maine and are known in this country as coon cats the belief is that they have been crossed with the coon this of course is untrue the inhabitants of these islands are seafaring people and many years ago someone on his vessel had a pair of long-haired cats from which the strain has sprung there are few short-haired cats on the island as there is no communication with the mainland except by boat i want to improve my strain and get finer hair than the cats now have yellow cats are the most popular kind here and i have succeeded in producing cats of a rich mahogany colour with brushes like a fox they hunt in the fields with me and my scotch terriers and they are on the most friendly terms this as a corroboration of the foregoing letters and the photographs is i take it eminently satisfactory i have been shown a siberian cat by mr castang of Leadenhall market the breed is entirely new to me it is a small female cat of a slaty blue colour rather short in body and legs the head is small and much rounded while the ears are of medium size the iris of the eyes is a deep golden colour which in contrast to the bluish colour of the fur makes them to appear still more brilliant the tail is short and thick very much so at the base and suddenly pointed at the tip it is particularly timid and wild in its nature 
and is difficult to approach but as mr castang observed this timidity may be because it does not understand our language and does not know when it is called or spoken to i think it would make a valuable cat to cross with some english varieties a correspondent writes in your book on cats you do not mention norwegian cats i was in norway last year and was struck by the cats being different to any i had ever seen being much stouter built with thick close fur mostly sandy with stripes of dark yellow i suppose i am to infer that both the sexes are of a sandy yellow color if so i should say it is more a matter of selection than a new color i find generally in the colder countries the fur is short dense and somewhat woolly and as a rule judging from the information that i am continually receiving whole or entire colors predominate large cats are by some sought after this i take it is a great mistake the fairly medium-sized cat being much the handsomer of the two and they are generally also devoid of that coarseness that is found apparent in the former while small cats are extremely pretty and i understand are not only likely to be in vogue but are actually now being bred for their extreme prettiness I have heard of some of these bantam cats being produced by that true and most excellent fancier, Mr. Herbert Young, who not only has produced a tortoise-shell tomcat on lines laid down by myself, but is also engaged in breeding more, and I have not the least doubt he will be most successful, he having so been in producing new colors, and some of the finest silver tabby short-haired cats as yet seen these short-haired cats in my opinion far surpassing for beauty any long hair ever exhibited and are certainly of a sweeter disposition in my former edition of our cats i wrote hopefully and expectantly of much good to be derived from the institution of the so-called national cat club and of which i was then president but i am sorry to say that none of those hopes or expectations have been realized and i feel now the deepest regret that i was ever induced to be in any way associated with it i do not care to go into particulars further than to say i found the principal idea of many of its members consisted not so much in promoting the welfare of the cat as of winning prizes and more particularly their own cat club medals for which though offered at public shows the public were not allowed to compete and when worn by the members in many cases the public were thoughtlessly misled by believing it was an open competition i therefore felt it my duty to leave the club for that and other reasons i have also left off judging of the cats even at my old much-loved show at the crystal palace because i no longer cared to come into contact with such lovers of cats i am very much in favor of the cats homes the one at dublin in which miss swift takes so much interest the one in london with miss mayhew working for it with the zeal of a true cat lover and that where mr colam is the manager all deserve and have my sincerest and warmest approbation sympathy and support standing out as they do in such bright contrast to those self-styled cat lovers the national cat club Harrison Weir, F. R. H. S. Idsley, Seven Oaks, March twelfth, eighteen ninety two. End of preface. Section two of Our Cats and All About Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Babb. Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir. Section 2. Introductory. After a cat show at the Crystal Palace, I usually receive a number of letters requesting information. One asks, What is a true tortoise shell like? Another, What is a tabby? and yet another what is a blue tabby. One writes of the splendid disposition of his cat, another asks how to cure a cat scratching the furniture, and so on. After much consideration, and also at the request of many, I have thought it best to publish my notes on cats, 
their ways, habits, instincts, peculiarities, usefulness, colors, markings, forms, and other qualities that are required as fitting subjects to exhibit at what has now become one of the instituted exhibitions of the land we live in, and also the folk and other lore, both ancient and modern, respecting them. It is many years ago that, when thinking of the large number of cats kept in London alone, I conceived the idea that it would be well to hold cat shows, so that the different breeds, colors, markings, etc., might be more carefully attended to, and the domestic cat sitting in front of the fire would then possess a beauty and an attractiveness to its owner unobserved and unknown because uncultivated heretofore. Prepossessed with this view of the subject, I called on my friend Mr. Wilkinson, the then manager of the Crystal Palace. With his usual business-like clear-headedness, he saw it was a thing to be done. In a few days, I presented my scheme in full working order. The schedule of prizes, the price of entry, the number of classes, and the points by which they would be judged. The number of prizes in each class, their amount, the different varieties of color, form, size, and sex for which they were to be given. I also made a drawing of the head of a cat to be printed in black on yellow paper for a posting bill. Mr. F. Wilson, the company's naturalist and show manager, then took the matter in charge, worked hard, got a goodly number of cats together, among which was my blue tabby, the old lady, then about 14 years old, yet the best in the show of its color and never surpassed, though lately possibly equaled. To my watch chain I have attached the silver bell she wore at her debut. My brother, John Jenner Weir, the Reverend J. McDonough and myself acted as judges, and the result was a success far beyond our most sanguine expectations, so much so that I, having made it a labor of love of the feline race, and acting without fee, gratuity, or reward, the Crystal Palace Company generously presented me with a large silver tankard in token of their high approval of my exertions on behalf of the company and cats. Now that a cat club is formed, shows are more numerous, and the entries increasing, there is every reason to expect a permanent benefit in every way to one of the most intelligent of, though often much abused, animals. The First Cat Show On the day for judging at Ludgate Hall, I took a ticket and the train for the Crystal Palace. Sitting alone in the comfortable cushioned compartment of a first class, I confess I felt somewhat more than anxious as to the issue of the experiment. Yes, what would it be like? Would there be many cats? How many? How would the animals comfort themselves in their cages? Would they sulk or cry for liberty? Refuse all food? Or settle down and take the situation quietly and resignedly? Or give way to terror? I could in no way picture to myself the scene. It was all so new. Presently, and while I was musing on the subject, the door opened, and a friend got in. Ah, he said, how are you? Tolerably well, said I. I am on my way to the cat show. What? said my friend. That surpasses everything. A show of cats. Why, I hate the things. I drive them off my premises when I see them. You'll have a fine bother with them in their cages. Or are they to be tied up? Anyhow, what a noise there will be, and how they will clutch at the bars and try and get out, or they will strangle themselves with their chains. I am sorry, very sorry, said I, that you do not like cats. For my part, I think them extremely beautiful, also very graceful in all their actions, and they are quite as domestic in their habits as the dog, if not more so. They are very useful in catching rats and mice. They are not deficient in sense. They will jump up at doors to push up latches with their paws. I have known them knock at a door by the knocker when wanting admittance. They know Sunday from the weekday, and do not go out to wait for the meat barrel on that day. They... Stop, said my friend. I see you do like cats, and I do not, so let the matter drop. No, said I, not so. This is why I instituted this cat show. I wish everyone to see how beautiful a well-cared-for cat is, and how docile, gentle, and, may I use the term, cossity, 
Why should not the cat that sits purring in front of us before the fire be an object of interest and be selected for its color, markings, and form? Now come with me, my dear old friend, and see the first cat show. Inside the Crystal Palace stood my friend and I. Instead of the noise and struggles to escape, there lay the cats in their different pens, reclining on crimson cushions, making no sound save now and then a homely purring, as from time to time they lapped the nice new milk provided for them. Yes, there they were, big cats, very big cats, middling-sized cats, and small cats. Cats of all colors and markings, and beautiful pure white Persian cats. And as we passed down the front of the cages, I saw that my friend became interested. Presently he said, What a beauty this is! And here's another! And no doubt, said I, many of the cats you have seen before would be quite as beautiful if they were as well cared for, or at least cared for at all. Generally they are driven about and ill-fed and often ill-used, simply for the reason that they are cats and for no other. Yet I feel a great pleasure in telling you the show would have been much larger were it not for the difficulty of inducing the owners to send their pets from home, though you see the great care that is taken of them. Well, I had no idea there was such a variety of form, size, and color, said my friend, and departed. A few months after, I called on him. He was at luncheon with two cats on a chair beside him. Pets, I should say, from their appearance. This is not a solitary instance of the good of the first cat show in leading up to the observation of and kindly feeling for the domestic cat. Since then, throughout the length and breadth of the land, there have been cat shows, and much interest is taken in them by all classes of the community, so much so that large prices have been paid for handsome specimens. It is to be hoped that by these shows the too often despised cat will meet with the attention and kind treatment that every dumb animal should have and ought to receive at the hands of humanity. Even the few instances of the shows generating a love for cats that have come before my own notice are a sufficient pleasure to me not to regret having thought out and planned the first cat show at the Crystal Palace. End of Section 2 Recording by Bill Babb Section 3 of Our Cats and All About Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir. Habits. Before attempting to describe the different varieties, I should like to make a few remarks as to the habits and ways of the domestic cat. When judging, I have frequently found some of the exhibits of anything but a mild and placid disposition. Some have displayed a downright ferocity, others, on the contrary, have been excessively gentle, and very few but seemed to recognize their position and submitted quietly to their confinement. This is easily accounted for when persons are accustomed to cats. They know what wonderful powers of observation the cat possesses, and how quickly they recognize the why and the wherefore of many things. Take, for instance, how very many cats will open a latched door by springing up and holding on with one foreleg, while with the other they press down the latch catch, and so open the door. And yet even more observant are they than that, as I have shown by a case in my Animal Stories Old and New, in which a cat opened a door by pulling it towards him, when he found pushing it of no avail. The cat is more critical in noticing than the dog. I never knew but one dog that would open a door by moving the fastening without being shown or taught how to do it. Cats that have done so are numberless. I noticed one at the last Crystal Palace show, a white cat. It looked up, it looked down, then to the right and then a little to the left, paused, seemed lost in thought, when, not seeing any one about, it crept up to the door and with its paw tried to pull back the bolt or catch. On getting sight of me, it retired to a corner of the cage, shut its eyes, and pretended to sleep. I stood further away and soon saw the paw coming through the bars again. 
This cat had noticed how the cage door was fastened, and so knew how to open it. Many cats that are said to be spiteful are made so by ill treatment, for, as a rule, I have found them to be most affectionate and gentle, and that to the last degree, attaching themselves to individuals, although such is stated not to be the case, yet of this I am certain. Having had several in my house at one time, I found that no two were the followers of the same member of my family. But it may be argued, and I think with some degree of justice, why was this? Was it only that each cat had a separate liking? If so, why? Why should not three or four cats take a liking to the same individual? But they seldom or never do, and for that matter there seems somewhat the same feeling with dogs. This required some consideration, but not that of long duration. For I am sorry to say, I rapidly came to the conclusion that it was jealousy. Yes, jealousy. There was no doubt of it. Zeno would be very cossety, loving, lovable, and gentle, but when Lulu came in and was nursed, he retired to a corner and seized the first opportunity of vanishing through the door. As soon as Zilla jumped on my knee and put her paws about my neck, Lulu looked at me, then at her, then at me, walked to the fire, sat down, looked round, got up, went to the door, cried to go out, the door was opened, and she fled. I thought that Zilla seemed then, more than ever, happy. Though jealousy is one, if not the ruling attributes of the cat, there are exceptions to such a rule. Sometimes it may be that two or more will take to the same person. As an instance of this, I had two cats, one a red tabby, a great beauty, Lilla, a short-haired red and white cat, the latter and a white long-haired one, named the Colonel, were great friends, and these associated with a tortoise shell in white, Lizzie. None of these were absolutely house cats, but attended more to the poultry yards and runs, looking after the chicken, seeing that no rats were about, or other vermin, near the coops. Useful cats, very. Mine was then a very large garden, and generally of an evening, when at home, I used to walk about the numerous paths, to admire the beauties of the different herbaceous plants, of which I had an interesting collection. Five was my time of starting on my ambulation, when, on going out of the door, I was sure to find the two first-named cats, and often the third, waiting for me, ready to go wherever I went, following like faithful dogs. These apparently never had any jealous feeling. Of all the cats, Lilla was the most loving. If I stood still, she would look up and watch the expression of my face. If she thought it was favorable to her, she would jump, and, clinging to my chest, put her forepaws around my neck, and rub her head softly against my face, purring melodiously all the time, then move on to my shoulder, while the colonel and his tortoise-shell friend Lizzie would press about my legs, uttering the same musical self-complacent sound. Here, there, and everywhere, even out into the road or into the wood, the pretty things would accompany me, seeming intensely happy. When I returned to the house, they would scamper off, bounding in the air and playing with and tumbling over each other in the fullest and most frolicsome manner imaginable. No, I do not think that Lilla, the Colonel, or Lizzie ever knew the feeling of jealousy. But these, as I said before, were exceptions. They all had a sad ending, coming to an untimely death through being caught in wires set by poachers for rabbits. I have ever regretted the loss of the gentle Lilla. She was as beautiful as she was good, gentle, and loving, without a fault." It may have been noted in the foregoing, I have said that my cats were always awaiting my coming. Just so. The cat seems to take note of time as well as place. At my townhouse I had a cat named Guadal Quiver, which was fed on horseflesh brought to the door. Every day during the week he would go and sit ready for the coming of the cat's meat man, but he never did so on the Sunday." How it was he knew on that day that the man did not come, I could never discover. Still the fact remains. How he, or whether he, counted the days until the sixth, and then rested the seventh from his watching, is a mystery. 
A similar case is related of an animal belonging to Mr. Trubner, the London publisher. The cat, a gigantic one, and a pet of his, used to go every evening to the end of the terrace, on which was the house where he resided, to escort Mr. Trubner back to dinner on his arrival from the city, but was never once known to make the mistake of going to meet him on Sundays. And again, how well a cat knows when it is luncheon time. He or she may be apparently asleep on the tiles, or snugly lying under a bush, basking in the sun's warm rays, when it will look up, yawn, stretch itself, get up, and move leisurely towards the house, and as the luncheon bell rings, in walks the cat as ready for food as any there. Most cats are of a gentle disposition, but resent ill-treatment in a most determined way, generally making use of their claws, at the same time giving vent to their feelings by a low growl and spitting furiously. Under such conditions it is best to leave off that which has appeared to irritate them. Dogs generally bite when they lose their temper, but a cat seldom. Should a cat dig her claws into your hand, never draw it backward, but push forward. You thus close the foot and render the claws harmless." If otherwise, you generally lose three to four pieces of skin from your hand. The cat knows he has done it, and feels revenged. Some cats do not like their ears touched, others their backs, others their tails. I have one now, Fritz. He has such a great dislike to having his tail touched, that if we only point to it and say, Tail, he growls, and if repeated, he will get up and go out of the room, even though he was enjoying the comfort of his basket before a good fire. By avoiding anything that is known to tease an animal, no matter what, it will be found that is the true way, combined with gentle treatment and oft caressing, to tame and to make them love you, even those whose temper is none of the best. This is equally applicable to horses, cows, and dogs as to cats. Gentleness and kindness will work wonders with animals, and, I take it, is not lost on human beings. The distance cats will travel to find and regain the home they have been taken from is surprising. One my groom begged of me, as he said he had no cat at home, and was fond of the dear thing, but he really wanted to be rid of it, as I found afterwards. He took the poor animal away in a hamper, and after carrying it some three miles through London streets, threw it into the Surrey Canal. That cat was sitting wet and dirty outside the stable when he came in the morning, and went in joyfully on his opening the door, ran up to and climbed on to the back of its favourite, the horse, who neighed a welcome home. The man left that week. Another instance, and I could give many more, but this will suffice. It is said that if you wish an old cat to stay, you should have the mother with the kitten or kittens but this sometimes fails to keep her. Having a fancy for a beautiful brown tabby, I purchased her and kitten from a cottager living two miles and a half away. The next day I let her out, keeping the kitten in a basket before the fire. In half an hour mother and child were gone, and though she had to carry her little one through woods, hedgerows, across grass and arable fields, she arrived home with her young charge quite safely the following day, though evidently very tired, wet, and hungry. After two days she was brought back, and being well fed and carefully tended, she roamed no more. The cat, like many other animals, will often form singular attachments. One would sit in my horse's manger, and purr and rub against his nose, which undoubtedly the horse enjoyed, for he would frequently turn his head purposely to be so treated." one went as consort with a dorking cock, another took a great liking to my collie, Rover, another loved Lena the cow, while another would coss it up close to a sitting hen, and allowed the fresh-hatched chickens to seek warmth by creeping under her. Again, they will rear other animals such as rats, rabbits, squirrels, puppies, hedgehogs, and when motherly inclined, will take to almost anything, even to a young pigeon." At the Brighton show of 1886 there were two cats, both reared by dogs, the foster mother and her bantling showing evident signs of sincere affection. 
there are both men and women who have a decided antipathy to cats, won't have one in the house on any account. They are called deceitful, and some go as far as to say treacherous, but how and in what way I cannot discover. Others, on the contrary, love cats beyond all other things domestic. Of course cats, like other animals, or even human beings, are very dissimilar, no two being precisely alike in disposition, any more than are to be found two forms so closely resembling as not to be distinguished one from the other. To some a cat is a cat, and if all were black, all would be alike. But this would not be so in reality, as those well know who are close observers of animal and bird life. Of course the gamekeeper has a dislike to cats, more especially when they take to the woods, but so long as they are fed and keep within bounds, they are useful in scaring away rats from the young broods of pheasants. What are termed poaching cats are clearly outlaws and must be treated as such. End of Habits Section 4 of Our Cats and All About Them This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephanie Lee Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir Section 4 Trained Cats That cats may be trained to respect the lives of other animals and also birds on which they habitually feed is a well-known fact. In proof of this, I will recollect a story that my father used to tell of a happy family that was shown many years ago on the Surrey side of Waterloo Bridge. Their abode consisted of a large wire cage placed on wheels. In windy weather the breezy side was protected by green bays, so draughts were prevented and a degree of comfort obtained. As there was no charge for the show, a box was placed in front with an opening for the purpose of admitting any donations from those who felt inclined to give. On it was written, The Happy Family, Their Money Box. The family varied somewhat, as casualties occurred occasionally by death from natural causes or sales. Usually there was a monkey, an owl, some guinea pigs, squirrels, small birds, starlings, a magpie, rats, mice, and a cat or two. But the story? Well, the story is this. One day, when my father was looking at The Happy Family, a burly-looking man came up, and, after a while, said to the man who owned the show, Ah, I don't see much in that. It is true that cat does not touch the small birds, one of which was sitting on the head of the cat at the time, nor the other things, but you could not manage to keep rats and mice in there as well. Think not, said the showman. I think I could very easily. Not you, said the burly one. I will give you a month to do it in, if you like, and a shilling in the bargain if you succeed. I shall be this way again soon. Thank you, sir, said the man. Don't go yet. Then, putting a stick through the bars of the cage, he lifted up the cat, when from beneath her out ran a white rat and three white mice. Wonderful, slowly ejaculated he of the burly form. Wonderful. The money was paid. Cats properly trained will not touch anything, alive or dead, on the premises to which they are attached. I have known them to sport with tame rabbits, to romp and jump and frolic some mood this way, than that which both seemed greatly to enjoy, yet they would bring home wild rabbits they had killed, and not touch my little chickens or ducklings. When I built a house in the country, fond as I am of cats, I determined not to keep any there, because they would destroy the bird's nests and drive my feathered friends away, and I liked to watch and feed these from the windows. Things went pleasantly for a while. The birds were fed, and paid for their keep with many and many a song. There were the old ones, and there the young, and off by the hour I watched them from the window, and they became so tame as scarcely caring to get out of my way when I went outside with more food. But, there is always a but, but one day, or rather evening, as I was looking on, a rat came out from the rocks, and then another. Soon they began their repast on the remains of the bird's food. Then in the twilight came mice, the short-tailed and the long scampering hither and thither. This, too, was amusing. In the autumn I bought some filberts, and put them into a closet upstairs, went to London, returned, and thought I would sleep in the room adjoining the closet. No such thing. As soon as the light was out, there was a sound of gnawing. Curb, curb, squeak, squeak, a rushing of tiny feet here, there, and everywhere. Thump, bump, 
Squiggle, scraggle, squeak, overhead, above the ceiling, behind the skirting boards, under the floor, and in the closet. I lighted a candle, opened the door, and looked into the repository for my filberts. What a hustling, what a scuffling, what a scrambling! There they were, mice in numbers. They made for some holes in the corners of the cupboard, got jammed, squeaked, struggled, squabbled, pushed, their tails making circles. Push, push, squeak, more jostling, another effort or two, squeak, squeak, gurgle, squeak, more struggling, and they were gone. Gone? Yes, but not for long. As soon as the light was out, back they came. No, oh dear no, sleep, no more sleep. Outside, I liked to watch the mice, but when they climbed the ivy and got inside, the pleasure entirely ceased. Nor was this all. They got into the vineries and spoilt the grapes, and the rats killed the young ducks and chickens, and undermined the building also, besides storing quantities of grain and other things under the floor. The result number one was three cats coming on a visit. Farmyard cats, cats that knew the difference between chickens, ducklings, mice, and rats. Result number two that after being away a couple of weeks, I went again to my cottage, and I slept undisturbed in the room late the playground of the mice. My chickens and ducklings were safe, and soon the cats allowed the birds to be fed in front of the window, though I could not break them of destroying many of the nests. I never noticed more fully the very great use the domestic cat is to man than on that occasion. All day my cats were indoors, dozy, sociable, and contented. At night they were on guard outside, and doubtless saved me the lives of dozens of my young things. One afternoon I saw one of my cats coming towards me with apparent difficulty in walking. On its near approach I found it was carrying a large rat, which appeared dead. Coming nearer, the cat put down the rat. Presently I saw a move, then it suddenly got up and ran off. The cat caught it again. Again it feigned death, again got up and ran off, and was once more caught. It laid quite still when, perceiving the cat had turned away, it got up, apparently quite uninjured, and ran in another direction, and I and the cat lost it. I was not sorry. This rat deserved his liberty. Whether it was permanent I know not, as little John, the cat, remained, and I left. The cat is not only a very useful animal about the house and premises, but is also ornamental. It is lithe and beautiful in form, and graceful in action. Of course, there are cats that are ugly by comparison with others, both in form, color, and markings. And as there are now cat shows, at which prizes are offered for varieties, I will endeavor to give, in succeeding chapters, the points of excellence as regards form, color, and markings required, and most esteemed for the different classes. I am the more induced to define these as clearly as possible, owing to the number of mistakes that often occur in the entries. End of section 4 Section 5 of Our Cats and All About Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir. Section 5. Long-Haired Cats. These are very diversified, both in form, color, and the quality of the hair, which in some is more woolly than in others, and they vary also in the shape and length of the tail, the ears, and size of eyes. There are several varieties, the Russian, the Angora, the Persian, and Indian. Forty or fifty years ago they used all to be called French cats, as they were mostly imported from Paris, more particularly the white, which were then the fashion, and, if I remember rightly, they, as a rule, were larger than those of the present day. Colored long-haired cats were then rare, and but little cared for or appreciated. The pure white, with long silky hair, bedecked with blue or rose-colored ribbon, or a silver collar, with its name inscribed thereon, or one of scarlet leather studded with brass, might often be seen stretching its full lazy length, on luxurious woolen rugs, the valued pampered pets of West End life. A curious fact relating to the white cat, of not only the long, but also the short-haired breed, is their deafness. Should they have blue eyes, which is the fancy color, these are nearly always deaf, although I have seen specimens whose hearing was as perfect as that of any other color. 
Still, deafness in white cats is not always confined to those with blue eyes, as I too well know from purchasing a very fine male at the Crystal Palace show some few years since. The price was low, and the cat a beauty, both in form, coat, and tail. His eyes were yellow, and he had a nice, meek, mild, expressive face. I stopped and looked at him, as he much took my fancy. He stared at me wistfully, with something like melancholy in the gaze of his amber-colored eyes. I put my hand through the bars of the cage. He purred, licked my hand, rubbed against the wires, put his tail up, as much as to say, See, here is my beautiful tail. Am I not a lovely cat? Yes, thought I, a very nice cat. When I looked at my catalogue and saw the low price, something is wrong here, said I musingly. Yes, there must be something wrong. The price is misstated, or there is something not right about this cat. No, it was a beauty, so comely, so lovely, so gentle, so very gentle. Well, said I to myself, if there is no misstatement of price, I will buy this cat. And with a parting survey of its excellences, I went to the office of the show manager. He looked at the letter of entry. No, the price was quite right. Two guineas. I will buy it, said I. And so I did, but at two guineas I bought it dearly. Yes, very dearly, for when I got it home, I found out it was stone deaf. What an unhappy cat it was. If shut out of the dining room, you could hear its cry for admission all over the house. Being so deaf, the poor wretched creature never knew the noise it made. I often wish that it had so known, very, very often. I am satisfied that a tithe would have frightened it out of its life. And so loving, so affectionate, but oh, the horror, when it called out as it sat on my lap, its voice seemed to acquire at least ten cat power. And when, if it lost sight of me in the garden, its voice rose to the occasion, I feel confident it might have been heard miles off. Alas, he never knew what that agonized sound was like, but I did, and I have never forgotten it, and I never shall. I named him the Colonel on account of his commanding voice. One morning a friend came, blessed be that day, and after dinner he saw the beauty. What a lovely cat, he said. Yes, said I, he is very beautiful, quite a picture. After a while, he said, looking at Pussy warming himself before the fire, I think I have never saw one I liked more. Indeed, said I, if you really think so, I will give it to you, but he has a fault, he is stone deaf. Oh, I don't mind that, said he. He took him away, miles and miles away. I was glad it was so many miles away for two reasons. One was I feared he might come back, and the other that his voice might come resounding on the still night air. But he never came back, nor a sound. A few days after he left, to better himself, a letter came saying, would I wish to have him back? They liked it very much, all but its voice. No, I wrote. No, you are very kind. No, thank you. Give him to anyone you please. Do what you will with the beauty but it must not return, never. When next I saw my friend, I asked him how the beauty was. You dreadful man, said he. Why, that cat nearly drove us mad. I never heard anything like it. Nor I, said I, sententiously. Well, said my friend, all is well that ends well. I have given it to a very deaf old lady, and so both are happy. Very, I trust, said I. The foregoing is by way of advice. In buying a white cat, or in fact any other, ascertain for a certainty that it is not deaf. A short time since, I saw a white Persian cat with deep blue eyes sitting at the door of a tobacconist at the corner of the Haymarket, London. On inquiry, I found that the cat could hear perfectly and was in no way deficient of health and strength and this is by no means a solitary instance. The Angora The Angora cat, as its name indicates, comes from Angora in western Asia, a province that is also celebrated for its goats with long hair, which is of extremely fine quality. It is said that this deteriorates when the animal leaves that locality. 
this may be so but that i have no means of proving yet if so do the angora cats also deteriorate in the silky qualities of their fur or does it get shorter certainly it is that many of the imported cats have finer and longer hair than those bred in this country but when are the latter true bred even some a little cross-bred will often have long hair but not of the texture as regards length and silkiness which is to be noted in the pure breed the angora cats i am told are great favorites with the turks and armenians and the best are of high quality a pure white with blue eyes being thought the perfection of cats all other points being good and its hearing by no means defective the points are a small head with not too long a nose large full eyes of a color in harmony with that of its fur ears rather large than small and pointed with a tuft of hair at the apex the size not showing as they are deeply set in the long hair on the forehead with a very full flowing mane about the head and neck this latter should not be short neither the body which should be long graceful and elegant and covered with long silky hair with a slight admixture of wooliness in this it differs from the persian and the longer the better in texture it should be as fine as possible and also not so woolly as that of the russian still it is more inclined to be so than the persian the legs are to be of moderate length and in proportion to the body the tail long and slightly curving upward towards the end the hair should be very long at the base less so toward the tip when perfect it is an extremely beautiful and elegant object and no wonder that it has become a pet among the orientals the colors are varied but the black which should have orange eyes as should also the slate colors and blues and the whites are the most esteemed though the soft slates blues and the light fawns deep reds and mottled grays are shades of color that blend well with the eastern furniture and other surroundings there are also light grays and what is termed smoke color a beauty was shown at brighton which was white with black tips to the hair the white being scarcely visible unless the hair was parted this tinting had a marvelous effect i have never seen imported strong colored tabbies of this breed nor do i believe such are true angoras fine specimens are even now rare in this country and are extremely valuable in manners and temper they are quiet sociable and docile though given to roaming especially in the country where i have seen them far from their homes hunting the hedgerows more like dogs than cats nor do they appear to possess the keen intelligence of the short-haired european cat they are not new to us being mentioned by writers nearly a hundred years ago if not more i well remember white specimens of uncommon size on sale in leadenhall market more than forty years since the price usually was five guineas though some of rare excellence would realize double that sum end of section five Section 6 of Our Cats and All About Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir. Section 6. The Persian Cat this differs somewhat from the angora the tail being generally longer more like a table brush in point of form and is generally slightly turned upwards the hair being more full and coarser at the end while at the base it is somewhat longer the head is rather large with less pointed ears although these should not be devoid of the tuft at the apex and also well furnished with long hair within and of moderate size the eyes should be large full and round with a soft expression the hair on the forehead is generally rather short in comparison to the other parts of the body which ought to be clothed with long silky hair very long about the neck giving the appearance of the mane of the lion the legs feet and toes should be well clothed with long hair and have well developed fringes on the toes assuming the character of tufts between them it is larger in body and generally broader in the loins 
and apparently stronger made than the foregoing variety though yet slender and elegant with small bone and exceedingly graceful in all its movements there being a kind of languor observable in its walk until roused when it immediately assumes the quick motion of the ordinary short-haired cat though not so alert the colors vary very much and comprise almost every tint obtainable in cats though the tortoise shell is not nor is the dark mark tabby in my opinion a persian cat color but has been got by crossing with the short-haired tortoise shell and also english tabby and as generally shows pretty clearly unmistakable signs of such being the case for a long time if not now the black was the most sought after and the most difficult to obtain a good rich deep black with orange colored eyes and long flowing hair grand in mane large and with graceful carriage with a mild expression is truly a very beautiful object and one very rare the best i have hitherto seen was one that belonged to mr edward lloyd the great authority on all matters relating to aquariums it was called mimi and was a very fine specimen usually carrying off the first prize wherever shown it generally wore a handsome collar on which was inscribed its name and victories the collar as mr lloyd used to coastly to observe really belonged to it as it was bought out of its winnings and according to the accounts kept was also proved to have paid for its food for some considerable period it was as its owner laughingly said his friend and not his dependent and generally used to sit on the table by his side while he was writing either his letters articles or planning those improvements regarding aquariums for which he was so justly celebrated next in value is the light slate or blue color this beautiful tint is very different in its shades in some it verges toward a light purplish or lilac hue and is very lovely in others it tends to a much bluer tone having a colder and harder appearance still beautiful by way of contrast in all the colors should be pure even and bright not in any way mottled which is a defect and i may here remark that in these colors the hair is generally a softer texture as far as i have observed than that of any other color not excepting the white which is also in much request then following the various shades of light tabbies so light in the marking having scarcely a right to be called tabbies in fact tabby is not a persian color nor have i ever seen an imported cat of that color i mean firmly strongly marked with black on a brown blue or gray ground until they culminate in those of intense richness and density in the way of deep harmonious browns and reds yet still preserving throughout an extreme delicacy of line and tracery never becoming harsh or hard in any of its arrangements or color not as the ordinary short-haired tabby the eyes should be orange yellow in the browns reds blues grays and blacks as far as my experience extends and i have had numerous opportunities of noticing i find this variety less reliable as regards temper than the short-haired cats less also in the keen sense of observing as in the angora and also of turning such observations to account either as regards their comfort their endeavor to help themselves or in their effort to escape from confinement in some cases i have found them to be of almost a savage disposition biting and snapping more like a dog than a cat and using their claws less for protective purposes nor have i found them so cosity in their ways as those of the short coats though i have known exceptions in both they are much given to roam as indeed are the russian and angora especially in the country going considerable distance either for their own pleasure or in search of food or when on the hunt after mature consideration i have come to the conclusion that this breed and slightly so the preceding are decidedly different in their habits to the short-haired english domestic cat as it is now generally called it may be however only a very close observer would notice the several peculiarities which i consider certainly exist these cats attach themselves to places more than persons and are indifferent to those who feed and have the care of them they are beautiful and useful objects about the house and generally very pleasant companions 
and when kept with the short-haired varieties, form an exceedingly pretty and interesting contrast. But, as I have stated, they certainly require more attention to their training, and more caution in their handling, than the latter. I may here remark, that during the time I have acted as judge at cat shows, which is now over eighteen years, it has been seldom there has been any display of temper in the short-haired breeds in comparison with the long, though some of the former, in some instances, have not comported themselves with that sweetness and amiability of disposition that is their usual characteristic. My attendant has been frequently wounded in our endeavor to examine the fur, dentition, etc., of the Angora, Persian, or Russian, and once severely by a short hair. Hitherto I have been so fortunate as to escape all injury, but this I attribute to my close observation of the countenance and expression of the cat about to be handled, so as to be perfectly on my guard, and to the knowledge of how to put my hands out of harm's way. If a vicious cat is to be taken from one pen to another, it must be carried by the loose skin at the back of the neck, and that of the back with both hands, and held well away from the person who is carrying it. End of section 6. Section 7 of Our Cats and All About Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir. Section 7. The Russian Long-Haired Cat. The above is a portrait of a cat given me many years ago, whose parents came from Russia, but from what part I could never ascertain. It differed from the Angora and the Persian in many respects. It was larger in body with shorter legs. The mane or frill was very large, long and dense, and more of a woolly texture, with coarse hairs among it. The color was of dark tabby, though the markings were not a decided black, nor clear and distinct. The ground color was wanting in that depth and richness possessed by the Persian, having a somewhat dull appearance. The eyes were large and prominent, of a bright orange, slightly tinted with green. The ears large by comparison, with small tufts, full of long woolly hair, the limbs stout and short, the tail being very dissimilar, as it was short, very woolly, and thickly covered with hair the same length from the base to the tip, and much resembled in form that of the English wild cat. Its motion was not so agile as other cats, nor did it apparently care for warmth, as it liked being outdoors in the coldest weather. Another peculiarity being that it seemed to care little in the way of watching birds for the purpose of food, neither were its habits like those of the short-haired cats that were its companions. It attached itself to no person, as was the case with some of the others, but curiously took a particular fancy to one of my short-haired, silver-gray tabbies. The two appeared always together. In front of the fire they sat side by side. If one left the room, the other followed. A down the garden pass there they were, still companions, and at night slept in the same box, they drank milk from the same saucer, and fed from the same plate, and, in fact, only seemed to exist for each other. In all my experience, I never knew a more devoted couple. I bred but one kitten from the Russian, and this was the offspring of the short-haired silver tabby. It was black and white, and resembled the Russian in a large degree, having a woolly coat, somewhat of a mane, and a short, very bushy tail. This, like his father, seemed also to be fonder of animals for food than birds, and although very small, would without any hesitation attack and kill a full-grown rat. I have seen several Russian cats, yet never but on this occasion had the opportunity of comparing their habits and mode of life with those of the other varieties. Neither have I seen any but those of a tabby color, and they mostly of a dark brown. I am fully aware that many cross-bred cats are sold as Russian, Angora, and Persian, either between these or the short-haired, and some of these, of course, retain in large degree the distinctive peculiarities of each breed. 
yet to the practiced eye there is generally i do not say always a difference of some sort by which the particular breed may be clearly defined when the prizes are given as in the case even at our largest cat shows for the best long-haired cat there of course exists in the eye of the judge no distinction as regards breed he selects as he is bound to do that which is the best long-haired cat in all points the length of hair color texture and condition of the exhibit being that which commands his first attention but if it were so put that the prize should be for the best angora persian russian etc it would make the task rather more than difficult for i have seen some first cross cats that have possessed all or nearly all the points requisite for that of the angora persian or russian while others so bred have been very deficient perhaps showing the angora cross only by the tail and a slight and small frill at the same time it must be noted that although from time to time some excellent specimens may be so bred it is by no means desirable to buy and use such for stock purposes for they will in all probability throw back that is after several generations although allied with thoroughbred they will possibly have a little family of quite short hairs i have known this with rabbits who after breeding short-haired varieties for some time suddenly revert to a litter of long hairs but have not carried out the experiment with cats at the same time i may state that i have little or no doubt that such would be the case therefore i would urge on all those who are fond of cats or in fact other animals of any particular breed to use when possible none but those of the purest pedigree as this will tend to prevent much disappointment that might otherwise ensue but i am digressing and so back to my subject the russian long-haired cat i advisedly say long-haired cat for i shall hereafter have to treat of other cats coming from russia that are short-haired none which i have hitherto seen being tabbies but whole color this is the more singular as all those of the long hair have been brown tabbies with only one or two exceptions which were black it is just possible these were the offspring of tabby or gray parents as the wild rabbit has been known to have had black progeny i have seen a black rabbit shot from amongst the gray on the south downs i do not remember having seen a white russian long hair and i should feel particularly obliged to any of my readers who could supply me with further information on this subject or on any other relating to the various breeds of cats cat life and habits i am fully aware that no two cats are exactly alike either in their form color movements or habits but what i have given much study and attention to and what i wish to arrive at is the broad existing natural distinctions of the different varieties in this i shall feel grateful for any information the above engraving and description of a very peculiar animal is from Daniel's Rural Sports, 1813. This cat was the property of Mrs. Finch of Malden, Essex. In the account of this Lucis naturae, for such it may be deemed, the mother had no other likeness to her production than her color, which is a tawny sandy, in some parts lightly streaked with black she had this and another kitten like it about two years since the fellow kitten was killed in consequence of being troublesome to the mistress of the house where it was presented this is a male above the usual size with a shaggy appearance round its face resembling that of the lions in miniature the hair protruding from the ears formerly grew like what are termed corkscrew curls and which are frequently seen among the smart young watermen on the thames the tail is perfectly distinct from that of the cat species and resembles the brush of a fox the mother has at this time three young ones but without the least difference to common kittens neither indeed has she ever had any before or since similar to that here described the proprietor has been offered and refused one hundred pounds for this animal this was either a cross with the english wild cat which sometimes has a mane or it was an accidental variation of nature i once bred a long-haired rabbit in a similar way but at first i failed entirely to perpetuate the peculiarity i think the above simply a sport 
I have now concluded my remarks on the long-haired varieties of cats that I am at present acquainted with. They are an exceedingly interesting section. Their habits, manners, forms, and colors form a by no means unprofitable study for those fond of animal life, as they, in my opinion, differ in many ways from those of their short-haired brethren. I shall not cease, however, in my endeavors to find out if any other long-haired breeds exist, and I am, therefore, making inquiries in every direction in which I deem it likely I shall get an increase of information on the subject, but hitherto without any success. Therefore, I am led to suppose that the three I have enumerated are the only domesticated long-haired varieties. The nearest approach, I believe, to these in the wild state is that of the British wild cat, which has in some instances a mane and a bushy tail, slightly resembling that of the Russian long hair, with much of the same facial expression, and rather pointed tufts at the apex of the ears. It is also large, like some of the long-haired cats that I have seen. In fact, it far more resembles these breeds than those of the short hair. I was much struck with the many points of solemnitude on seeing the British wild cat exhibited by the Duke of Sutherland, at the first cat show at the Crystal Palace in July, 1871. I merely offer this as an idea for further consideration. At the same time, allow me to say that I have had no opportunity of studying the anatomy of the British wild cat, in contradistinction to that of the Russian, or others with long hair. I only wish to point out what I term a general resemblance, far in excess of those with short hair. I am fully aware how difficult it is to trace any origin of the domestic cat, or from what breeds. It is also said that the British wild cat is not one of them. Still, I urge there exists the similarity I mention. Whether it is so apparent to others, I know not. End of section 7《ซ็กชันเอทของพวกเราและทุกสิ่งที่เกี่ยวข้องกับพวกเราและพวกเราทั้งหมดนี้เป็นการแสดงออกของพวกเราและพวกเราทั้งหมดนี้เป็นการแสดงออกของพวกเราและพวกเราทั้งหมดนี้เป็นการแสดงออกของพวกเราและพวกเราทั้งหมดนี้เป็นการแสดงออกของพวกเราและพวกเราทั้งหมดนี้เป็นการแสดงออกของพวกเราและพวกเราทั้งหมดนี้เป็นการแสดงออกของพวกเราและพวกเราทั้งหมดนี้เป็นการแสดงออกของพวกเราและพวกเราทั้งหมดนี้เป็นการแสดงออกของพวกเราและพวกเราทั้งหมดนี้เป็นการแสดงออกของพวกเราและพวกเราทั้งหมดนี้เป็นการแสดงออกของพวกเราและพวกเราทั้งหมดนี้เป็นการแสดงออกของพวกเราและพวกเราทั้งหมดนี้เป็นการแสดงออกของพวกเราและพวกเราทั้งหมดนี้เป็นการแสดงออกของพวกเราและพวกเรา I now come to the section of the short-haired domestic cat, a variety possessing sub-varieties. Whether these all came from the same origin is doubtful, although in breeding, many of the different colors will breed back to the striped or tabby color, and per contra, white whole-colored cats are often got from striped or spotted parents, and vice versa. Those that have had any experience of breeding domestic animals or birds know perfectly well how difficult it is to keep certain peculiarities gained by years of perseverance of breeding for such points of variation, or what is termed excellence. Place a few fancy pigeons, for instance, in the country and let them match how they like, and one would be quite surprised, unless he were a naturalist, to note the great changes that occur in a few years, and the unmistakable signs of reversion towards their ancestral stock, that of the rock pigeon. But with the cat, this is somewhat different, as little or no attempts have been made, as far as I know of, until cat shows were instituted, to improve any particular breed, either in form or color. Nor has it even yet, with the exception of the long-haired cats. Why this is so, I am at a loss to understand, but the fact remains. Good, well-developed cats of certain colors fetch large prices, and are, if I may use the term, perpetual prize winners. I will take as an instance the tortoiseshell tom, he or male cat as one of the most scarce, and the red or yellow tabby she-cat as the next, and yet the possessor of either, with proper care and attention, I have little or no doubt, has it in his power to produce either variety ad libitum. It is now many years since I remember the first tortoiseshell tom cat, nor can I now at this distance of time quite call to mind whether or not it was not a tortoiseshell and white, and not a tortoiseshell pure and simple. 
It was exhibited in Piccadilly. If I remember rightly, I made a drawing of it, but as it is about forty years ago, of this I am not certain, although I have been lately told that I did, and the price asked for the cat was one hundred guineas. This supposed scarcity was rudely put aside by the appearance, at the Crystal Palace show of 1871, of no less than one tortoise shell he cat, exhibited by Mr. Smith, and three tortoise shell and white he cats, but it will be observed, there was really but only one tortoise shell he cat, the others having white. On referring to the catalogues of the succeeding shows, no other pure tortoise shell has been exhibited, and he ceased to appear after 1873. But tortoise shell and white have been shown from 1871, varying in number from five to three until 1885. One of these, a tortoise shell and white belonging to Mr. Hurry, gained no fewer than nine first prizes at the Crystal Palace, besides several firsts at other shows. This maintains my statement that a really good scarce variety of cats is a valuable investment. Mr. Hurry's cat, Toddy, keeping up his price of 100 pounds till the end. As may have been gathered from the foregoing remarks, the points of the tortoise shell he cat are black, red, and yellow in patches, but no white. The coloring should be in broad, well-defined blotches and solid in color, not mealy or tabby-like in the marking, but clear, sharp, and distinct, and the richer and deeper the colors, the better. When this is so, the animal presents a very handsome appearance. The eyes should be orange, the tail long and thick towards the base, the form slim, graceful, and elegant, and not too short on the leg, to which this breed has a tendency. Coming then to the actual tortoise shell he, or male cat without white, I have never seen but one at the shows, and that was exhibited by Mr. Smith. It does not appear that Mr. Smith bred any from it, nor do I know whether he took any precautions to do so, but if not, I am still of the opinion that more might have been produced. In Castle's Natural History, it is stated that the tortoiseshell cat is quite common in Egypt and in the south of Europe. This I can readily believe, as I think that it comes from a different stock than the usual short-haired cat, the texture of the hair being different, the form of the tail also. I should much like to know whether in that country, where the variety is so common, there exists any number of tortoiseshell he-cats. In England, the he-kittens are almost invariably red tabby or red tabby and white. The red tabby she-cats are almost as scarce as tortoiseshell and white he-cats. Yet if red tabby she-cats can be produced, I am of opinion that tortoiseshell he-cats could also. I had one of the former, a great beauty, and hoped to perpetuate the breed, but it unfortunately fell a victim to wires set by poachers for game. Again returning to the tortoiseshell, I have noted that, in drawings made by the Japanese, the cats are always of this color. That being so, it leads one to suppose that in that country, tortoiseshell he-cats must be plentiful. Though the drawings are strong evidence, they are not absolute proof. I have asked several traveling friends questions as regards the Japanese cats, but in no case have I found them to have taken sufficient notice for their testimony to be anything else but worthless. I shall be very thankful for any information on this subject, for to myself, and doubtless also to many others, it is exceedingly interesting. Anyone wishing to breed rich brown tabbies should use a tortoiseshell she-cat with a very brown and black-banded he-cat. They are not so good from the spotted tabby, often producing merely tortoiseshell tabbies instead of brown tabbies or true tortoiseshells. My remarks as to the coloring of the tortoiseshell he-cat are equally applicable to the she-cat, which should not have any white, of the tortoiseshell and white hereafter. To breed tortoiseshell he-cats, I should use males of a whole color, such as either white, black, or blue, and on no account any tabby, no matter the color. What is wanted is patches of color, not tiny streaks or spots, and I feel certain that, for those who persevere, there will be successful results. The Tortoise Shell and White Cat 
This is a more common mixture of coloring than the tortoiseshell pure and simple without white, and seems to be widely spread over different parts of the world. It is the opinion of some that this color and the pure tortoise shell is the original domestic cat, and that the other varieties of marking and colors are but deviations produced by crossing with wild varieties. My brother, John Jenner Weir, FLS, FZS, holds somewhat to this opinion, but to me, it is rather difficult to arrive at this conclusion. In fact, I can scarcely realize the ground on which the theory is based. At the same time, I do not mean to ignore it entirely. And yet, if this be so, from what starting point was the original domestic cat derived, and by what means were the rich and varied markings obtained? I am fully aware that by selection, cats with large patches of color may be obtained. Still, there remain the peculiar markings of the tortoise shell. Nor is this by any means an uncommon color, not only in this country, but in many others, and there also appears to be a peculiar fixedness of this, especially in the female, but why it is not so in the male, I am at a loss to understand, the males almost invariably coming either red tabby or red tabby and white. One would suppose that black or white would be equally likely, but as far as my observations take me, this is not so, though I have seen both pure white, yellow, red, and black in litters of kittens, but this might be different were the he-parent tortoise shell. Some years ago I was out with a shooting party, not far from Snowdon, in Wales, when turning past a large rock, I came on a sheltered nook, and there in a nest, made of dry grasses, laid six tortoiseshell and white kittens, about eight to ten days old. I was much surprised at this, as I did not know of any house near, therefore these must have been the offspring of some cat, or cats, that were leading a roving or wild life, and yet it had no effect as to the deviation of the color. I left them there, and without observing the sex. I was afterwards sorry, as it was just possible, though scarcely probable, that one or more of the six, being all of the same color, might have proved to be a male. As I left the neighborhood a few days after, I saw no more of them, nor have I since heard of any being there. So conclude they, in some way, were destroyed. I have observed in the breed of tortoiseshell, or tortoiseshell and white, that the hair is of a coarser texture than the ordinary domestic cat, and that the tail is generally thicker, especially at the base, though some few are thin-tailed. Yet I prefer the thick and tapering form. Some are very much so, and of a good length. The legs are generally somewhat short. I do not ever remember seeing a really long-legged tortoise shell, though when this is so, if not too long, it adds much to its grace of action. I give a drawing of what I consider to be a good tortoiseshell and white tom, or he-cat. It will be observed that there is more white on the chest, belly, and hind legs than is allowable in the black and white cat. This I deem necessary for artistic beauty, when the color is laid on in patches. Although it should be even, clear, and distinct in its outline, the larger space of white adds brilliancy to the red, yellow, and black coloring. The face is one of the parts which should have some uniformity of color, and yet not so, but a mere balancing of color. That is to say, that there should be a relief in black, with the yellow and red on each side, and so in the body and tail. The nose should be white, the eyes orange, and the whole coloring rich and varied without the least tabbiness, either brown or gray, or an approach to it, such being highly detrimental to its beauty. I have received a welcome letter from Mr. Herbert Young of James Street, Harrogate, informing me of the existence of what is said to be a tortoiseshell tom or he-cat somewhere in Yorkshire, and the price is fifty guineas, but he, unfortunately, has forgotten the exact address. He also kindly favors me with the further information of a tortoiseshell and white he-cat. He describes it as splendid and extra good in color and it is at present in the vicinity of Harrow Gate. And still further, Mr. Herbert Young says, I am breeding from a dark-colored cat and two tortoiseshell females, and he hopes, by careful selection, to succeed in breeding the other color out. 
This, I deem, is by no means an unlikely thing to happen, and, by careful management, may not take very long to accomplish. But much depends on the ancestry, or rather the pedigree, of both sides. I, for one, most heartily wish Mr. Herbert Young success, and it will be most gratifying should he arrive at the height of his expectations. Failing the producing of the desired color in the he-cats, by the legitimate method of tortoiseshell with tortoiseshell, I would advise the trial of some whole colors, such as solid black and white. This may prove a better way than the other, as we pigeon fanciers go an apparently roundabout way, often to obtain what we want to attain in color, and yet there is almost a certainty in the method. As regards the tortoiseshell cat, there is a distinct variety known to us cat fanciers as the tortoiseshell tabby. This must not be confounded with the true variety, as it consists only of a variegation in color of the yellow, the red, and the dark tabby, and is more in lines than patches, or patches of lines or spots. These are by no means ugly, and a well-marked, richly colored specimen is really very handsome. They may also be intermixed with white, and should be marked the same as the true tortoise shell, but in competition with the real tortoise shell, they would stand no chance whatever, and ought, in my opinion, be disqualified as being wrong class, and be put in that for any other color. End of section 8 Section number 9 of our cats and all about them this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john thomas coos kosmarski our cats and all about them by harrison weir the brown tabby cat the tabby cat is doubtless one of if not the most common of colors and numbers many almost endless varieties of both tint and markings of these those with very broad bands of black or narrow bands of black on nearly a black ground are usually called black tabby, and if the bands are divided into spots instead of being in continuous lines, then it is a spotted black tabby. But I purpose in this paper to deal mostly with the brown tabby, that is to say, a tabby whose ground color is of a very rich orangey dark brown ground without any white and that is evenly proportionably and not too broadly but elegantly marked on the face head breast sides back belly legs and tail with bands of solid deep shining black the front part of the head or face and legs, breast, and belly, should have a more rich red-orange tint than the back, but which should be nearly, if not equal, in depth of color, though somewhat browner. The markings should be graceful in curve, sharply, well, and clearly defined, with fine deep black edges, so that the brown and black are clear and distinct, the one from the other not blurred in any way. The banded tabby should not be spotted in any way, excepting those few that nearly always occur in the face and sometimes on the forelegs. The clearer, redder, and brighter the brown, the better. The nose should be deep red, bordered with black, the eyes an orange color, slightly diffused with green. In form, the head should not be large, nor too wide, being rather longer than broad. 
so as not to give too round or clumsy an appearance. Ears not large nor small, but of moderate size and of good form. Legs medium length, rather long than short, so as not to lose grace of action. Body long, narrow, and deep towards the forepart. Tail long and gradually tapering towards the point. Feet round with black claws and black pants. Yellowish white around the black lips and brown whiskers are allowable, but orange tinted are far preferable, and pure white should disqualify. A cat of this description is now somewhat rare. What are generally shown as brown tabbies are not sufficiently orange-brown, but mostly of dark brownish-gray. This is simply the ordinary tabby, and not the brown tabby proper. As I stated in my notes on the tortoise-shell cat, the best parents to obtain a good brown tabby from is to have a strongly marked, not too broad-banded, tabby he-cat and a tortoise-shell she-cat with little black or red tabby she-cat, the produce being, when tabby, generally of a rich brown or sometimes what is termed black tabby and also red tabby. The picture illustrating these notes is from one so bred and is a particularly handsome specimen. There were two he-cats in the litter, one the dark brown tabby just mentioned, which I named Aaron, and the other a very fine red tabby Moses. This last was even a finer animal than Aaron, being very beautiful in color and very large in size, but he, alas, like many others, was caught in wires set by poachers and was found dead. His handsome brother still survives, though no longer my property. The bounded red tabby should be marked precisely the same as the brown tabby. Only the bands should be of deep red on an orange ground. The deeper in color, the better. Almost a chocolate on orange is very fine. The nose deep pink, as also the pads of the feet. The ordinary dark tabby, the same way as the brown, and so also the blue or silver. Only the ground color should be of a pale, soft blue color, not the slightest tint of brown in it. The clearer, the lighter, the brighter, the blue, the better, bearing in mind always that the bands should be of a jet black, sharply and very clearly defined. The word tabby was derived from a kind of taffeta or ribbed silk, which, when calendared, or what is now termed watered, is by that process covered with wavy lines. This stuff, in bygone times, was often called tabby. Hence, the cat with lines or markings on its fur was called a tabby cat. But it might also, one would suppose, with as much justice, be called a taffety cat, unless the calendaring of taffety caused it to become tabby. Certain it is that the word tabby only referred to the markings or stripes, not to the absolute color, for in wit and drollery, page 343, is the following. Her petticoat of satin, her gown of crimson tabby. Be that as it may, I think there is little doubt that the foregoing was the origin of the term. 
yet it was also called the brinded cat or the brindled cat also tiger cat with some the gray cat gray malkin but i was rather unprepared to learn that in norfolk and suffolk it is called a cypress cat why cypress cat quoth i i do not know said my informant all i know is that such is the case so i referred to my bailey's dictionary of seventeen thirty and there sure enough was the elucidation for i found that cypress was a kind of cloth made of silk and hair showing wavy lines on it and coming from cypress therefore this somewhat strengthens the argument in favor of tafeta or tabby but it is still curious that the norfolk and suffolk people should have adopted a kind of cloth as that representing the markings and color of the cat and that of a different name from that in use for the cat one or more counties calling it a tabby cat as regards color and the other naming the same as cypress i take this to be exceedingly interesting how or when such naming took place i am at present unable to get the least clue though i think from what i gather from one of the crystal palace cat show catalogues that it must have been after fifteen ninety seven as the excerpt shows that at that time the shape and color was like a leopard's which of course is spotted and is always called the spotted leopard since this i have learned that the domestic cat is said to have been brought from cyprus by merchants as also was the tortoiseshell cyprus is a color a sort of reddish yellow something like citron so a cyprus cat may mean a red or yellow tabby however i find holloway in his dictionary of provincialisms eighteen thirty nine gives the following calamanco cat s calamanco a glossy stuff a tortoise-shell cat norfolk salmon in the complete english physician sixteen ninety three page three twenty six writing of the cat says it is a neat and cleanly creature often licking itself to keep it fair and clean and washing its face with its four feet the best are such as of a fair and large kind and of an exquisite tabby color called cypress cats spotted tabby cat i have thought it best to give two illustrations of the peculiar markings of the spotted tabby or leopard cat of some as showing its distinctness from the ordinary and banded tabby one of my reasons being that i have when judging at cat shows often found excellent specimens of both entered in the wrong class thereby losing all chance of a prize though if rightly entered either might very possibly have taken honors i therefore wish to direct particular attention to the spotted character of the markings of the variety called the spotted tabby it will be observed that there are no lines but what are lines in other tabbies are broken up into a number of spots and the more these spots prevail to the exclusion of lines or bands the better the specimen is considered to be 
the variety of the color or tint on which these markings or spots are placed constitutes the name such as black spotted tabby brown spotted tabby and so on the red spotted tabby or yellow spotted tabby in she cats being by far the most scarce these should be marked with spots instead of bands on the same ground color as the red or yellow banded tabby cat in the former the ground color should be a rich red with spots of a deep almost chocolate color while that of the yellow tabby may be a deep yellow cream with yellowish brown spots both are very scarce and are extremely pretty any admixture of white is not allowable in the class for yellow or red tabbies such exhibit must be put into the class should there be one which is usually the case at large shows for red or yellow and white tabbies the exhibitors will do well to make a note of there is a rich colored brown tabby hybrid to be seen at the zoological society gardens in regent's park between the wild cat of bengal and a tabby she-cat it is handsome but very wild these hybrids i am told will breed again with tame variety or with others in the brown spotted tabby the dark gray spotted tabby the black spotted tabby the gray or the blue spotted tabby the eyes are best yellow or orange tinted with the less of the green the better the nose should be of a dark red edged with black or dark brown in the dark colors or somewhat lighter color in the gray or blue tabbies the pads of the feet in all instances must be black in the yellow and the red tabby the nose and the pads of the feet are to be pink as regards the tail that should have larger spots on the upper and lower sides instead of being annulated but this is often difficult to obtain it has always occurred to me that the spotted tabby is a much nearer approach to the wild english cat and some other wild cats in the way of color than the ordinary broad banded tabby those specimens of the crosses said to be between the wild and domestic cat that i have seen have had a tendency to be spotted tabbies and these crosses were not infrequent in bygone times when the wild cats were more numerous than at present as is stated to be the case by that reliable authority thomas bewick in the year 1873 there was a specimen shown at the crystal palace cat show and also the last year or two there has been exhibited at the same place a most beautiful hybrid between the east indian wild cat and the domestic cat it is shown in the spotted tabby class and won the first prize the ground color was a deep blackish brown with well-defined black spots black pads to the feet rich in color and very strong and powerfully made and not by any means a sweet temper it was a he cat and though i have made inquiry i have not been able to ascertain that any progeny has been reared from it 
yet i have been informed that such hybrids between the indian wild cat and the domestic cat breed freely end of section nine recording by john thomas kuz kuzmarski one and the same recordings dot com section ten of cats and all about them by harrison weir this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read for you today by don larson in minnesota section ten the abyssinian i now come to the last variety of the tabby and this can scarcely be called a tabby proper as it is nearly destitute of markings except sometimes on the legs and a broad black band along the back it is mostly of a deep brown ticked with black somewhat resembling the back of a wild only not so gray rabbit along the centre of the back from the nape of the neck to the tip of the tail there is a band of black very slightly interspersed with dark brown hairs the inner sides of the leg and belly are more of a rufous orange tint than the body and are marked in some cases with a few dark patches but they are best without these marks and in the exhibition pens it is a point lost the eyes are deep yellow tinted with green nose dark red black edged ears rather small dark brown with black edges and tips the pads of the feet are black Altogether it is a pretty and interesting variety. It has been shown under a variety of names, such as Russian, Spanish, Abyssinian, Hare Cat, Rabbit Cat, and some have gone so far as to maintain that it is a cross between the latter and a cat, proving very unmistakably there is nothing, however absurd or impossible, in animal or everyday life, that some people are not ready to credit and believe. A hybrid between the English wildcat and the domestic much resembles it. And I do not consider it different in any way, with the exception of its color, from the ordinary tabby cat, from which I have seen kittens and adults bearing almost the same appearance. Some years ago, when out rabbit shooting on the South Downs, not far from Eastburn, one of our party shot a cat of this color in a copse, not far from the village of East Dean. He mistook it at first for a rabbit as it dashed into the underwood. It proved not to be wild, but belonged to one of the villagers, and was bred in the village. When the ground color is light, gray, or blue, it is generally called chinchilla, to the fur of which animal the coat has a general resemblance. I have but little inclination to place it as a distinct, though often it is of foreign breed. Such may be, though ours is merely a variety, and a very interesting one, of the ordinary tabby, with which it forms habits, temper, etc., seems fully to correspond. Still, several have been reported from Abyssinia, all of which were precisely similar, and it is stated that this is the origin of the Egyptian cat that was worshipped so many centuries ago. The mummies of the cats I have seen in no case had any hair left, so that it was impossible to determine what color they were. The imported cats are of stouter build than the English and less marked. These breeds with an English tabby often give a result of nearly black, the back band extending very much down the sides, and the brown ticks almost disappearing, producing a rich and beautiful coloring. I find there is yet another tint, or color, of the tabby proper, which I have not mentioned, that is to say, a cat marked with light wavy lines, and an exceedingly pretty one it is. It is very rare, in fact, so much so, that it has never had a class appropriated to it, and therefore it is only admissible to, or likely to win, the class for any other color, in which class usually a number of very beautiful varieties are to be found, some of which I shall have occasion to notice further on. 
The color, however, that I now refer to is often called the silver tabby, for want of a better name. It is this, the whole of the ground color, of a most delicate silver gray, clear and firm in tone, slightly blue if anything apart from the gray, and the markings thereon are but a little darker with a tinge of lilac in them, making the fur look like an evening sky, rayed with light clouds. The eyes are orange-yellow, and when large and full make a fine contrast to the color of the fur. The nose is red, edged with a lilac tint, and the pads of the feet and claws are black, or nearly so. The hair is generally very fine, short, and soft. Altogether it is most lovely and well worthy of attention, forming as it does a beautiful contrast to the red and yellow, or even the brown tabby. A turquoise ribbon about its neck will show to great advantage the delicate lilac tints of its coat, or, if a contrast is preferred, a light orange scarlet, or what is often called geranium color, will perhaps give a brighter and more pleasing effect. This is by no means so uncommon a color in the long-haired cats, some of which are exquisite, and are certainly the acme of beauty in the way of cat coloring. But I must here remark that there is a vast difference in the way of disposition between these two light varieties, that of the former being far more gentle. In fact, I am of the opinion that the short-haired cat, in general, is of a more genial temperament, more cossity, more observant, more quick in adapting itself to its surroundings and circumstances, than its long-haired brother, and, as a rule, it is also more cleanly in its habits. Though at the same time I am willing to admit that some of these peculiarities, being set aside, the long-haired cat is charmingly beautiful, and at the same time has a large degree of intelligence. In fact, much more than most animals that I know, not even setting aside the dog, and I have come to this conclusion after much long, careful, and mature consideration. End of section 10「Section 11 of Our Cats and All About Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir. Section 11. The Short-Haired White Cat. This, of all, as it depends entirely on its comeliness, should be graceful and elegant in the outline of its form and also action, the head small, not too round or thick, for this gives a clumsy, heavy appearance, but broad on the forehead and gently tapering towards the muzzle, the nose small, tip even and pink, the ears rather small than large and not too pointed, the neck slender, shoulders narrow and sloping backwards, loin full and long, legs of moderate length, tail well set on, long, broad at the base, and gradually tapering towards the end. The white should be the yellow white, that is, the white of the colours such as tortoiseshell, red tabby, or blues, not the grey-white bred from the black, as these are coarser in the quality of the furs. The eye should be large, round, full, and blue. I noted this peculiarity of white when breeding white cochins many years ago. Those chickens that were black when hatched were a colder and harder white than those which were hatched buff. This colouring of white should be fully borne in mind when crossing colours in breeding, as the results are widely different from the two varieties. The whole colour yellow-white will not do to match with blue or grey, as it will assuredly give the wrong tinge or colour. The eyes should be blue. Green is the great defect. Bright yellow is allowable, or what in horses is called wall eyes. Orange gives a heavy appearance, but yellow will harmonise and look well with a grey white. White cats with blue eyes are hardy. Mr. Timms, in Things Not Generally Known, relates that even they are not so likely to be deaf as is supposed and mentions one of seventeen years old which retained its hearing faculties perfectly. 
Some specimens I have seen with one yellow eye and one blue. This is a most singular freak of nature, and, to the best of my knowledge, is not to be found among any of the other colours. It is stated that one of the white horses recently presented by the Shah of Persia to the Emperor of Russia has blue eyes. I can scarcely credit this, but think it must be a true albino, with the grey-pink coloured eyes they generally have, or possibly the blue eye that is peculiar to the albino cat and horse, as I have never seen an albino horse or cat with pink eyes, but a kind of opalesque colour, or what is termed wall-eye. No doubt many of my readers have observed the differences in the white of our horses, they being mostly the grey white with dark skin. But the pure white has a pink skin, and is much softer and elegant in appearance. It is the same with our white cats. The Black Cat It is often said, what's in a name? The object, whatever it is, by any other would be the same. And yet there is much in a name. But this is not the question at issue, which is that of colour. Why should a black cat be thought so widely different from all others by the foolish, unthinking, and ignorant? Why simply on account of its colour being black, should it have ascribed to it a numberless variety of bad omens, besides having certain necromantic power? In Germany, for instance, black cats are kept away from children as omens of evil and if a black cat appeared in the room of one lying ill, it was said to portend death. To meet a black cat in the twilight was held unlucky. In the good old times, a black cat was generally the only colour that was favoured by men reported to be wizards, and also was said to be the constant companions of reputed witches, and in such horror and detestation were they held, that when the unfortunate creatures were ill-treated, drowned, or even burned, very frequently we are told that their cats suffered martyrdom at the same time. It is possible that one of the reasons for such wild, savage superstition may have arisen from the fact of the larger amount of electricity to be found by friction in the coat of a black cat to any other. Experiments prove there is but very little either in that of the white or the red tabby cat. Be this as it may, Still the fact remains that for some reason or other the black cat is held by the prejudiced ignorant as an animal most foul and detestable, and wonderful stories are related of their actions in the dead of the night during thunderstorms and windy nights. Yet as far as I can discover, there appears little difference either of temper or habit in the black cat distinct from that of any other colour, though it is maintained by many even to this day the black cats are far more vicious and spiteful, and of higher courage and this last I admit. Still, when a black cat is enraged, and its coat and tail are well set up, its form swollen, its round bright orange-yellow eye distended, and all aglow with anger, it certainly presents to even the most impartial observer, to say the least of it, a most uncanny appearance. But for all this their admirers are by no means few, and to my thinking a jet black cat fine and glossy in fur, and elegantly formed, certainly has its attractions, but I will refer to the superstitions connected with the black cat further on. A black cat for show purposes should be of a uniform, intense black. A brown black is richer than a blue black. I mean by this that when the hair is parted it should show in the division a dark brown black in preference to any tint of blue whatever. The coat or fur should be short, velvety, and very glossy, the eyes round and full, and of a deep orange colour, nose black, and also the pads of the feet, tail long, wide at the base, and tapering gradually towards the end. A long thin tail is a great fault, and attracts much from the merits it may otherwise possess. A good, deep, rich coloured black cat is not so common as many may at first suppose as often those that are said to be black show tabby markings under certain conditions of light, and, again, others want depth and richness of colour, some being only a very dark grey. In form it is the same as other short-haired cats, such as I have described in the white, and this brings me to the variety called blue. The blue cat. This is shown often under a number of names. It was at first shown as the archangel cat, then Russian blue, Spanish blue, Chartreuse blue, and lastly, and I know not why, 
the american blue it is not in my belief a distinct breed but merely a light-colored form of the black cat in fact i have ascertained that one shown at the crystal palace and which won many prizes on account of its beautiful blue color slightly tinged with purple was the offspring of a tabby and white she-cat and a black and white he-cat and i have seen the same color occur when bred from the cats usually kept about a farmhouse as a protection from rats and mice though none of the parents had any blue color being so beautiful and as it is possible in some places abroad it may be bred in numbers i deemed it advisable when making out the prize schedule to give special prizes for this color the fur being used for various purposes on account of its hue a fine specimen should be even in color of a bluish lilac tint with no sootiness or black and though light be firm and rich in tone in nose and pads dark and the eyes orange yellow if of a very light blue gray the nose and pads may be of a deep chocolate color and the eyes deep yellow not green if it is of a foreign variety i can only say that i see no distinction in form temper or habit and as i have before mentioned it is sometimes bred here in england from cats bearing no resemblance to the bluish lilac color nor of foreign extraction or pedigree i feel bound however to admit that those that came from archangel were of a deeper purer tint than the english crossbreeds and on reference to my notes i find that they had larger ears and eyes and were larger and longer in the head and legs also the coat or fur was excessively short rather inclined to wooliness but bright and glossy the hair inside the ears being shorter than is usual in the english cat end of section 11「Section 12 of Our Cats and All About Them」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir Section 12 The Black and White Cat this is distinct from the white and black cat, the ground color being black marked with white, while the other is white marked with black. The chief points of excellence for show purposes are a dense, bright brown black evenly marked with white. Of this I give an illustration showing the most approved way in which the white should be distributed, coming to a point between the eyes. The feet should be white and the chest, the nose, and the pads white. No black on the lips or nose, whiskers white, eyes of orange yellow. Any black on the white portions is highly detrimental to its beauty and its chance of a prize. The same markings are applicable to the brown tabby and white, the dark tabby and white, the red tabby and white, the yellow tabby and white, the blue or silver tabby and white, and the blue and white. One great point is to obtain a perfectly clear and distinct, gracefully curved outline of color, and this to be maintained throughout, the blaze on the forehead to be central. It is stated that if a dog has white anywhere, he is sure to have a white tip to his tail, and, I think, on observation, it will be found usually the case, although this is not so in the cat, for I cannot call to mind a single instance where a black and white had a white tip to its tail, but taking the various colors of the domestic cat into consideration, I think it will be found that there is a large number with some white about them than those of entirely one color, without even a few white hairs which, if they appear at all, are mostly to be found on the chest, though they often are exceedingly few in number. The White and Black Cat This differs entirely from the black and white cat, as just explained, and is the opposite as regards color, the ground being white instead of black, and the markings black on white. 
for exhibition purposes and points of excellence no particular rule exists beyond that the exhibit shall be evenly marked with the color distributed so as to balance as for example if a cat has a black patch just under one eye with a little above the balance of color would be maintained if the other eye had a preponderance of color above instead of below and so with the nose shoulders or back but it would be far better if the patches of color were the same size and shape and equal in position it might be that a cat evenly marked on the head had a mark on the left shoulder with more on the right with a rather larger patch on the right side of the loin or a black tail would help considerably to produce what is termed balance though a cat of this description would lose if competing against one of entirely uniform markings i have seen several that have been marked in a very singular way one was entirely white with black ears another white with a black tail only this had orange eyes and was very pretty another had a black blaze up the nose the rest of the animal being white this had blue eyes and was deaf another had the two front feet black all else being white the eyes were yellow tinted green all these it will be observed were perfect in the way they were marked i give an illustration of a cat belonging to mr s lyon of crewe it is remarkable in more ways than one and in all probability had it been born in the dark ages a vast degree of importance would have been attached to it not only on account of the peculiar distribution of the color and its form but also as to the singular coincidence of its birth the head is white with a black mark over the eyes and ears which when looked at from above presents the appearance of a fleur de lis the body is white with a distinct black cross on the right side or rather more on the back than side the cross resembles that known as maltese in form and is clearly defined the tail is black the legs and feet white nor does the cat's claim to notice entirely end here for marvellous to relate it was born on easter sunday a d eighteen eighty six now what would have been said of such a coincidence had this peculiar development of nature occurred in bygone times there is just the possibility that the credulous would have flocked to see the wondrous animal from far and near and even now in these enlightened times i learn from mr lyon that the cat is not by any means devoid of interest and attraction for as he tells me a number of persons have been to see it some of whom predict that luck will follow and that he and his household will in consequence doubtless enjoy many blessings and that all things will prosper with him accordingly although my remarks are directed to the white and black cat the same will apply to the white and red white and yellow white and tabby white and blue or dun color all these and the foregoing will most probably have to be exhibited in the any other color class as there is seldom one at even the largest shows for peculiar markings with white as the ground or principal color end of section twelve section thirteen of our cats and all about them this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by stephanie lee our cats and all about them by harrison weir section thirteen siamese cats among the beautiful varieties of the domestic cat brought into notice by the cat shows none deserve more attention than the royal cat of siam in form color texture and length or rather shortness of its coat it is widely different from other short-haired varieties yet there is but little difference in its mode of life or habit i have not had the pleasure of owning one of this breed though when on a visit to lady dorothy neville at dangstein near petersfield 
I had several opportunities for observation. I noticed in particular the intense liking of these cats for the woods, not passing along the hedgerows like the ordinary cat, but quickly and quietly creeping from bush to bush, then away in the shaws. Not that they displayed a wildness of nature, in being shy or distrustful, nor did they seem to care about getting wet, like many cats do, though apparently they suffer much when it is cold and damp weather, as would be likely on account of the extreme shortness of their fur, which is of both a hairy and a woolly texture, and not so glossy as our ordinary common domestic cat, nor is a tail, which is thin. Lady Dorothy Neville informed me that those which belonged to her were imported from Siam, and presented by Sir R. Herbert of the Colonial Office. The late Duke of Wellington imported the breed, also Mr. Scott of Rotherfield. Lady Dorothy Neville thought them exceedingly docile and domestic, but delicate in their constitution, although her ladyship kept one for two years, another over a year, but eventually all died of the same complaint, that of worms, which permeated every part of their body. Mr. Young of Harrogate possesses a chocolate variety of this royal Siamese cat. It was sent from Singapore to Mr. Brennand, from whom he purchased it, and is described as most loving and affectionate, which I believe is usually the case. Although this peculiar color is very beautiful and scarce, I am of opinion that the light gray or fawn color with black and well-marked muzzle, ears, and legs is a typical variety, the markings being the same as the Himalayan rabbits. There are cavies so marked, and many years ago I saw a mouse similarly colored. Mr. Young informs me that the kittens he has bred from his dark variety have invariably come the usual gray or light dun color with dark points. I therefore take that to be the correct form and color, and the darker color to be an accidental deviation. In pug dogs such a depth of color would be considered a blemish, however beautiful it might be. Even black pugs do not obtain prizes in competition with a true marked light dun but whatever color the body is it should be clear and firm rich and not clouded in any way but i give mr young's own views the dun siamese we have has won whenever shown the body is of a dun color nose part of the face ears feet and tail of a very dark chocolate brown nearly black eyes of a beautiful blue by day and of a red color at night my other prize cat is of a very rich chocolate or seal with darker face ears and tail the legs are a shade darker, which intensifies towards the feet. The eyes small, of a rich amber color, the ears are bare of hair, and not so much hair between the eyes and the ears as the English cats have. The dun, unless under special judges, invariably beats the chocolate at the shows. The tail is shorter and finer than our English cats. I may add that we lately have had four kittens from the chocolate cat by a pure dun Siamese he-cat. All the young are dun-colored and when born were very light, nearly white, but are gradually getting the dark points of the parents. In fact, I expect that one will turn chocolate. The cats are very affectionate, and make charming ladies' pets, but are rather more delicate than our cats, but after they have once wintered in England they seem to get acclimatized. Mr. Brennand, who brought the chocolate one and another, a male, from Singapore last year, informs me that there are two varieties, a large and small. Ours are the small, he also tells me the chocolate is the most rare. I have heard a little more regarding the Siamese cats from Miss Walker, the daughter of General Walker, who brought over one male and three females. It seems the only pure breed is kept at the King of Siam's palace, and the cats are very difficult to procure, for in Siam it took three different gentlemen of great influence three months before they could get any. Their food is fish and rice boiled together until quite soft, and Miss Walker finds the kitten's bread have thriven on it. It is my intention to try and breed from a white English female with blue eyes and a Siamese male. The Siamese cats are very prolific breeders, having generally five at each litter and three litters a year. We have never succeeded in breeding any like our chocolate cat. They all come fawn, with black or dark brown points. The last family are a little darker on their backs, which gives them a richer appearance than the pale fawn. Hitherto we have never had any half-bred Siamese, but there used to be a male Siamese at Herworth on Tees, and there were many young bred from English cats. They invariably showed the Siamese cross in the ground color. From the foregoing it will be seen how very difficult it is to obtain the pure breed, even in Siam, and on reference to the Crystal Palace catalogues from the year 1871 until 1887, I find that there were fifteen females and only four males, 
and some of these were not entire, and I have always understood that the latter were not allowed to be exported, and were only got by those so fortunate as a most extraordinary favour, as the king of Siam is most jealous of keeping the breed entirely in Siam as royal cats. The one exhibited by Lady Dorothy Neville, Mrs. Poodle, had three kittens by an English cat, but none showed any trace of the Siamese, being all tabby. Although Mr. Herbert Young was informed by Mr. Brennand that there is another and a larger breed in Siam, it does not appear that any of these have been imported, nor have we any description of them, either as to color, size, form, or quality of coat, or whether they resemble the lesser variety in this or any respect. Yet it is to be hoped that, ere long, some specimens may be secured for this country. Besides Mr. Herbert Young, I am also most indebted to the courtesy of Mrs. Vivian, of Dover, who is a lover of this beautiful breed, and who kindly sends the following information. The original pair were sent from Bangkok, and it is believed that they came from the king's palace, where alone the breed are said to be kept pure. At any rate, they were procured at a great favour, after much delay and great difficulty, and since that time no others have been attainable by the same person. We were in China when they reached us, and the following year, 1886, we brought the father, mother, and a pair of kittens to England. Their habits are in general the same as the common cat, though it has been observed by strangers there is a pleasant wild animal odor which is not apparent to us most of the kittens have a kink in the tail it varies in position sometimes in the middle close to the body or at the extreme end like a hook this tallies with the description given by mr darwin of the malayan and also the siamese cats see my notes on the manx cat mr young had also noted this peculiarity in the royal cat of siam mrs vivian further remarks they are very affectionate and personally attached to their human friends not liking to be left alone and following us from room to room more after the manner of dogs than cats they are devoted parents the old father taking the greatest interest in the young ones they are friendly with the dogs of the house occupying the same baskets but the males are very strong and fight with great persistency with strange dogs and conquer all other tomcats in their neighborhood we lost one, however, a very fine cat, in China in this way, as he returned to the house almost torn to pieces and in a dying condition, from an encounter with some animal which we think was one of the wild cats of the hills. We feed them on fresh fish boiled with rice, until the two are nearly amalgamated. They also take bread and milk warm, the milk having been boiled, and this diet seems to suit them better than any other. They also like chicken and game. We have proved the fish diet is not essential, as two of our cats in Cornwall never get it. Rather a free life seems necessary to their perfect acclimatization, where they can go out and provide themselves with raw animal food, feather and fur. We find these cats require a great deal of care unless they live in the country, and become hardy through being constantly out of doors. The kittens are difficult to rear unless they are born late in the spring, thus having the warm weather before them most deaths occur before they are six months old we have lost several kittens from worms which they endeavour to vomit as relief we give them raw chicken heads with the feathers on with success we also give cod liver oil if the appetite fails and weight diminishes when first born the colour is nearly pure white the only trace of points being a fine line of dark grey at the edge of the ears a gradual alteration takes place the body becoming creamy the ears, face, tail, and feet darkening. Until about a year old, they attain perfection when the point should be the deepest brown, nearly black, and the body ash or fawn color, eyes opal or blue, looking red in the dark. After maturity, they are apt to darken considerably, though not in all specimens. They are most interesting and delightful pets, but owing to their delicacy and the great care they require, no one, unless a real cat lover, should attempt to keep them they cannot with safety to their health be treated as common cats during susan's one of the cats illness the old he-cat came daily to condole with her bringing delicate attentions in the form of freshly caught mice loquat also provided this for a young family for whom she had no milk another Siwan, is very clever at undoing the latch of the window in order to let himself out tying it up with string is of no use and he has even managed to untwist wire that has been used to prevent his going out in the snow we have at present two males four adult females and five kittens one of our kittens sent to scotland last august has done well mrs lee of penshurst 
also has some fine specimens of the breed, and of the same colors as described. I take it, therefore, that the true breed, by consensus of opinion, is that of the dun, fawn, or ash-colored ground, with black points. Other colors should be shown in the variety classes. The head should be long from the ears to the eyes, and not over broad, and then rather sharply taper off towards the muzzle, the forehead flat and receding, the eyes somewhat aslant downwards towards the nose, and the eyes of a pearly yet bright blue color, the ears usual size and black, with little or no hair on the inside, with black muzzle and round the eyes black. The form should be slight, graceful, and delicately made, body long, tail rather short and thin, and the legs somewhat short, slender, and the feet oval, not so round as the ordinary English cat. The body should be one bright, uniform, even color, not clouded, either rich fawn, dun, or ash, the legs, feet, and tail black. The back slightly darker is allowable, if of a rich color, and the color softened, not clouded. End of section 13 Section 14 of Our Cats and All About Them This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Packard Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir Section 14 The Manx Cat The Manx Cat is well known and is by no means uncommon. It differs chiefly from the ordinary domestic cat in being tailless, or nearly so. The best breeds, not having any. The hind legs are thicker and rather long, particularly in the thighs. It runs more like a hare than a cat, the action of the legs being awkward, nor does it seem to turn itself so readily, or with such rapidity and ease. The head is somewhat small for its size, yet thick and well set on a rather long neck. The eyes large, round, and full, ears medium, and rather rounded at the apex. In color they vary, but I do not remember to have seen a white or many black, though one of the best that has come under my notice was the latter color. I have examined a number of specimens sent for exhibition at the Crystal Palace and other cat shows, and found in some a very short, thin, twisted tail, in others a mere excrescence, and some with an appendage more like a knob. These I have taken as having been operated upon when young, the tail being removed, but this may not be the case, as Mr. St. George Mavere, in his very valuable book on the cat, mentions a case where a female cat had her tail so injured by the passage of a cartwheel over it that her master judged it best to have it cut off near the base. Since then she has had two litters of kittens, and in each litter one or more of the kittens had a stump of tail, while their brothers and sisters had tails of the usual length. But were there no Manx cats in the neighborhood is a query. This case is analogous to the statement that the short hair sheep dog was produced from parents that had their tails amputated, and yet this is now an established breed. Also a small black breed of dogs from the Netherlands, which is now very fashionable. They are called chipperks, and they have no tails, at least when exhibited. Mr. St. George Mavere further states that Mr. Bartlett told him, as he has so stated to myself, that in the Isle of Man the cats have tails of different lengths, but nothing up to ten inches. I have also been informed on good authority that the fox terrier dogs, which invariably have, as a matter of fashion, their tails cut short, sometimes have puppies with much shorter tails than the original breed, but this does not appear to take effect on sheep whose tails are generally cut off. I cannot, myself, come to the same conclusion as to the origin of the Manx cat. Be this as it may, one thing is certain, that cross-bred Manx with other cats often have young that are tailless. As a proof of this, Mr. Herbert Young of Harrogate has in his possession a very fine red female long-haired tailless cat, which was bred between a Manx and a Persian. Another case showing the strong prepotency of the Manx cat, Mr. Hodgkin of Erdage some time ago had a female Manx cat sent to him, 
Not only does she produce tailless cats when crossed with the ordinary cat, but the progeny again crossed also frequently have some tailless kittens in each litter. I have also been told that there is a breed of tailless cat in Cornwall. Mr. Darwin states in his book on the variation of animals and plants under domestication, volume 1, page 47, that throughout an immense area, namely the Malayan archipelago, Siam, Pequon, and Burma, all the cats have truncated tails about half the proper length, often with a short knob at the end. This description tallies somewhat with the appearance of some of the Siamese cats that have been imported, several of which, though they have fairly long and thin tails, and though they are much pointed at the end, often have a break or kink. In a note, Mr. Darwin says, The Madagascar cat is said to have a twisted tail. C. DeMar, in Encyclopedia of Natural Mammals, 1820, page 233, for some other breeds. Mr. St. George Mavere also corroborates the statement, so far as the Malay cat is concerned. He says the tail is only half the ordinary length, and often contorted into a sort of knot so that it cannot be straightened. He further states, its contortion is due to deformity of the bones in the tail, and there is a tailless breed of cats in the Crimea. Some of the Manx cats I have examined have precisely the kind of tail here described, thin, very short, and twisted, and cannot be straightened. Is it possible that the Manx cat originated from the Malayan? Or rather, is it a freak of nature perpetuated by selection? Be this as it may, we may have the Manx cat now as a distinct breed, and, when crossed with others, will almost always produce some entirely tailless kittens, if not all. Many of the Siamese kittens bred here have kinks in their tails. The illustration I give is that of a prize winner at the Crystal Palace in 1880, 1881, 1882, and is the property of Mr. J. M. Thomas of Parliament Street. In color, it is a brindled tortoise shell. It is eight years old. At the end of this description, I will also give a portrait of one of its kittens, a tabby. Both are true Manx, and neither have a particle of tail, only a very small tuft of hair which is boneless. The hindquarters are very square and deep, as contrasted with other cats, and the flank deeper, giving an appearance of great strength, the hind legs being longer and thicker in proportion to the forelegs, which are much slighter and tapering. Even the toes are smaller. The head is round for a she-cat, and the ear is somewhat large and pointed, but thin and fine with hair. The cavity of the ear has less hair within it, also a trait of the Siamese, than some other short-haired cats. The neck is long and thin, as are the shoulders. Its habits are the same as those of most cats. I may add that Mr. Thomas, who is an old friend of mine, has had this breed many years, and kept it perfectly pure. End of section. Recording by Michael Packard. Section 15 of Our Cats and All About Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Packard. Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir. Section 15. Various Colors. Those who have had much to do with breeding and crossing of animals, birds, or plants, well know that with time, leisure, and patience, how comparatively easy it is to improve, alter, enlarge, or diminish any of these, or any part of them. And looking at the cat from this standpoint, now that it is becoming a fancy animal, there is no prophesying what forms, colors, markings, or other variations will be made by those who understand what can be done by careful, well-considered matching and skillful selection. We have now cats with no tails, short tails, and some with moderate length, long tails, bushy and hairy. But should a very long tail be in request, I have no doubt whatever but that in a few years it would be produced. And now that there is a cat club constituted for the welfare and improvement of the condition, as well as the careful breeding of cats, curious and unforeseen results are most likely to be attained. 
But whether any will ever excel to the many beautiful varieties we now have is a problem that remains to be solved. This concludes the numerous varieties of colors and the proper markings of the domestic cat as regards beauty and the points of excellence to be observed for the purposes of exhibition, these are distinct, and as such, nearly all have classes for each individual color and marking, and therefore it is imperative that the owner should note carefully the different properties and beauties of his or her particular specimen, and also as carefully read the schedule of prizes with such attention as to be enabled to enter his or her pet in the proper class, for it is not only annoying to the exhibitor, but to the judge to find an animal sometimes of extraordinary merit placed in the wrong class, by sheer inattention to the printed rules and instructions prepared by the committee or promoters of the show. It is exceedingly distasteful, and I may say almost distressing, to a judge to find a splendid animal wrongly entered, and so to feel himself compelled to pass it, and to affix the words, fatal to all chance of winning, wrong class. Again, let me impress on exhibitors to be careful, very careful in this matter, this matter of entry, for I may say it is one of the reasons which has led to my placing these notes on paper though I have done so with much pleasure, and with earnest hope that they will be found of some value in the service to the uninitiated. Of course there are, as there must be, a number of beautiful shades of color, tints and markings that are difficult to define or describe, colors and markings that are intermediate with those noticed, but though in themselves they are extremely interesting and even very beautiful. They do not come within the range of the classes for certain definite forms of lines, spots, or colorings, as I have endeavored to point out, and, indeed, it is almost impossible to make a sufficient number of classes to comprehend the whole. Therefore, it has been considered wisest and even necessary as to the best interests of the exhibitor and also to simplify the difficulties of judging and for the maintenance of the various forms of beauty of the cat, to have classes wherein they are shown under rules of color, points of beauty, and excellence that are hard and fast. And by this means, all may not only know how and in what class to exhibit, but also what their chances of taking honors. As I have just stated, there are intermediate colors, markings, and forms, so, extra classes have been provided for these under the heading of any other variety of color, and any other variety not before mentioned, and any cats of peculiar structure. In this last case, the cats that have abnormal formations, such as seven toes, or even nine on the fore and hind legs, peculiar in other ways, such as three legs, or only two legs, as I have seen, may be exhibited. I regard these, however, as malformations and not to be encouraged, being generally devoid of beauty and lacking interest for the ordinary observer. And they also tend to create a morbid taste for the unnatural and ugly, instead of the beautiful. The beautiful, be it what it may, is always pleasant to behold and there is but little, if any doubt in my mind, but that the constant companionship of even a beautiful cat must have a soothing effect. Therefore, not in cats only, but in all things have the finest and best. Surround yourself with the elegant, the graceful, the brilliant, the beautiful, the agile, the gentle. Be it what it may, animal, bird, or flower, be careful to have the best. A man, it is said, is made more or less by his environments, and doubtless there is to a great extent, if not entirely, a fact that being so, the contemplation of the beautiful must have its quieting, restful influences, and tend to a brighter and happier state of existence. I am fully aware that there are many that may differ from me, 
although I feel sure I am not far wrong when I aver that there are few animals really more beautiful than a cat. If it is a good, carefully selected specimen, well kept and well cared for, in high condition, in its prime of life, well trained, graceful in every line, bright in color, distinct in markings, supple and elegant in form, agile and gentle in its ways, it is beautiful to look at and must command admiration. Yes, the contemplation of the beautiful elevates the mind. If only in a cat, beauty of any kind is beauty and has its refining influences. End of section. Recording by Michael Packard. Section 16 of Our Cats and All About Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nadine eckert Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir. Section 16. Usefulness of Cats. In our urban and suburban houses, what should we do without cats? In our sitting or bedrooms, our libraries, in our kitchens and storerooms, our farms, barns and rickyards, in our docks, our granaries, our ships and our wharves, in our corn markets, meat markets, and other places too numerous to mention, how useful they are. In our ships, however, the rats oft set them at defiance. Still, they are of great service. How wonderfully patient is the cat when watching for rats or mice, awaiting the egress from their place of refuge or that which is their home. How well Shakespeare in Pericles, Act the Third, describes this keen attention of the cat to its natural pursuit. The cat, with eye of burning coal, now crouches from before the mouse's hole. A slight rustle, and the fugitive comes forth, a quick, sharp, resolute motion, and the cat has proved its usefulness. Let any one have a plague of rats and mice, as I once had, and let them be delivered therefrom by cats, as I was, and they will have a lasting and kind regard for them. A friend not long since informed me that a cat at Stone's distillery was seen to catch two rats at one time, a four foot on each. All the cats kept at this establishment, and there are several, are of the red tabby color, and therefore most likely all males. I am credibly informed of a still more extraordinary feat of a cat in catching mice, that of a red tabby cat, which on being taken into a granary at Seven Oaks, where there were a number of mice, dashed in among a retreating group, and secured four, one with each paw, and two in her mouth. At the office of the morning advertiser, I am informed by my old friend, Mr. Charles Williams, they boast of a race of cats bred there for nearly half a century. In color, these are mostly tortoise shell, and some are very handsome. The government, mindful also of their utility, pay certain sums which are regularly passed through the accounts quarterly for the purpose of providing and keeping cats in our public offices, dockyards, stores, shipping, etc., thereby providing, if proof were wanting, their acknowledged worth. In Vienna four cats are employed by the town magistrates to catch mice on the premises of the municipality. A regular allowance is voted for their keep, and, after a limited period of active service, they are placed on the retired list with a comfortable pension. There are also a number of cats in the service of the United States Post Office. These cats are distributed over the different offices to protect the bags from being eaten by rats and mice, and the cost of providing for them is duly inscribed in the accounts. When a birth takes place, the local postmaster informs the district superintendent of the fact and obtains an addition to his rations. A short time ago, the budget of the Imperial Printing Office in France, amongst other items, contained one for cats, which caused some merriment in the legislative chamber during its discussion. According to the pays, these cats are kept for the purpose of destroying the numerous rats and mice which infest the premises, 
and cause considerable damage to the large stock of paper which is always stored there. This feline staff is fed twice a day, and a man is employed to look after them, so that for cat's meat and the keeper's salary no little expense is annually incurred, sufficient, in fact, to form a special item in the national expenditure. Mr. W. M. Ackworth, in his excellent book, The Railways of England, gives a very interesting account of the usefulness of the cat. He says, writing of the Midland Railway, a few miles further off, however, at Trent, is a still more remarkable portion of the company's staff, eight cats, who are born on the strength of the establishment, and for whom a sufficient allowance of milk and cat's meat is provided. And when we say that the cats have under their charge, according to the season of the year, from one to three or four hundred thousand empty corn sacks, it will be admitted that the company cannot have many servants who better earn their wages. The holes in the sacks, which are eaten by the rats which are not killed by the cats, are downed by twelve women who are employed by the company. Few people know, or wish to know, what a boon to mankind is the domestic cat. Liked or disliked, there is the cat, in some cases unthought of or uncared for, but simply kept on account of the devastation that would otherwise take place were rats and mice allowed to have undivided possession. An uncle of mine had some hams sent from Yorkshire. During the transit by rail, the whole of the interior of one of the largest was consumed by rats. More cats at the stations would possibly have prevented such irritating damage. And further, it is almost incredible, and likewise almost unknown, the great benefit the cat is to the farmer. All day they sleep in the barns, stables, or outhouses, among the hay or straw. At eve they are seen about the rickyard, the corn stack, the cow and bullock yards, the stables, the gardens, and the newly sown or mown fields, in quest of their natural prey, the rat and mouse. In the fields the mice eat and carry off the newly sown peas or corn, so in the garden, or the ripe and garnered corn in stacks. But when the cat is on guard, much of this is prevented. Rats eat corn and carry off more, kill whole broods of ducklings and chickens in a night, undermine buildings, stop drains, and unwittingly do much other injury to the well-being of the farmers and others. What a ruinous thing it would be, and what a dreadfully horrible thing it is to be overrun with rats, to say nothing of mice. In this matter, man's best friend is the cat. Silent, careful, cautious, and sure, it is at work while the owner sleeps, with an industry, a will, and purpose that never rests nor tires from dewy eve till rosy morn, when it will glide through the cat-hole into the barn for repose among the straw, and when night comes, forth again, its usefulness scarcely imagined, much less known and appreciated. They who remember Old Fleet Prison in Farringdon Street will scarcely believe that the debtors there confined were at times so neglected as to be absolutely starving, so much so that a Mr. Morgan, a surgeon of Liverpool, being put into that prison, was ultimately reduced so low by poverty, neglect, and hunger as to catch mice by the means of a cat for his sustenance. This is stated to be the fact in a book written by Moses Pitt, The Cries of the Oppressed, 1691. End of section 16 Recording by Nadine Eckert Boulet Section 17 of Our Cats and All About Them This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by John Thomas Kuz Kuzmarski Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir General Management Feeding Adult cats require less food in proportion than kittens, for two reasons. One is that a kitten is growing, 
and therefore extra bone, flesh, skin, hair, and all else has to be provided for, while in the adults these are more or less acquired, and also they produce for themselves in various ways in country or suburban localities much live and other food and no animal is the better for over or excessive feeding especially if confined or its chances of exercise contracted i have tried many ways or methods of feeding biscuits of sorts liver lights horse flesh bread and milk rice fish and cat mixtures but have always attained the best results by giving new milk as drink and raw shin of beef for food with grass boiled asparagus stems cabbage lettuce or some other vegetable either cooked or fresh good horse flesh is much liked by the cat and it thrives well on it. I do not believe in either liver or lights as a flesh or bone maker. Besides the beef, there are the titbits that the household cat not only usually receives, but looks for or expects. My dear friend, Mr. John Timms, in Things Not Generally Known, avers that cats are not so fond of fish as flesh, and that the statement that they are is a fallacy. He says, put both before them, and they will take the flesh first. And this I have found to be correct. I should only give fresh fish, as a rule to a cat when unwell, more as an alternative to food. As raw meat or other raw food is natural to the cat, it is far the best with vegetables for keeping the body, coat, and skin in good condition and health, and the securing of a rich, bright, high color and quality. On no account try to improve these by either medicinal liquids, pills, or condiments. Nothing can be much worse, as reflection will prove. If the cat is healthy, it is at its best, and will keep so by proper food. If unwell, then use such medicines as the disease or complaint it suffers from requires, and not otherwise. Many horses and other animals have their constitutions entirely ruined by what are called coat tonics, which are useless, and only believed in and practiced by the thoughtless, gullible, and foolish. Does any one, or will any one, take pills, powders, or liquids for promoting the color or texture of their hair? Would anyone be so silly? And yet we are coolly told to give such things to our animals. Granted that in illness medicine is of much service, in health it is harmful, and tends to promote disease where none exists. Sleeping Places I much prefer a round basket filled with oat straw to anything else. Some urge that a box is better. My cats have a basket. It is well to sprinkle the straw occasionally with Keating's powder or flour of sulfur, which is a preventive of insect annoyances, and prevention is better than cure. Never shut cats up in close cupboards for the night. There being little or no ventilation, it is most injurious, pure air being as essential to a cat as to a human being. Always have a box with dry earth near the cat's sleeping place, unless there is an opening for egress near. Do not, as a rule, put either collar or ribbon on your cat. 
though they may thereby be improved in appearance they are too apt to get entangled or caught by the collar and often strangulation ensues besides which in long-haired cats it spoils their mane or frill of course at shows it is allowable all cats as well as other animals should have ready access to a pan of clear water which should be changed every day and the pan cleaned fresh air sunlight and warm sunshine are good both for cats and their owners it is related of charles james fox that walking up st james's street from one of the club houses with the prince of wales he laid a wager that he would see more cats than the prince in his walk and that he might take which side of the street he liked when they reached the top it was found that mr fox had seen thirteen cats and the prince not one the royal personage asked for an explanation of this apparent miracle mr fox said your royal highness took of course the shady side of the way as most agreeable i knew the sunny side would be left for me and cats always prefer the sunshine a most essential requisite for the health of the cat is cleanliness in itself the animal is particularly so as may be observed by its constant habit of washing or cleaning its fur many times a day therefore a clean basket clean straw or clean flannel to lie on in fact everything clean is not only necessary but is a necessity for its absolute comfort mr timbs says it is equally erroneous that she is subject to fleas the small insect which infests the half-grown kitten being a totally different animal exceedingly swift in running but not salient or leaping like a flea in this mr timbs slightly errs cats do have fleas but not often and of a different kind to the ordinary flea but i have certainly seen them jump in dressing the coat of the cat no comb should be used more especially with the long-haired varieties but if so which i do not recommend great care should be used not to drag the hair so that it comes out or breaks otherwise a rough uneven coat will and must be the result should the hair become clotted matted or felted as is sometimes the case it ought to be moistened either with oil or soft soap a little water being added and when the application has well soaked in it it will be found comparatively easy to separate the tangle with the fingers by gently pulling out from the mass a few hairs at a time after which wash thoroughly and use a soft long-haired brush but this must be done with discretion so as not to spoil the natural waviness of the hair or to make it lie in breadths instead of the natural easy carelessly parted flaky appearance which shows the white or blue cat off to such advantage washing most cats have a dislike to water and as a rule and under ordinary conditions generally keep themselves clean more especially the short-haired breeds but as is well known the angora Persian and russian if not taken care of are sure to require washing the more so to prepare them for exhibition as there is much 
gain in the condition in which a cat comes before the judge. There are many cases of cats taking to the water and swimming to certain points to catch fish, or for other food on record, yet it is seldom that they take a pleasure in playing about in it. I therefore think it well to mention that I had a half-bred black and white Russian that would frequently jump into the bath while it was being filled, and sit there until the water rose too high for its safety. Thus cats may be taught to like washing. If a cat is to be washed, treat it as kindly and gently as is possible, speaking in a soothing tone, and in no way be hasty or sudden in your movements, so as to raise distrust or fear. Let the water be warm, but not hot. Put the cat in slowly, and when its feet rest on the bottom of the tub, you may commence the washing. Mr. A. A. Clark the well-known cat fancier says i seldom wash my cats i rather prefer giving them a good clean straw bed and attending to their general health and condition and they will then very seldom require washing i find that much washing makes the coat harsh and poor and i also know from experience that it is a work of art to wash a cat properly, and requires an artist in that way to do it. My plan is to prepare some liquid soap by cutting a piece into shreds and putting it into cold water, and then boiling it for an hour. I then have two clean tubs, got ready one, one to wash, the other to rinse in have soft water about blood heat, with a very small piece of soda in the washing tub, into which I place the cat, hind quarters first, having some one that it knows perfectly well, to hold and talk to the cat while the washing is going on. I begin with the tail, and thoroughly rubbing in the soap with my hands and getting by degrees over the body and shoulders up to the ears, leaving the head until the cat is rinsed in the other tub, which ought to be half full with warm, soft water, into which I place the cat, and thoroughly rinse out all the soap. Then, at the same time, I wash the head, and then sit in front of the fire and dry with warm towels and if it is done well and thoroughly, it is a good three hours' hard work. I would add to the foregoing that I should use Naldir's dog soap, which I have found excellent in all ways, and it also destroys any insect life that may be present. Also in washing, be careful not to move the hands in circles, or the hair will become entangled and knotty, and very difficult to untwist or unravel. Take the hair in the hands, and press the softened soap through and through the interstices, and when rinsing, do the same with the water, using a large sponge for the purpose. After drying, I should put the cat in a box, lightly, full of oat straw, and place it in front of or near a fire, at such distance as not to become too warm, and only near enough to prevent a chill before the cat is thoroughly dry. End of section 17. Recording by John Thomas Kuz Kuzmarski www.thenerdcoach.com Section 18 of Our Cats and All About Them. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Thomas Kuz Kuzmarski. Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir. General Management, Part 2. Mating. Yet nature is made better by no mean. But nature makes that mean, so o'er that art, which you say adds to nature, is an art that nature makes. Coriolanus, Act Two, Scene One. This requires much and careful consideration, and in this, as well as in many other things, experience and theory join hands, while the knowledge of the naturalist and fancier is of great and superlative value. Yet, with all combined, anything like certainty can never be assured, although the possession of pedigree is added, and the different properties of food, health, quality, and breed understood and taken into account. Still, much may be gained by continued observation and close study of the peculiar properties of color besides that of form. If, for instance, a really absolutely blue cat without a shade of any other color were obtainable, and likewise a pure, clear, canary yellow, there is little doubt that at a distant period a green would be the ultimate goal of success. But the yellow tabby is not a yellow, nor the blue a blue, there being then only a certain variety of color in cats. The tints to be gained are limited entirely to a certain set of such colors, and the numerous shades and half-shades of these mixed, broken or not, into tints, markings light or dark as desired. To all color arrangements, if I may so call them, by the mind, intellect, or hand of man, there is a limit, beyond which none can go. It is thus far and no further. There is the black cat, and the white, and between these are intervening shades, from very light, or white-gray, to darker, blue, dark blue, blackish blue, gray and black. If a blue-black cat is used, the lighter colors are of one tint. If a brown-black, they are another. Then in what are termed the sandies and browns, it commences with the yellow-white tint scarcely visible apart from white to the uninitiated eye, then darker and darker until it culminates in deep brown with the intervening yellows, reds, chestnuts, mahoganies, and such colors, which generally are striped with a darker color of nearly their own shade until growing denser it ends in brown black the gray tabby has a ground color of gray in this there are the various shades from little or no markings leaving the color a brown or gray or the gray gradually disappearing before the advance of the black in broader and broader bands until the first is excluded and black is the result the tortoise shell is a mixture of colors in patches and is certainly an exhibition of what may be done by careful selection mating and crossing of an animal while under the control of man in a state of thorough domestication what the almond tumbler is to the pigeon fancier so is the tortoise shell cat to the cat fancier 
or the bizarre tulip to the florist. As regards color, it is a triumph of art over nature. By the means of skillful, careful mating, continued with unwearying patience. We get the same combination of color in the guinea pig, both male and female, and therefore this is in part a proof that by proper mating, eventually a tortoise-shell male cat should soon be by no means a rarity. There are rules which, if strictly followed, under favorable conditions, ought to produce certain properties, such properties that may be desired either by foolish, which generally it is, fashion, or the production of absolute beauty of form, markings in colors, or other brilliant effects, and which the true fanciers endeavor to obtain. It is to this latter I shall address my remarks, rather than to the reproduction of the curious, the inelegant, or the deformed, such as an undesirable number of toes, which are impediments to utility. In the first place, the fancier must thoroughly make up his mind as to the variety of form, color, association of colors or markings by which he wishes to produce, if possible, perfection. And, having done so, he must provide himself with such stock as, on being mated, are likely to bring such progeny as will enable him in due time to attain the end he has in view. This being gained, he must also prepare himself for many disappointments, which are the more likely to accrue from the reason that, in all probability, he starts without any knowledge of the ancestry or pedigree of the animals with which he begins his operations. Therefore, for this reason, he has to gain his knowledge of any aptitude for divergence from the ordinary or the common they may exhibit, or which his practical experience discovers, and thus, as it were, build up a family with certain points and qualities before he can actually embark in the real business of accurately matching and crossing, so as to produce the results which, by a will, undeviating perseverance and patience, he is hoping to gain eventually. The perfection he so long, ardently, and anxiously seeks to acquire. But he must bear in mind that that on which he sets his mark, though high, must come within the limits and compass of that which is attainable, for it is not the slightest use to attempt that which is not within the charmed circle of possibilities. Tortoise Shells I place these first on the list because, being an old pigeon fancier and somewhat of a florist, I deem these to be the breed wherein there is the most art and skill required to produce properly all the varied mottled beauty of bright colors that a cat of this breed should possess. And those who have bred tortoise shells well know how difficult a task it is. In breeding for this splendid, gorgeous, and diversified management of coloring, a black or even a blue may be used with a yellow or red tabby female, or a white male, supposing either or both were the offspring of a tortoise shell mother. The same males might be used with advantage with a tortoise shell female. This is on the theory of whole colors, 
and patches or portions of whole colors without bars or markings when possible in the same way some of the best almond tumbler pigeons are bred from an almond cock mated to a yellow hen the difficulty here until lately has been to breed hens of the varied mottling on almond color the hen almost invariably coming nearly if not quite yellow so much so that forty to fifty years ago a yellow hen was considered as a pair to an almond cock in the same way as the red tabby male is now regarded in respect to the tortoiseshell female and it was not until at birmingham many years ago when acting as judge i refused to award prizes to them as such that the effort was made and a successful one to breed almond-colored hens with the same plumage as the cock that is the three colors with cats the matter is entirely different it being the male at present that is the difficulty if a real difficulty it may be called mr herbert young a most excellent cat fancier and authority on the subject is of opinion that if a tortoise-shell male cat could be found it would not prove fertile with a tortoise-shell female but of this i am very doubtful because if the red and the yellow tabby is so which is decidedly a weaker color i do not see how it can possess more vitality than a cat marked with the three colors in fact the latter ought in reality to be more prolific having black as one of the colors which is a strong color blue being only the weak substitute or with white combined a whole black is one of the strongest colors and most powerful of cats reverting once again to the pigeon fancier by way of analogy take as an instance what is termed the silver colored pigeon or the yellow these two and duns are by loss of certain pigments differently colored and constituted like the tortoise shell among cats from other varieties of pigeons of harder colors such as blues and blacks or even reds for a long time silver turbot cock pigeons were so scarce that until i bred some myself i had never seen such a thing yet hens were common enough and got from silver and blues in the nestling before the feathers come the young of these colors are without down and are thus thought to be and doubtless are a weakly breed yet there is no absolute diminution of strength beyond that of color when silver is matched to silver but done with done these last go lower in the scale losing the black tint and not unfrequently the color is yellow or matched with black breed true blacks i am therefore of opinion that a tortoise-shell male and female would and should produce the best of tortoise shells both male and female it not unfrequently happens that from a tortoise shell mother in the litter of kittens there are male blacks and clear whites and i have known of one case when a good blue and one where the mixed colors were blue light red and light yellow were produced while the sisters in the litter were of the usual pure tortoise-shell markings in such cases generally the latter only are kept unless it is the blue the others being too often destroyed my own plan would be to breed from such black or white males 
and if not successful in the first attempt, to breed again in the same way with the young obtained with such cross. And I have but little doubt that, by so doing, the result so long sought after would be achieved. At least, I deem it, far more likely to be so than the present plan of using the red tabby as the male, which are easily produced, though very few are of high excellence in richness of ground tints. Tortoise shell and white. If tortoise shell and white are desired, then a black and white male may be selected, being bred in the same way as those recommended for the pure tortoise shell, or one without white if the female has white. But on no account should an ordinary tabby be tolerated. But a red tabby female of deep color, or having white, may be held in request though I would prefer patches of color, not in any way barred. The gray tabby will throw barred, spotted, or banded kittens mixed with tortoise shell, which is the very worst form of mottling, and is very difficult to eradicate. A gray ticking will most likely appear between the dark color as it does between the black bars of the tabby. The best black, undoubtedly, are those bred from tortoiseshell mothers or females. The black is generally more dense, and less liable to show any signs of spots, bands, or bars, when the animal is in the sun or a bright light. When this is so, it is fatal, to a black as regards its chance of a prize or even notice and it comes under the denomination of a black tabby if a black and white cat are mated let the black be the male blacks having more stamina the issue will probably be either white or black and also when you wish the black to be perpetuated the black male must be younger. In 1884, a black female cat was exhibited with five white kittens. I have just seen a beautiful black Persian whose mother was a clear white. This and the foregoing example prove either color represents the same for the purpose of breeding to color. For breeding black with white, take care that the white is the gray white, and not the yellow white. The first generally has orange or yellow eyes, and this is one of the required qualities in the black cat. If a yellow white with blue eyes, this type of eye would be detrimental, and most likely the eyes of the offspring would have a green stain, or possibly be of odd colors. It should be borne in mind that black kittens are seldom, or ever, so rich in color when newly born as they afterwards become. Therefore, if without spots or bars, and of a deep self-brown black, they will, in all possibility, be fine in color when they gain their adult coat. This the experienced fancier well knows, though the tyro often destroys that which will ultimately prove of value simply from ignorance. An instance of the brown-black kitten is before me as I write, in a beautiful Persian, which is now changing from the dull kitten self-brown-black on to a brilliant, glossy, jetty beauty. Blues Blue in cats is one of the most extraordinary colors of any. 
for the reason that it is the mixture of black, which is no color, and white, which is no color, and which is the more curious, because black mated with white generally produces either one color or the other, or breaks black and white, or white and black. The blue being, as it were, a weakened black, or a withdrawal by white of some, if not all, of the brown or red, varying in tint according to the color of the black from which it was bred, dark gray, or from weakness in the stamina of the litter. In the human species, an alliance of the Negro or African race and the European produces the mulatto and some other shades of colored skin, though the hair generally retains the black hue. But seldom or ever are the colors broken up as in animal life. The only instance that has to come to my knowledge, and I believe on record, being that of the spotted negro boy exhibited at fairs in England by Richardson, the famous showman, but in this case both the parents were black and natives of South Africa. The boy arrived in England in September 1809 and died February 1813. His skin and hair were everywhere parti-colored, transparent brown and white. On the crown of his head several triangles, one within the other, were formed by alternations of the color of the hair. In other domestic animals, blue color is not uncommon. Blue-tinted dogs, rabbits, horses of a blue-gray, or spotted with blue on a pink flesh color, as in the naked horse shown at the Crystal Palace some years ago, also pigs, and all these have likewise broken colors of blue, or black and white. I do not remember having seen any blue cattle, nor any blue guinea pigs, but no doubt these latter will soon exist. When once the color or break from the black is acquired, it is then easy to go on multiplying the different shades and varieties of tint and tone, from the dark blue-black to the very light, almost white-gray. In some places in Russia, I am told, blue cats are exceedingly common. I have seen several shown under the names of Archangel and others as Chartreuse and Maltese cats. Persians are imported sometimes of this color, both dark and light. Next kin to it is the very light gray tabby, with almost the same hue, if not quite so light gray markings. Two such mated have been known to produce very light self-grays, and of a lovely hue, a sort of morning gray. These, matched with black, should breed blues. Old male black and young female white cats have been known to produce kittens this color. There is a colony of farm cats at Rodmel, Sussex, from which very fine blues are bred. Light silver tabby males and white females are also apt to have one or so in a litter of kittens but these generally are not such good blues the color being a gray white or nearly so should the hair or coat be parted or divided the skin being light the very dark if from brown black are not so blue but come under the denomination of smokies or blue smokies with scarcely a tint of blue in them some smokies are white, or nearly so, with dark tips to the hair. 
These more often occur among Persian than English cats, though I once had a smoky tabby bred from a black and a silver tabby. Importations of some of the former are often extremely light, scarcely showing any markings. These, and such as these, are very valuable where a self-blue is desired. If these light colors are females, a smoke-colored male is an excellent cross, as it already shows a weakened color. For a very light, tender, delicate, light gray, long-haired self, I should try a white male, and either a rich blue or a soft gray, extremely lightly marked tabby. As a rule, all broken whites, such as black and white, should be avoided because, as I explained at the commencement of these notes on blues, the blue is black and white amalgamated, or the brown withdrawn from the coloring, or, if not, with the colors breaking, or becoming black and white. If whole colored blues are in request, then party colors, such as white and black, or black and white, are best excluded. Blue and white are easily attainable by mating a blue male with a white and black female. The best and deepest colored of the blue short-haired cats are from Archangel. Those I have seen were very fine in color, the pelage being the same color to the skin, which was also dark and of a uniform lilac-tinted blue. Some come by chance. I knew of a blue English cat, winner of several prizes, whose parents were a black and white male mated with a light gray tabby and white. But this was an exception to the rule, for strongly marked tabbies are not a good cross. Brown tabby. For the purpose of breeding rich brown black striped tabbies, a male of a rich dark rufous or red tabby should be selected. The bands being regular and not too broad, the lighter or ground color showing well between the lines. If the black lines are very broad, it is then a black striped with brown instead of a brown with black, which is wrong. With this match, a female of a good brown ground color, marked with dense, not broad, black bands, having clear, sharply defined edges. Note also that the center line of the back is a distinct line, with the brown ground color on which it is placed being in no way interspersed with black, and at least as broad as the black line. By this cross, finely marked kittens of a brilliant color may be expected. But if the progeny are not so bright as required, and the ground color not glowing enough, then, when the young arrive at maturity, mate with a dark yellow red tabby, either male or female. Very beautiful brown tabbies are also to be found among the litters of the female tortoiseshell, allied with a dark brown tabby with narrow black bars. It is a cross that may be tried with advantage for both variety and richness of color, among which it will not be found difficult to find something worthy of notice. White 
of english or short-haired cats the best white are those from a tortoise-shell mother and as often some of the best blacks these whites are generally of soft yellow or sandy tint of white although they have pink noses as also are the cushions of their feet they are not albinos not having the peculiar pink or red eyes nor are they deficient in sight i have seen and examined with much care some hundreds of white cats but have never yet seen one with pink eyes though it has been asserted that such exist and there is no reason why they should not still i am inclined to think they do not and the pale blue eyes or the red tinted blue like those of the siamese take the place of it in the feline race neither have i ever seen a white horse with pink eyes but i find it mentioned in one of the daily papers that among other presents to the emperor of russia the bokhara embassy took with them ten thoroughbred saddle horses of different breeds one of them being a magnificent animal a pure white stallion with blue eyes the cold gray white is the opposite of the black and this knowledge should not be lost of in mating it generally has yellow or light orange eyes this color in a male may be crossed with the yellow white with advantage when more strength of constitution is required but otherwise i deem the best matching is that of two yellow white both with blue eyes for soft hair elegance and beauty but even a black male and a white female produce whites and sometimes blacks but the former are generally of a coarse description and harsh in coat by comparison i think the blue-eyed white are a distinct breed from the common ordinary white cat nor do i remember any such being bred from those with eyes of a yellow color abyssinian to breed these true it is well to procure imported or pedigree stock for many cats are bred in england from ordinary tabbies that so nearly resemble abyssinian in color as scarcely to be distinguished from the much prized foreigners the males are generally of a darker color than the females and are mostly marked with dark brown bands on the forehead a black band along the back which ends at the tip of the tail with which it is annulated the ticking should be of the truest kind each hair being of three distinct colors blue yellow or red and black at the points the cushions of the feet and back of the hind legs choose a female with either more red or yellow the markings being the same and with care in the selection there will be some very brilliant specimens eyes bright orange yellow abyssinian crosses curiously colored as the abyssinian cat is and being a true breed no doubt of long far back ancestry 
it is most useful in crossing with other varieties even with the persian russian angora or the archangel the ticking hues being easy of transmission and is then capable of charming and delightful tints with breaths of beautiful mottled or grizzled coloring if judiciously mated the light tabby persian matched with a female abyssinian would give unexpected surprises so with the dark blue archangel a well-ticked blue would not only be a novelty but an elegant color hitherto unseen a deep red tabby might result in a whole color bright red or a yellow tint i have seen a cat nearly black ticked with white which had yellow eyes it was truly a splendid and very beautiful animal of a most recherche color matched with a silver-gray tabby a silver-gray tick is generally the sequence a yellow-white will possibly prove excellent try it white and black for white and black choose evenly marked animals in which white predominates i have seen three differently bred cats white with black ears and tails all else being white and been informed of others i failed to notice the color of the eyes which came under my own observation for which i am sorry for much depends on the color of the eyes in selection for though the parents are white and black many gray and white tabby and white even yellow and white will appear among the kittens gray being the original color and black the sport black and white a deep brown dense black ground with a blaze up the face white nose and lips should be chosen white chest and white feet get a female as nearly as possible so marked and being a dense blue black both with orange eyes when satisfactorily marked and sable and white kittens may be expected blue tabby a slate color or a blue male cat mated with a strongly black marked though narrow banded blue or gray tabby is the best for dark blue tabbies or a light gray evenly marked female may be used what a lovely thing a white cat marked with black stripes would be it may be got spotted tabby for spotted tabby the best brown are those got by mating a spotted red tabby the darker the better and a brown and black spotted female these should be carefully selected not only for their ground color but also for the roundness distinctness blackness and arrangements of their spots for grays blues and light ash-colored tabbies the same care should be exercised the only difference being the choice of ground colors fancy colors by other odd and fanciful combinations many beautiful models and stripes may be secured and strange quaint harmonious arrangements of lines and spots 
produced according to fancy's dictates, but the foregoing are the chief colors in a request for exhibition purposes, and most of the color marking. In any other color classes, the beauties, whatever they may be, are chiefly the result of accident or sports, selected for such beauty, or in other ways equally interesting. End of section 18. Recording by John Thomas Kuz Kuzmarski. www.validateyourlife.com Section 19 of Our Cats and All About Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir. Cat and Kittens. Care and attention is necessary when the cat is likely to become a mother. A basket or box, half filled with sweet hay or clean oat straw, with some flannel in the winter, is absolutely requisite, and a quiet nook or corner selected away from light, noise, and intrusion. Some prefer a box made like a rabbit hutch, with sleeping place, and a barred door to one or both compartments, which may be closed when thought necessary for comfort and quiet. The cat should be placed within, with food and new milk by or inside, and there be regularly fed for a few days, all pans and plates to be kept well washed, and only as much food given at a time as can be eaten at one meal, so that everything is clean and fresh. Cats, as I have before stated, delight in cleanliness, therefore this, nor any comfort, should not be forgotten or omitted, for so much depends on her health and the growth of her little family, with regard to their future well-being." The cat brings forth three times a year, and often more. The time of gestation is to sixty-three days, and the number of kittens varies much. Some will have five to six at birth, while others never have more than two or three. I had a blue tabby, the old lady, which never had more than one. The cat, however, is a very prolific animal, and, if of long life, produces a very numerous progeny. The Derby Gazette, December 10, 1886, states, quote, There is a cat at Cromford, the age of which is nineteen years. It belonged to the late Mr. Isaac Orme, who died a few months ago. The old man made an entry of all the kittens the cat had given birth to, which, up to the time of his death, numbered 120. It has now just given birth to one more. It will not leave the house where the old man died, except to visit a neighboring house where there is a harmonium, and when the instrument is being played, the cat will go and stand on its hind legs beside the player. End quote. Cats live to various ages, the oldest I have seen being twenty-one years, and the foregoing is the greatest age at which I have known one to breed. But I am indebted to Mrs. Patterson of Tunbridge Wells, for the information that Mr. Sandal had a cat that lived to the extraordinary age of twenty-four years. I have seen Mr. Sandal, and found that such was the case. It was a short-haired cat, and rather above the usual size, and tabby in color. When littered, the kittens are weak, blind, deaf, helpless little things, and it appears almost impossible they can ever attain the supple grace and elegance of form and motion so much admired in the fully developed cat. The state of visual darkness continues until the eighth or ninth day, during which the eyesight is gradually developing. After this they grow rapidly, and at the age of a few weeks the gambling, frolicsome life of kittenhood begins, and they begin to feed, lap milk, if slightly warm, when placed in front of them. No animal is more fond and attentive than the cat. She is the most tender and gentle of nurses, watching closely every movement of her young. With the utmost solicitude, she brings the choicest morsels of her own food, which she lays before them, softly purring, 
while with gentle and motherly ways she attracts them to the spot while she sits or stands, looking on with evident satisfaction, full of almost uncontrollable pleasure and delight, at their eager but often futile attempts and endeavours to eat and enjoy the dainty morsel. Yet nothing is wasted, for after waiting what appears to her a reasonable time, and giving them every encouragement, and with the most exemplary patience, she teaches them what they should do, and how, by slowly making a meal of the residue herself, frequently stopping and fondling and licking them, in the hope that they will yet make another effort. What can be more sensitively touching than the following anecdote sent to the animal world by C. E. N. in 1876? It is a little poem of everyday life, full of deep feeling and feline love. Quote, I have a small tabby cat, very comely and graceful. Being very fond of her kitten, she is always uneasy if she loses sight of it, if only for a short time. For the last six weeks, the mother, failing to recall the truant back by her voice, even returns to the kitchen for the lower portion of a rabbit's foreleg, which has served as a plaything for some time. With this in her mouth, she proceeds to search for her lost one, crying all the time, and, putting it down at her feet, repeats her entreaties, to which the kitten, allured by the sight of its plaything, generally responds. Owing to its gambols in the open air during the inclement weather, the kitten was seized with an affliction of the throat. The mother, puzzled with the prostration of its offspring, brought down the rabbit's foot to attract attention. In vain, the kitten died. Even now the loving mother searches for the rabbit's foot and brings it down. End quote. An instance of the peculiar foresight and instinct, so often observable in the cat, is related in The Animal World, October, 1882. Miss M. writes, quote, This house is very old, and big impudent rats often appear in the shop, so a cat is always kept on the premises. Pussy is about five years old, and is a handsome, light tortoise shell, with a pretty face and coaxing ways. A month ago she had three kittens, one of which was kept. They were born in the drawing-room by the side of the piano. When the two were taken away, Pussy carried the one remaining to the fireplace and made it a bed under the grate with shavings. When a fortnight old, both were removed downstairs to the room behind the shop. One day last week an enormous rat appeared. Pussy spied him and set up her back, but her motherly instinct prevailed. She looked round the shop, and, finding a drawer high up, a little way open, she jumped with her kitten in her mouth and dropped it into the drawer, after which she descended and fought a battle royal with the rat, which she soon dispatched and carried to her mistress, then went back to the drawer and brought out her kitten. End quote. Here is another fact as regards the observation of cats, which possibly, in this respect, is not far different from some other domestic animals. Quote, a grey and white cat, Jenny, a house cat, had three kittens in the hollow stump of an old ash tree some distance from the house. There, from time to time, she took them food and there nursed them. One day, looking from the window, I observed a very heavy storm was approaching, and also what should I see but Mistress Jenny running across the meadow as fast as she could, and, on her drawing nearer, I noticed that she had one of her kittens in her mouth. She ran past and put the kitten into a small outhouse, then she immediately hastened back and returned bringing another of her kittens, which she put in the same place. Again she started for the wood, and shortly reappeared bringing her third and last kitten, though more slowly, seemingly very tired. I was just thinking of going to help her, when she suddenly quickened her pace and ran for the outhouse. Just then a few drops of rain began to fall. In a few moments a deluge of water was falling, and lightning was flashing, the thunder crashed overhead and rumbled in the distance, but Jenny did not mind, for she had her three kittens comfortably housed, and she and they were all nestled together in an apple basket, warm and dry. Surely she must have known, by instinct or observation, that the storm was coming. From my book of Animal Stories Old and New 
should it be deemed necessary to destroy some, if not all of the litter, which unfortunately is sometimes the case, it is not well to take away the whole at once, but it is advisable to let a day or two intervene between each removal. The mother will thus be relieved of much suffering, especially if one at least is left for her to rear, but two is preferable. Still, when the progeny are well marked or otherwise valuable, and large specimens are required for show or other purposes, three kittens are enough to leave, though some advocate as many as five. But if this is done, it is better to provide a foster mother or two, for which even a dog will often prove a very good substitute for one of the feline race. In either case, slightly warm new milk should be given at least three times a day. The milk should not be heated, but some hot water put into it, and as soon as their teeth are sufficiently grown for them to be of use in mastication, give some raw beef cut very small and fine. Some prefer chopped liver, I do not, but never give more than they can lap or eat at each meal. This liberal treatment will make a wonderful difference in their growth, and also their general health and strength and being so fed makes them more docile. And it should be borne in mind that in a state of nature cats always bring raw food to their young as soon as they are able to eat. Therefore raw meat is far the best to give them. Their dentition proves this. End of Cat and Kittens Recording by Tricia G. Section 20 of Our Cats and All About Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Thomas Coos Kosmorski. Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir. Section 20. Kittens and of kittens in general and management of kittens and cats kittens kittenhood the baby time especially of country cats is with most the brightest sprightliest and prettiest period of their existence and perhaps the most happy true when first born and in the earliest era of their lives they are blind helpless little things dull weak and staggering scarcely able to stand if at all almost rolling over at every attempt making querulous fretful noises if wakeful or cold or for the time motherless but tis not for long a while and she the fondest of mothers is with them they are nestled about her or amid her soft warm fluffy fur cosseted with parental tenderness caressed nurtured and with low sweet tones and fondlings they are soothed again and again to sleep they sleep noiseless and with many a longing lingering look the careful watchful loving creature slowly and reluctantly steals away soon to return when she and her little ones are lost in the land of dreams and so from day to day until bright meek-eyed innocent inquiring little faces with eager eyes peep above the basket that is yet their home one bolder than the others springs out when scared at its own audacity as quickly and oft clumsily scrambles back then out in and out in happy varied wild frolicsome gambolsome play they clutch twist turn and wrestle in artless mimicry of desperate quarrelling the struggle over in liveliest antics they chase and rechase in turn or in fantastic mood play tis but play and such wondrous play bright joyous and light and so life glides on with them as kittens frisky skittish playful kittens 
A few more days, and their mother leads them forth, with many an anxious look and turn, softly calling in a subdued voice, they halting almost at every step, suddenly, oft at nothing, panic-stricken, quickly scamper back, not one yet daring to follow where all is so oddly strange and new, their natural shyness being stronger than the love of freedom. Again, with scared look and timid steps, they come, when again at nothing frightened, or with infantile pretense, they are off, helter-skelter, without a pause or stay, one and all, they o'er and into their basket clamor, tumble in, turn about, and stare with a more than half-bewildered, self-satisfied safety look about them. Gaining courage once more, they peer about with dreamy, startled, anxious eyes, watching for dangers that never are, although expected. Noiseless comes their patient, loving mother. With what new delight they cling about her, how fondly and tenderly she tends them, lures, cossets, coaxes, and talks, as only a gentle mother cat can. There is no danger, no, nothing to fear. Is she not with them? Will she not guard, keep, and defend them? There is a paradise out there. Through this door they must see it. Come, she will show them. Come have confidence. Now then, come. When followed by her three little ones, and they with much misgiving, she passes out, out into the garden out among the lovely, blooming, fragrant roses, out among the sweet stocks and the damask-colored gilly flowers, the pink daisies, brown, red, and orange flowers, the spice-scented pinks, and other gay and modest floral beauties that have so sweet the soft and balmy breath of spring out into the sunshine, almost dazed amid a flood of light, warmed by the glowing midday sun, light above, light around, and everywhere about, while the sweet-scented breezes come joy-laden with the happy wild birds' melodious songs. Wearied with wonderment under the flower-crowned lilacs, they gather themselves to rest. How beautiful all is, how full of young delights. The odorous wind fans, soothes, and lulls them to rest, while rustling leaves softly whisper them to sleep. They and their loving mother slumber unconscious of all things, and with all things at peace. There, stretched in the warm sunshine asleep, possibly dreaming of their afterlife when they are kittens no longer, they rest and sleep. Their young bright life has begun. How charming all is! How peaceful under the young green leaves, bright as emeralds, about them flickering, checkering lights play with the never-wearying restless shadows. They know of nothing but bliss, so happy they enjoy all, sweet-faced, gentle-eyed, and pretty. Happy, there is no other word. Happy as a kitten, sprightly as a kitten. As they sleep, they dream of delight. Awake, they more than realize their dreams. Of Kittens in General Kittens usually shed their first teeth from five to seven months old, and seldom possess even part of a set of the small, sharp dentition after that time. When shown as kittens under six months old, and they have changed the whole of their kittenhood teeth for those of the adult, it is generally considered a fairly strong proof 
that their life is in excess of that age, and the judge is therefore certainly justified in disqualifying such exhibit, though sometimes, as in other domestic animals, there occurs premature change, as well as inexplicable delay. Kittens are not so cleanly in their habits as cats of a mature growth. This is more generally the case when they have been separated from the mother cat or when removed to some place that is strange to them or when sufficient care is not taken by letting them out of the house occasionally. When they cannot from various reasons, be so turned out, a box should be provided partly filled with dry earth to which they may retire. This is always a requisite when cats or kittens are valuable, and therefore obliged to be kept within doors, especially in neighborhoods where there is a chance of their being lost or stolen. It should also be borne in mind that the present and future health of an animal, be it what it may, is subject to many instances, and not the least of these is good and appropriate food, shelter, warmth, and cleanliness. It is best to feed at regular intervals. In confinement, Mr. Bartlett, the skillful and experienced manager of the Zoological Society's gardens at Regent's Park finds the one meal a day is sufficient, and this is thought also to be the case with a full-grown cat, more especially when it has the opportunity of ranging and getting other food, such as mice and such small deer. But with young things it is different, as it is deemed necessary to get as much strength and growth as possible. I therefore advocate several meals a day, at least three, with a variety of food, such as raw shin of beef cut very small, bones to pick, fish of sorts with all the bones taken out, or refuse parts, milk with a little hot water, boiled rice or oatmeal with milk or without it, and grass if possible if not some boiled vegetable stalks of asparagus cabbage or even carrots let the food be varied from time to time but never omitting the finely cut raw beef every day i am not in favor of liver or lights as it is called either for cats or kittens if horse flesh can be depended on it is a very favorite or strengthening food, and may be given. The kitten should be kept warm and dry, and away from draughts. Also, take a special care not in any way to frighten, tease, or worry a young animal, but to do everything possible to give confidence and engender regard, fondness, or affection for its owner. Always be gentle, and yet firm in its training. Do not allow it to do one day uncorrected, that for which it is punished the next, for the same kind of fault. If it is doing wrong, remove it, speak gently, at the time, and not wait long after the fault is committed, or they will not know what the punishment is for. Many animals' tempers are spoiled entirely by this mode of proceeding. Take care, there is always a clean vessel with pure, clear water for them to drink when thirsty. Management of Kittens and Cats These require quiet and kindly treatment. Do nothing quickly or suddenly, so as in any way to scare or frighten. But when speaking to them, let the voice be moderated, gentle, and soft in tone. Cats are not slow to understand kind treatment, and may often be seen to watch the countenance as though trying to fathom our thoughts. Some cats are of a very timorous nature, 
and are thus easily dismayed. Others, again, are more bold in their ways and habits, and are ever ready for cossity attention. But treat both as you would be treated, kindly. As to food, as already noted, I have found raw beef the best, with milk mixed with a little hot water to drink. Never boil it, and give plenty of grass or some boiled vegetable such as asparagus, sea kale, or celery. They also are fond of certain weeds such as cat mint and equisetum, or mares or cat's tails, as it is sometimes called. If fish is given, it is best mixed with either rice or oatmeal, and boiled, otherwise it is apt to produce diarrhea. Horse flesh may be given as a change, provided that it is not from a diseased animal, and should be boiled and be fresh. Brown bread and milk is also good and healthy food. The bread should be cut in cubes of half an inch, the warm milk and water poured on. Only enough for one meal should be prepared at a time. Let the cat and kittens have as much fresh air as is possible, and if fed on some daintily last thing at night, they will be sure to come in, and thus preserved from doing and receiving injury. If cats are in any way soiled in their coat, especially the long-haired varieties, and cannot cleanse themselves, they may be washed in warm, soapy water, but this is not advisable in kittens, unless great care is used to prevent their taking cold. Some cats like being brushed, and it is often an improvement to the pelage or fur if carefully done. But in all cases, the brush should have soft, close hair, which should be rather long than otherwise. Do not let your cats or kittens wear collars or ribbons always, especially if they are ramblers, for the reason that they are liable to get caught on spikes of railings or twigs of bushes, and so starved to death or strangled unless discovered. For sending cats to an exhibition, a close-made basket is best, which will allow for ventilation, as fresh air is mostly essential and have it sufficiently large to allow of the cat standing and turning about, especially if a long journey is before them. I have seen cats sent to shows taken out of small boxes, dead, stifled to death, poor things. Bear in mind that the higher and better conditions your cat is in on its arrival at the show the greater is the chance of winning. Do not put carpet or woolen fabrics in the basket, but plenty of good sweet hay or oat straw. This will answer all purposes, and does not get sodden. If you use a padlock for the fastening, do not forget to send the key to the manager of the show, as is sometimes the case. End of section 20. Recording by John Thomas Coos, www.validateyourlife.com. Section 21 of Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you today by Don Larson in Minnesota. Section 21. Points by which cats are judged, as specified by myself, revised and corrected to the present time. What you do still betters what is done. Winter's Tale, Act 4. The Tortoise Shell. Points Head, 15. Small, broad across and between the eyes, rounded above, below tapering towards the lips. Nose, rather long than short, 
ears of medium size, narrow and rounded at the apex, broad at the base. Eyes, ten, orange-yellow, clear, brilliant, large, full, round, and lustrous. Fur, ten, short, of even length, smooth, silky, and glossy. Color, twenty-five, a mixture of three colors, black, red, and yellow, each to be distinct and clear of the other, with sharp edges, not one color running into the other, but in small irregular patches of great brilliancy of tint, the red and yellow to preponderate over the black. If the colors are deep and rich, and the variegation harmonious, the effect is very fine. White is a disqualification. Form, 15. Narrow, long, graceful in line, neck rather long and slender, shoulders receding, well sloped and deep, legs medium length, not thick or clumsy, feet round and small. Tail, ten, long, thick at the base and narrowing towards the end, carried low with graceful curve, and well marked with alternating patches of black, red, and yellow. Size and condition, fifteen. Large, lithe, elegant in all its movements, hair smooth, clean, bright, full of luster, and lying close to the body, all betokening full health and strength. Total, one hundred. Tortoise shell and white, points head, ten. Small, broad across and between the eyes, rounded above, below tapering towards the lips, nose rather long than short, ears medium size, narrow and rounded at the apex, broad at the base. Eyes, ten, orange-yellow, clear, brilliant, large, full round, and lustrous. Fur, ten, short, of even length, smooth, silk, and glossy. Color, twenty-five, a mixture of three, black, red, and yellow, each to be distinct and clear of the other, with sharp edges, not one color running into the other, but in small, irregular patches of great brilliancy of tint, the red and yellow to preponderate over the black. If the colors are deep and rich and the variegation harmonious, the effect is very fine. White Marking, 15. The forelegs, breast, and throat, lips, and a circle around them, with a blaze up the forehead, white. Lower half of the hind legs, white, nose and cushions of the feet, white. Form, ten. Narrow, long, graceful in line, neck rather long and slender, shoulders receding, well sloped and deep. Legs, medium length, not thick nor clumsy, feet round and small. Tail, ten, long, thick at the base and narrowing towards the end, carried low, with graceful curve, and well marked with alternating patches of black, red, and yellow. Size and condition, ten, large, lithe, elegant in all its movements, hair smooth, clean, bright, full of luster, and lying close to the body, all betokening full health and strength, total, one hundred. White short hair, points head, fifteen. Small broad across and between the eyes, rounded above, below tapering towards the lips, nose rather long than short, ears of medium size, narrow and rounded at apex, broad at the base. Eyes, fifteen. Blue, a soft turquoise blue, but yellow is permissible as five points only, green a defect. Large, round, and full. Fur, fifteen. Short, of even length, smooth, silky, and glossy. Color, fifteen. Yellow-white, gray-white, five points less. Form, fifteen. Narrow, long, graceful in line. Neck rather long and slender, shoulders receding. Well sloped and deep. Legs, medium length, not thick nor clumsy, feet round and small. 
tail ten. Long, thick at the base, and narrowing towards the end, carried low, with graceful curve. Size and condition, fifteen. Large, lithe, and elegant in all its movements. Hair smooth, clean, bright, full of luster, and lying close to the body, all betokening good health and strength. Total, one hundred. Self-color, black, blue, gray, or red short hair. Points, head, fifteen. Small, broad across and between the eyes, rounded above, below tapering towards the lips, nose rather long than short, ears of medium size, narrow, rounded at apex, broad at the base. Eyes, fifteen. Orange for black, orange-yellow for blue, deep yellow for gray, and gold tinged with green for red, large, round, and full, very bright. Fur, ten. Short of even length, smooth, silky, and glossy. Form, fifteen. Narrow, long, graceful in line, neck rather long and slender, shoulders receding, well sloped and deep. Legs, medium length, not thick nor clumsy, feet round and small. Color, twenty-five. Black, a jet, dense brown-black with purple gloss. Blue, a bright, rich, even, dark color, or lighter but even in tint. Gray, a bright, light, even color. Red, a brilliant, sandy, or yellowish red color. Tail, five. Long, thick at the base, and narrowing towards the end, carried low, with graceful curve. Size and condition, fifteen. Large, lithe, elegant in all its movements. Hair smooth, clean, bright, full of luster, lying close to the body, all betokening good health and strength. Total, one hundred. Brown and ordinary tabby, striped, short hair. Points, head, ten. Small, broad across and between the eyes, rounded above, below tapering towards the lips, nose rather long than short, ears of medium size, narrow and rounded at apex, broad at the base. Eyes, fifteen. Orange-yellow, slightly tinted with green, large, full round, and very lustrous. Fur, ten. Short, of even length, smooth, silky, and glossy. Color, twenty. Deep, very rich reddish-brown, more rufous inside the legs and belly. Ears and nose still deeper, red-brown. The latter at the tip edged with black. Ordinary tabby, dark gray, and ticked. Markings, twenty. Jet-black lines, not too broad, scarcely so wide as the ground color shown between, so as to give a light and brilliant effect. When the black lines are broader than the color space, it is a defect, being then black marked with color, instead of color marked with black. The lines must be clear, sharp, and well-defined, in every way distinct, having no mixture of the ground color. Head and legs marked regularly, the rings on the throat and chest being in no way blurred or broken, but clear, graceful, and continuous. Lips, cushions of feet, and backs of hind legs and ear points, black. Form, ten. Narrow, long, graceful in line, neck rather long and slender, shoulders receding, well sloped and deep, legs medium length, not thick nor clumsy, feet round and small. Tail, five. Long, thick at the base and narrowing towards the end, carried low with graceful curve and marked with black rings. Size and condition, ten. Large, lithe, elegant in all its movements, hair smooth, clean, bright, full of luster, and lying close to the body, all betokening full health and strength. Total, one hundred. Chocolate, chestnut, red, or yellow tabby, striped, short hair. Points, head, ten. Small, 
broad across and between the eyes, rounded above, below tapering toward the lips, nose rather long than short, ears of medium size, narrow and rounded at apex, broad at the base. Eyes 15. Orange, gold, or yellow, in the order of the above names. Large, round, full, and very lustrous. Fur 10. Short and even length, smooth, silky, and glossy. Color 20. Deep, rich, reddish-brown, bright red or yellow, in the order as above. Brighter inside the legs and belly, ears and nose deeper color, the latter, at the tip, red, edged with chocolate. Markings 20. Dark rich brown or chocolate, lines not too broad, scarcely so wide as the ground color shown between, so as to give a light and brilliant effect. When the lines are broader than the color space it is a defect, being then light color markings on dark brown or chocolate, red or dark yellow, instead of color marked with deeper color. Head and legs marked regularly, the rings on the throat and chest being in no way blurred or broken, but clear, graceful, and continuous. Lips, cushions of feet, and the back of hind legs and the ear points, dark. Yellow tabby, the cushions of feet, red or light red. Form, ten. Narrow, long, graceful in line, neck rather long and slender, shoulders receding, well sloped and deep, legs medium length, not thick nor clumsy, feet round and small. Tail, five. Long, thick at the base and narrowing towards the end, carried low with graceful curve, and marked with dark rings. Size and condition, ten. Large, lithe, elegant in all its movements. Hair smooth, clean, bright, full of luster, and lying close to the body, all betokening full health and strength. Total, one hundred. Blue, silver, light gray, and white tabby, striped, short hair. Points, head, ten. Small, broad across and between the eyes, rounded above, below tapering towards the lips, nose rather long than short, ears of medium size, narrow and rounded at the apex, broad at the base. Eyes 15. Orange-yellow for blue tabby, deep, bright yellow for silver or gray, large, full, round and very lustrous. Fur 10. Short, of even length, smooth, silky and glossy. Color, 20. If blue, a rich, deep, yet bright color. Silver, a lighter, yet bright tint. Gray, very light, if a white tabby, ground to be colorless. Ears and nose, a deep gray. The tip, red, edged with black. Markings, 20. Jet black lines, not too broad, scarcely so wide as the ground color shown between, so as to give a light and brilliant effect. When the black lines are broader than the color space, it is a defect, being then black marked with color, instead of color with black. The lines must be clear, sharp, and well-defined in every way distinct, having no mixture of the ground color. Head and legs marked regularly, the rings on the throat and chest being in no way blurred or broken, but clear, graceful and continuous, lips, cushions of feet, and the back of hind legs and the ear points, black. Form, ten, narrow, long, graceful in line, neck rather long and slender, shoulders receding, well sloped and deep, legs medium length, not thick nor clumsy, feet round and small. Tail, five. Long, thick at the base and narrowing towards the end, carried low, with graceful curve, and marked with black rings. Size and condition, ten. Large, lithe, elegant in all its movements. Hair smooth, clean, bright, full of luster, and lying close to the body, all betokening full health and strength. Total, one hundred.
short-haired spotted tabbies of any color. These to be the same in all points of head, eyes, fur, form, colors, tail, size and condition as those laid down for the judging of short-haired tabby cats in general, with the exception, in whatever color the markings are, or on whatever ground, they, instead of being in lines or bands, are to be broken up into clear, well-defined, and well-formed spots, each spot to be separate and distinct and good, firm and dark in color. These, then, count as many points as a finely striped cat in its class. Black and white, gray-white, red and white, and other colors and white. The self-color to count the same number of points as the ground color in tabby, namely twenty points and the white markings, the same as the tabby markings, that is, twenty points, the other points also the same. The markings to be lips, mouth, and part of the cheek, including the whiskers, with a blaze up the nose coming to a point between the eyes. White, throat and chest white, and pear-shaped in outline of color, all four feet white. White and black, white and gray, white and red, white and any other color. The colors and markings to count the same as above. The ground color being white, and markings the dark color instead of white. In the markings they should be even or well balanced, such as two black ears, the rest white, or two black ears with black tail, and the rest white, or all white with dark tail only. These are not very uncommon markings, but if so marked, they may also have a spot or two on the back or sides, provided they balance in size and color but the simplicity of the former is the best. All other fancy colors and markings must be judged according to taste, and entered in the any other varieties of colors for short-haired cats, such as strawberry color, smokies, chinchilla, ticked, black tabbies, and such fine colors. Abyssinian Points, head, ten small, broad across the eyes, rather long than short, nose medium length, all well formed. Eyes, fifteen, orange-yellow, slightly tinged with green, large, round, full and bright. Nose and feet, ten, nose dark red, edged with black, tips and cushions of feet black, also the back of the hind legs. Fur, fifteen, Soft, rather woolly hair, yet soft, silky, lustrous, and glossy. Short, smooth, even, and dense. Ears, ten. The usual size of the ordinary English cat, but a little more rounded, with not much hair in the interior, black at the apex. Color, twenty. A rich, dun brown, ticked with black and orange, or darker on lighter colors, having a dark or black line along the back, extending to the end of the tail, and slightly annulated with black or dark color, as few other marks as possible, inside the forelegs and belly to be orange-brown, no white. Size and condition, ten. Large, glossy coat, and smooth, fitted close to the body, eyes bright and clear. Carriage and appearance, ten. Graceful, lithe, elegant, alert and quick in all its movements, head carried up, tail trailing, in walk, undulating. Total, 100. N.B. The Abyssinian silver-gray or chinchilla is the same as all the points, with the exception of the ground color being silver instead of brown. This is a new and beautiful variety. Royal Cat of Siam Points, head, ten. Small, broad across and between the eyes, tapering upward and somewhat narrow between the ears. Forehead flat and receding. Nose long and somewhat broad. Cheeks narrowing towards the mouth. Lips full and rounded. Ears rather large and wide at the base, with very little hair inside. Fur, ten. Very short and somewhat woolly yet soft and silky to the touch, and glossy, 
with much luster on the face, legs, and tail. Color, 20. The ground or body color to be of an even tint, slightly darker on the back, but not in any way clouded or patched, with any darker color. Light rich dun is the preferable color, but a light fawn, light silver gray, or light orange is allowable. Deeper and richer browns, almost chocolate, are admissible if even and not clouded, but the first is the true type, the last merely a variety of much beauty and excellence, but the dun and light tints take precedence. Markings 20. Ears black, the color not extending beyond them, but ending in a clear and well-defined outline. Around the eyes and all the lower part of the head black, legs and tail black, the color not extending into or staining the body, but having a clear line of demarcation. Eyes 15. Rather of almond shape slanting towards the nose, full and very beautiful blue opalesque color, luminous and of a reddish tint in the dusk of evening or by artificial light. Tail 5. Short by comparison with the English cat, thin throughout, a little thicker towards the base, without any break or kink. Size and form 10. Rather small, lithe, elegant in outline, and graceful, narrow and somewhat long, Legs thin and a little short than otherwise. Feet long, not so round as the ordinary cat. Neck long and small. Condition 10. In full health, not too fat. Hair smooth, clear, bright, full of luster. Lying close to the body, which should be hard and firm in the muscles. Total, 100. Manx or short-tailed cat. Points, head, 10. Small, round, but tapering toward the lips, rather broad across the eyes. Nose medium length, ears rather small, broad at base and sloping upwards to a point. Eyes 10. According to color as shown in other varieties. Fur 10. Short of even length, smooth, silky and glossy. Color 15. To range the same as other short-haired cats, if self same as self, if marked same as the marked varieties, with less points, allowing for the tail points in this variety. Form 15. Narrow, long, neck long and thin, all to be graceful in line, shoulders narrow, well sloped, fore legs medium length and thin, hind legs long in proportion and stouter built, feet round and small. Tail, 25. To have no tail whatever, not even a stump, but some true bred will have a very short, thin, twisted tail that cannot be straightened. This allowable and is true bred, but thick stumps, knobs, or short, thick tails disqualify. Size and condition, 15. Large, elegant in all its movements, hair smooth, clean, bright, full of luster, and lying close to the body, all betokening good health and strength. Total, 100. White, long-haired cat. Points, head, 10. Round and broad across and between the eyes, of medium size. Nose, rather short, pink at the tip. Ears, ordinary size, but looking small. Being surrounded with long hair, which should also be long on the forehead and lips. Eyes 15. Large, full, round or almond-shaped, lustrous and of a beautiful azure blue, yellow admissible as five points only, green a defect. Ruff or frill 15. Large, very long, flowing and lion-like, extending over the shoulders and covering the neck and chest thickly. Fur, 15. Very long everywhere, mostly along the back, sides, legs, and feet, making tufts between the toes and points at the apex of the ears. Quality of fur, 10. Fine, silky, and very soft in the Persian, with a slightly woolly texture in the Angora, and still more so in the Russian. Tail, 10. 
In the Persian, the hair long and silky throughout, but somewhat longer at the base. Angora, more like the brush of a fox, but much longer in the hair. Russian, equally long in hair, but full tail, shorter and more blunt, like a tassel. Size, shape, and condition, 15. Large, small in bone, looking larger than it really is on account of the length of hair. Body long, legs short, tail carried low, not over the back, which is a fault. Fur clean, bright and glossy, even and smooth, and flaky, which gives an appearance of quality. Color ten, white with a tender, very slight yellow tint, cushions of feet and tip of nose pink. Total one hundred. Black, blue, gray, red, or any shelf-colored long-haired cats. Points head ten. Round and broad across and between the eyes of medium size. Nose rather short and dark at tip, excepting in the red when it should be pink. Ears ordinary size but looking small, being rounded with long hair, which should also be long on the forehead and lips. Eyes ten. For black, orange. Orange yellow for blue. Deep yellow for gray. And gold tinged with green for red large, round, or almond-shaped, full and very bright. Rough or frill, fifteen. Large, very long, flowing and lion-like, extending over the shoulders and covering the neck and chest thickly. Fur, fifteen. Very long everywhere, mostly so along the back, sides, legs, and feet, making tufts between the toes and points at the apex of the ears. Quality of fur, ten. Fine, silky, and very soft in the Persian, with slightly woolly texture in the Angora, and still more so in the Russian. Tail, ten. In the Persian, the hair long and silky throughout, but somewhat longer at the base. Angora, like the brush of a fox, but longer in the hair. Russian, equally long in hair, but more full at the end. Tail shorter, rather blunt, like a tassel. Size, shape, and condition, ten. Large, small in bone, looking larger than it really is on account of the length of the hair. Body long, legs short, tail carried low, not over the back, which is a fault. Fur clean and glossy, even, smooth, and flaky, which gives it an appearance of quality. Color, twenty. Black, dense bright brown black with purple gloss. Blue, a bright, rich, even, dark color, or lighter, but even in tint. Gray, a bright, light, even color. Red, a brilliant, sandy, or yellowish red color. Total, 100. Brown, blue, silver, light gray and white tabby, long-haired cats. Points, head, 10. Round and broad across and between the eyes, of medium size. Nose rather short, ears ordinary size but looking small, being surrounded with long hair, which should also be long on the forehead and lips. Eyes 10. Orange yellow for brown and blue tabby, very slightly tinted with green. Deep bright yellow for silver. Gray and golden yellow for white tabby. Large, full, round, or almond-shaped, and very lustrous. Rough or frill, ten. Large, very long, flowing and lion-like, extending over the shoulders and covering the neck and chest thickly. Fur, ten. Very long everywhere, mostly so along the back, sides, legs, and feet, making tufts between the toes and points at the apex of the ears. Quality of fur, ten. Fine, silky, and very soft in the Persian, with slightly woolly texture in the Angora, and still more so in the Russian. Tail, ten. In the Persian, the hair long and silky throughout, but somewhat longer at the base. Angora, like the brush of a fox, but longer in the hair. Russian, equally long in the hair, but more full at the end. Tail shorter, rather blunt, like a tassel. Size, 
shape, and condition, ten. Larger, small in bone, looking larger than it really is on account of the length of the hair. Body long, legs short. Tail carried low, not over the back, which is a fault. Fur clean and glossy, even, smooth, and flaky, which gives it an appearance of quality. Color, fifteen. Ground color, deep, rich, reddish-brown, more rufous on the ears, nose, and mane, and inside the legs and belly. Tip of the nose, red, edged with black. Blue, bright deep, rich, even, dark color. Silver, lighter, and equally even tint, and so light gray, and white ground, pure white. Markings, 15. Jet black lines, not too broad, scarcely so wide as the color seen between, so as to give a light and brilliant effect. When the black lines are broader than the color space, it is a defect, being then black marked with color, instead of color marked with black. The lines must be clear, sharp, and well-defined in every way distinct, having no mixture of the ground color. Head, legs, and tail, regularly marked, the latter with rings, the lines on the throat and chest being in no way blurred or broken, but clear, graceful, and continuous. Lips, cushions of feet, the backs of the hind legs, and the ear points, black. Total, one hundred. In chocolate, mahogany, red, or yellow long-haired tabbies, the markings and colors to be the same as in the short-haired cats, but in points to count the same as the last in all qualities. Spotted tabbies to count the same in all points, the only difference being that instead of stripes the cats are marked with clear, well-defined spots. All fancy colors to be shown in the any other variety of color class and judged according to the quality of coat, beauty, and rarity of coloring or marking. The small, thin, broken-banded tabby should go in this class, as also those with thin, light, wavy lines. All foreign, wild, or other cats of peculiar form to go into the class for any other variety or species. End of section 21「others yielding to known curatives. Many are of a very exhaustive character. Some are epidemic. Others are undoubtedly contagious. The two worst of these are what is known as the distemper and the mange. Through the kindness of friends, I am enabled to give recipes for medicines considered as useful or, at any rate, tending to abate the severity of the attack in the one and utterly eradicate the other. Care should always be taken on the first symptoms of illness, to remove the animal at once from contact with others. My kind friend, Dr. George Fleming, C.B., Principal Veterinary Surgeon of the Army, has courteously sent me a copy of a remedy for a cat distemper from his very excellent work, Animal Plagues, Their History, Nature, and Prevention, which I give in full. Catarrhal Fevers Cats are, like some other of the domesticated animals, liable to be attacked by two kinds of catarrhal fever, one of which is undoubtedly very infectious, like distemper in dogs, and the other may be looked upon as a result of a simple cold, and therefore not transmissible. The first is, of course, the most severe and fatal, and often prevails most extensively, affecting cats generally over wide areas, sometimes entire continents being invaded by it. From A.D. 1414 up to 1832, no fewer than nineteen widespread outbreaks of this kind have been recorded. The most notable of these was in 1796, when the cats in England and Holland were generally attacked by the disease, and in the following year when it had spread over Europe and extended to America. In 1803, it again appeared in this country, and over a large part of the European continent. 
The symptoms are intense fever, prostration, vomiting, diarrhea, sneezing, cough, and profuse discharge from the nose and eyes. Sometimes the parotid glands are swollen, as in human mumps. Dr. Darwin of Derby, uncle to Charles Darwin, thought it was a kind of mumps, and therefore designated it parotitis felina. The treatment consists in careful nursing and cleanliness, keeping the animal moderately warm and comfortable. The disease rapidly produces intense debility, and therefore the strength should be maintained from the very commencement by frequent small doses of strong beef tea, into which one grain of quinine has been introduced twice a day, a small quantity of port wine, from half to one teaspoonful, according to the size of the cat, and the state of debility. If there is no diarrhea, but constipation, a small dose of castor oil or syrup of buckthorn should be given. Solid food should not be allowed until convalescence has set in. Isolation, with regard to other cats, and disinfection, should be attended to. Simple catarrh demands similar treatment. Warmth, cleanliness, broth, and beef tea are the chief items of treatment, with a dose of castor oil if constipation is present. If the discharge obstructs the nostrils, it should be removed with a sponge, and these in the eyes may be bathed with a weak lotion of vinegar and water. As regards inoculation for distemper, Dr. Fleming says, it has been tried, but the remedy is often worse than the disease, at least as bad as a natural disease. Vaccination has also been tried, but it is valueless. Probably inoculation with cultivated or modified virus will be found a good and safe preventative. I was anxious to know about this, as inoculation used to be the practice with packs of hounds. It will be observed that Dr. Fleming treats the distemper as a kind of influenza, and considers one of the most important things is to keep up the strength of the suffering animal. Other members of the RCVS, whom I have consulted, have all given the same kind of advice, not only prescribing for the sick animal wine, but brandy, as a last resource, to arouse sinking vitality. Mr. George Cheverton, of High Street, Tunbridge Wells, who is very successful with animals and their diseases, thinks it best to treat them homeopathically. The following is what he prescribes as efficacious for some of the most dire complaints with which cats are apt to be afflicted. Worms for a full-grown cat, give three grains of santonine every night for a week or ten days. It might be administered in milk, or given in a small piece of beef or meat of any kind. After the course, give an Aperian powder. Mange The best possible remedies for this disease are arsenicum, 2x trituration, and sulfur, 2x trituration, given on alternate days, as much as will lie on a three-penny piece, night and morning, administered as above. A most useful lotion is acid sulfurous, one ounce to five ounces of water, adding about a teaspoonful of glycerin, and sponging the affected parts twice or thrice daily. Colds. The symptoms are twofold. Usually there is constant sneezing and discharge from the nose. Aconite, one X tincture, one drop given every three hours in alternation with arsenicum, three X trituration, will speedily remove the disease. Should there be stuffing of the nose, and difficult breathing, give mercurius biniod, 3x trituration, a dose every three or four hours. Coughs. The short, hard, dry cough will always give way to treatment with belladonna, 3x trituration, three grains every three or four hours. For the difficult breathing, with rattling in the chest and bronchial tubes, with distressing cough, antimonium tartaric, 2x, grains each every two, three, or four hours, according to the severity of the symptoms. Distemper. Early symptoms should be noted and receive prompt attention. This will often cut short the duration of the malady. The first indications usually are a disinclination to rest in the usual place, seeking a dark corner beneath a sofa, etc. The eyes flow freely, the nose after becoming hard and dry becomes stopped with fluid, the tongue parched, and total aversion to food follows. The breathing becomes short and labored, the discharges are offensive, and the animal creeps away into some quiet corner to die, if before this its life has not been mercifully ended. On discovery of first symptoms, give two drops aconite and arsenicum in alternation every three hours. When the nose becomes dry and the eye restless and glaring, give belladonna. Canker of ear. When internal, drop into the affected ear night and morning three or five drops of the following mixture. Tincture of Hydrastis canadensis, two drachms. Carbolic acid, pure, one half inch. Glycerin, to make up to two ounces. 
If external, paint with a mixture the affected parts. A purient. Get a chemist to rub down a medium-sized croton bean with about 40 grains of sugar of milk and divide into four powders. One of these powders given in milk usually suffices. Large cats often require two powders. The dose might be repeated if necessary. Dose when drops are ordered, two drops. Dose trituration is ordered two to three grains. Remedies and strengthening medicines. Aconite, one X tincture. Arsenicum, two X trituration. Antimonium tartaricum, two X trituration. Belladonna, three X trituration. Mercurius biniodatus, three X trituration. Hydrastis canadensis, Greek, phi, tincture. Sulfur, 2x trituration. Santonine. Mr. Frank Upjohn of Castlenau Barnes has also kindly forwarded me his treatment of some few of the cat ailments, mindful of the old proverb that, in a multitude of counselors there is wisdom, I place all before my friends, and those of the cat, that they may select which remedy they deem best. Distemper. Take yellow basilicon, one ounce, flowers of sulphur, one half ounce, oil of juniper, three drachms. Mix for ointment. Then give sulphide of mercury, three grains, two or three times on alternate nights. Purgative. Nothing like castor oil for purgation. Half the quantity of syrup of buckthorn, if necessary, may be added. Worms. Two or three grains of santonine in a teaspoonful of castor oil, for two or three days. Catar. Cold in the eyes and sneezing may be relieved by sweet spirits of nitre, one drachm. Minocrara spirit, three drachms. Antimony wine, one drachm. Water to one half ounce. Mix. Give one teaspoonful every two or three hours. Fleas and irritation of skin. Two drachms pure carbolic acid to six ounces of water, well mixed for a lotion, and apply night and morning. Eye ointment. Red oxide of mercury, 12 grains. Spermaceti ointment, 1 ounce. Mix. The above prescription was given to me many years ago by the late Dr. Walsh Stonehenge, and I have found it of great service, both for my own eyes, also those of animals and birds. Wash the eyes carefully with warm water. Dry off with a soft silk handkerchief, and apply a little of the ointment. Dr. Walsh informed me that he deemed it excellent for canker in the ear, but of that I have had no experience. For mange. In the early stages of mange, flowers of sulfur mixed in Vaseline and rubbed in the coat of the cat is efficacious, giving sulfur in the milk, the water, and on the food of the patient. Also give vegetable diet. Another remedy. Give a teaspoonful of castor oil. Next day give raw meat, dusted over with flowers of sulfur. Also give sulfur in milk. If there are any sore places, bathe with lotion made from camphorated oil in which some sulfur is mixed. Oil, two ounces camphor one quarter ounce sulphur a teaspoonful as a rule when the animal is of value either intrinsically or as a pet the best plan is to consult a practitioner well versed in the veterinary science and art especially when the cat appears to suffer from some obscure disease many of which it is very difficult to detect unless by the trained and practiced eye of all the ailments both of dogs and cats distemper is the worst to combat and is so virulent and contagious that I have thought it well to offer remedies that are at least worthy of a trial, though when the complaint has firm hold, and the attack very severe, the case is generally almost hopeless, especially with high-bred animals. Poison It is not generally known that the much-admired labranum contains a strong poison, and is therefore an exceedingly dangerous plant. All its parts, blossoms, leaves, seeds, even the bark and the roots, are charged with a poison called cysticin which was discovered by Hughesman and Marms in 1864. A small dose of juice infused under the skin is quite sufficient to kill a cat or a dog. Children have died from eating the seeds, of which ten or twelve were sufficient to cause death. The worst of it is that there is no remedy, no antidote against this poison. How many cases have happened before the danger was discovered is of course only a matter of conjecture, as few would suspect the cause to come from the lovely plant that so delights the eye. It has, however, long been known to gamekeepers and others, and used by them to destroy vermin. When quite a boy, I remember an old uncle of mine telling me to beware of it, even in gathering the blossom. End of section 22
Section 23 of Our Cats and All About Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in April 2011. Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir. Section 23 The Wild Cat of Britain. The wild cat is said to be now extinct in England and only found in some of the northern parts of Scotland or the rocky parts of the mountains of the south, where I am informed it may yet occasionally be seen. The drawing I give above was made from one sent to the first Crystal Palace Cat Show in 1871 by the Duke of Sutherland from Sutherlandshire. It was caught in a trap by the foreleg, which was much injured, but not so as to prevent its moving with great alacrity, even with agility, endeavouring frequently to use the claws of both forefeet with a desperate determination and amazing vigour. It was a very powerful animal, possessing great strength, taking size into consideration, and of extraordinary fierceness. Mr. Wilson, the manager of the show, though an excellent naturalist, tried to get it out of the thick-barred, heavy-made travelling box in which it arrived, into one of the ordinary wire show cages, thinking it would appear to better advantage. But in this endeavour he was unsuccessful, the animal resisting all attempts to expel it from the one into the other, making such frantic and determined opposition that the idea was abandoned. This was most fortunate, for the wire cages then in use were afterwards found unequal to confining even the ordinary domestic cat, which, in more than one instance, forced the bars apart sufficiently to allow of escape. As it was, the wild cat maintained its position, sullenly retiring to one corner of the box, where it scowled, growled, and fought in a most fearful and courageous manner during the time of its exhibition, never once relaxing its savage watchfulness for attempts to injure even those who fed it. I never saw anything more unremittingly ferocious, nor apparently more untamable. It was a grand animal, however, and most interesting to the naturalist, being even then scarcely ever seen if so, only in districts far away and remote from the dwellings of civilization. Yet, I believe, I saw one among the rocks of Bodsbeck in Dumfrieshire many years ago, though of this I am not certain, as it was too far away for accurate observation before it turned and stood at bay, and on my advancing it disappeared. The animal shown at the Crystal Palace was very much lighter in colour and with less markings than those in the British Museum, the tail shorter and the dark rings fewer, the lines on the body not much deeper in tint than the ground colour, excepting on the forehead and the inside of the forelegs which were darker, rather a light red round the mouth and almost white on the chest, which appears to be usual with the wild cat. The eyes were yellow-tinted green, the tips of the ears, the lips, cushions of the feet, and a portion of the back part of the hind legs, black. The markings were, in short, irregular, thin lines, and in no way resembled those of the ordinary black-marked domestic tabby cat, possessing little elegance of line. In character, it was bolder, having a rugged sturdiness, being stronger and broader built the forearms thick, massive, and endowed with great power, with long curved claws. The feet were stout, sinewy, and strong. Altogether it was a very peculiar, interesting, and extraordinary animal. What became of it, I never learned. In 1871 and 1872, a wildcat was exhibited at the Crystal Palace Cat Show by the Earl of Hopetoun aged three years, also some hybrid kittens, the father of which was a long-haired cat, the mother a sandy by a wild cat out of a long-haired tabby, which proves, if proof were wanting, that such hybrids breed freely either with hybrids, the domestic, or the wild cat. 
Mr. Frank Buckland also exhibited a hybrid between the wild and tame cat. The Zoological Society, a pair of wild cats which did not appear to be British. In 1873, Mr. A. H. Sanger sent a fine specimen of hybrid between the domestic cat and Scotch wild cat. An early description of the wild cat in England is to be found in an old book on natural history and copied into a work on menageries, Bartholomeus de Proprietatibus Rerum, which was translated into English by Thomas Berthlet and printed by Winkin de Ward as early as 1498. There is a very interesting description of the cat, which gives nearly all the properties of the wild animal in an odd and very amusing way. It states, quote, He is most like to the leopard, and hath a great mouth, and saw teeth, and sharp, and long tongue, and pliant, thin, and subtle, and lepeth therewith when he drinketh, as other beasts do that have the nether lip shorter than the over. For, by cause of unevenness of lips, such beasts suck not in drinking, but lap and lick, as Aristotle saith, and Plinius also. And he is a full lecherous beast in youth, swift, pliant, and merry, and leapeth and riseth on all things that is tofore him, and is led by a straw, and playeth therewith, and is a right heavy beast in age, and fully sleepy, and lieth slyly in wait for mice, and is where, where they be more by smell than by sight, and hunteth and riseth on them in privy places, and when he taketh a mouse, he playeth therewith, and eateth him after the play, and is a cruel beast when he is wild, and dwelleth in woods, and hunteth their small wild beasts as conies and hares. End quote. The next appears in John Boswell's Working of Armory, Folio Anno Domini, fifteen ninety seven. Quote, this beast is called a musen, for he is enemy to mice and rats. He is sly and witty, and seeth so sharply that he overcometh darkness of the night by the shining light of his eyne. In shape of body he is like unto a leopard, and hath a great mouth. He doth delight that he annoyeth his liberty, and in his youth he is swift, pliant, and merry. He maketh a rueful noise and a gasteful when he proffereth to fight with another. He is a cruel beast when he is wild, and falleth on his own feet from most high places, and neth is hurt therewith. When he hath a fair skin, he is, as it were, proud thereof, and then he goeth fast about to be seen. End quote. Those who have seen the wild cat of Britain, especially in confinement, will doubtless be ready to endorse this description as being true to the life, even to the rueful noise, or his industry in the way of fighting. Yet even this old chronicler mentions the fact of his being wild, clearly indicating a similar animal in a state of domestication. Later on, we find Meister Salmon giving an account of the cat in his strangely curious book, Salmon's Complete English Physician, or The Druggist's Shop Opened, Anno Domini 1693, in which he relates that marvellous properties exist in the brain, bones, etc., of the cat, giving recipes mostly cruel and incredible. He describes Catus the Cat in such terms as these. Quote, the cat of the mountain, all which are of one nature, and agree much in one shape, save as to their magnitude, the wild cat being larger than the tame, and the cat of mountain much larger than the wild cat. It has a broad face, almost like a lion, short ears, large whiskers, shining eyes, short, smooth hair, long tail, rough tongue, and armed on its feet, with claws, being a crafty, subtle, watchful creature, very loving and familiar with mankind, the mortal enemy to the rat, mouse, and all sorts of birds, which it seizes on as its prey. 
as to its eyes authors say that they shine in the night and see better at the full and more dimly at the change of the moon as also that the cat doth vary his eyes with the sun the apple of its eye being long at sunrise round towards noon and not to be seen at all at night but the whole eye shining in the night these appearances of the cat's eyes i am sure are true but whether they answer to the times of the day i never observed its flesh is not usually eaten yet in some countries it is accounted an excellent dish End quote. mr blaine in his excellent and useful work the encyclopedia of rural sports a book no sportsman should be without thus discusses the origin of the domestic cat compared with the british wildcat quote, we have yet however to satisfy ourselves with regard to the origin of the true wild cat felis catus which following the analogies of the felinae generally are almost exclusively native to countries warmer than our own it is true that occasionally varieties of the felinae do breed in our caravans and menageries where artificial warmth is kept up to represent something like a tropical temperature but the circumstance is too rare to ground any opinion on of their ever having been indigenous here at least since our part of the globe has cooled down to its present temperature it is therefore more than probable that both the wild and the tame cat have been derived from some other extra-european source or sources we say source or sources for such admission begets another difficulty not easily got over which is this that if both of these grimalkins own one common root in which variety was it that the very marked differences between them have taken place most sportsmen we believe suspect that they own one common origin and some naturalists also do the same contending that the differences observable between them are attributable solely to the long continued action of external agencies which had modified the various organs to meet the varied necessities of the animals the wild cat according to this theory having to contend with powerful enemies expanded in general dimensions its limbs particularly became massive and its long and strong claws with the powerful muscular mechanism which operated on them fitted it for a life of predacity thus its increased size enabled it to stand some time before any other dogs than high-bred foxhounds and even before them also in any place but the direct open ground there exist however in direct contradiction to this opinion certain specialities proper to the wild and certain other to the domestic cat besides the simple expansion of bulk which sufficiently disprove their identity it will be seen that a remarkable difference exists between the tails of the two animals that of the domestic being as is well known long and tapering elegantly to a point whereas that of the wildcat is seen to be broad and to terminate abruptly in a blunt or rounded extremity linnaeus and buffon having both of them confounded these two species into one have contributed much to propagate this error which affords us another opportunity to adding to the many we have taken of remarking on the vast importance of comparative anatomy which enables us to draw just distinctions between animals that might otherwise erroneously be adjudged to be dependent on the external agencies etc nor need we rest here for what doubt can be entertained on the subject when we point at the remarkable difference between the intestines of the two those of the domestic are nine times the length of its body whereas in the wild cat they are little more than three times as long as the body End quote. the food of the wild cat is said to consist of animals and in the opinion of some fish should be added why not also birds eggs cats are particularly fond of the latter in the event of their finding and destroying a nest they invariably eat the eggs and generally the shells much has been written as to the aptitude of the domestic cat in catching fish 
If this be so, are fish necessarily a part of the food of the native wild cat? Numerous instances are adduced of our household cat plunging into water in pursuit of and capture of fish. Although I have spent much time in watching cats that were roaming beside streams and about ponds, there has never been even an attempt at fishing. Frogs they will take and kill, often greedily devouring the small ones. Yet doubtless they will hunt, catch and eat fish, for the fact has become proverbial. A writer in Menageries states, quote, there is no doubt that wild cats will seize on fish, and the passionate longing of the domestic cat after this food is an evidence of the natural desire. We have seen a cat overcome their natural reluctance to wet her feet and take an eel out of a pail of water. End quote. Dr. Darwin alludes to this propensity. Quote, Mr. Leonard, a very intelligent friend of mine, saw a cat catch a trout by darting on it in deep, clear water at the mill, Wexford, near Litchfield. The cat belonged to Mr. Stanley, who had often seen it catch fish. End quote. Cases have also been known of cats catching fish in shallow water, springing on them from the banks of streams and ponds, but I take this as not the habit of the domestic cat, though it is not unusual. Gray, in a poem, tells of a cat's death through drowning while attempting to take goldfish from a vase filled with water. Of Dr. Samuel Johnson, it is related that his cat, having fallen sick and refused all food, he became aware that cats are fond of fish. With this knowledge before him, he went to the fishmongers and bought an oyster for the sick creature, wrapped it in paper and brought the appetizing morsel home. The cat relished the dainty food, and the doctor was seen going on the same kindly errand every day until his suffering feline friend was restored to health. Still, this is no proof that the wild cat, in a pure state of nature, feeds on fish. Again, it is nothing unusual for domestic cats to catch and eat cockroaches, crickets, cockchafers, also large and small moths, but not so all. In domesticity, some are almost omnivorous. But is the wild cat? Taking its anatomical structure into consideration, there is doubtless a wide distinction, both as regards food and habit. In Daniel's Rural Sports, Anno Domini 1813, the wild cat is stated to be, quote, now scarce in England, inhabiting the mountainous and woody parts. Mr. Pennant describes it as four times the size of the house cat, but the head larger, that it multiplies as fast and may be called the British tiger, being the fiercest and most destructive beast we have. When only wounded with shot, they will attack the person who injured them, and often have strength enough to be no despicable enemy. End quote. Through the kind courtesy of that painstaking, excellent, observant and eminent naturalist, Mr. J. E. Harting, I am enabled to reprint a portion of his lecture on the origin of the domestic cat, and which afterwards appeared in The Field. Although many of the statements are known to naturalists, still I prefer giving them in the order in which they are so skillfully arranged, presenting, as they do, a very garland of facts connected with the British wildcat, Felis catus, up to the present, and which I deem valuable from many points of view, but the more particularly as a record of an animal once abundant in England, where it has now apparently almost, if not quite, ceased to exist. Quote, in England, in former days, the wild cat was included amongst the beasts of chase, and is often mentioned in royal grants giving liberty to enclose forest land and license to hunt there. Extracts from several such grants will be found in the Zoologists for 1878, pages 251, and 1880, page 251. 
nor was it for diversion alone that the wild cat was hunted its fur was much used as trimming for dresses and in this way was worn even by nuns at one time thus in archbishop corboyle's canons anno 1127 it is ordained that no abbess or nun use more costly apparel than such as is made of lambs or cats skins and as no other part of the animal but the skin was of any use here it grew into a proverb that you can have nothing of a cat but her skin the wild cat is believed to be now extinct not only in england and wales but in a great part of the south of scotland about five years ago a scottish naturalist resident in stirlingshire mr j a harvey brown took a great deal of trouble by means of printed circulars addressed to the principal landowners throughout scotland and the isles to ascertain the existing haunts of the wild cat in that part of the united kingdom the result of his inquiries embodying some very interesting information was published in the zoologist for january eighteen eighty one the replies which he received indicated pretty clearly although perhaps unexpectedly that there are now no wild cats in scotland south of a line drawn from oban on the west coast up to the brander pass to dalmolly and thence following the borders of perthshire to the junction of the three counties of perth forfar and aberdeen northward to tomintole and so to the city of inverness we are assured that it is only to the northward and westward of this line that the animal still keeps a footing in suitable localities finding its principal shelter in the great deer forests thus we see that the wild cat is being gradually driven northward before advancing civilization and the increased supervision of moors and forests just as the reindeer in the twelfth century was driven northward from england and found its last home in caithness and as the wolf followed it a few centuries later so we may expect one day that the wild cat will come to be numbered amongst the extinct british animals a recent writer in the new edition of the encyclopedia britannica article cat expresses the opinion that a wild cat still exists in wales and in the north of england but gives no proof of its recent occurrence there from time to time we see reports in the newspapers to the effect that a wild cat has been shot or trapped in some out-of-the-way part of the country but it usually turns out to be a large example of the domestic cat colored like the wild form it is remarkable that when cats in england are allowed to return to a feral state their offspring in the course of generations show a tendency to revert to the wild type of the country partly no doubt in consequence of former interbreeding with the wild species when the latter was common throughout all the wooded portions of the country and partly because the light colored varieties of escaped cats being more readily seen and destroyed are gradually eliminated while the darker wild type is perpetuated the great increase in size observable in the offspring of escaped domestic cats is no doubt due to continuous living on freshly killed warm-blooded animals and to the greater use of the muscles which their new mode of life requires in this way, I think, we may account for the size and appearance of the so-called wildcats, which are from time to time reported south of the Tweed. Perhaps the last genuine wildcat seen in England was the one shot by Lord Ravensworth at Eslington, Northumberland, in 1853. Although so recently as March 1883, a cat was shot in Bullington Wood, Lincolnshire, which in point of size color and markings was said to be quite indistinguishable from the wild felis catus bullington wood is one of an almost continuous chain of great woodlands extending from mid lincolnshire to near peterborough much of the district has never been preserved for game and keepers are few and far between hence the wild animals have enjoyed an almost complete immunity from persecution 
cats are known to have bred in these woods in a wild state for generations and there is no improbability that the cat in question may have descended directly from the old british wildcat under all the circumstances however it seems more likely to be a case of reversion under favorable conditions from the domestic to the wild type in ireland strange to say notwithstanding reports to the contrary all endeavors to find a genuine wild cat have failed the so-called wild cat of the natives proving to be the martin cat a very different animal we thus come back to the question with which we started namely the question of origin of the domestic cat and the conclusion i think at which we must arrive is that although felis catus has contributed to the formation of the existing race of domestic cats it is not the sole ancestor several wild species of egyptian and indian origin having been ages ago reclaimed the interbreeding of their offspring and crossing with other wild species in the countries to which they have been at various times exported has resulted in the gradual production of the many varieties so different in shape and color with which we are now familiar End quote. before quitting the subject i would point to the fact that when the domestic cat takes to the woods and becomes wild it becomes much larger stronger and changes in color and there can be little doubt that during the centuries of the existence of the cat in england there must have been numberless crosses and intercrosses both with regard to the males of the domestic cat as with wild females and vice versa yet the curious fact remains that the wild cat still retains its peculiar colouring and form as is shown by the skins preserved in the british museum and elsewhere mr darwin in his voyage of the beagle eighteen forty five page one hundred twenty in his notes of the first colonists of la plata anno domini fifteen thirty five says among other animals that he saw was the common cat altered into a large and fierce animal inhabiting the rocky hills etc another point on which i wish to give my impressions is the act of the cat in what is termed sharpening its claws mr darwin notes certain trees where the jaguars sharpen their claws and mentions the scars were of different ages he also thought that they did this to tear off the horny points this i believe is the received opinion among naturalists but i differ entirely from this view of the practice it is a fact however and worthy of notice that all cats do so even the domestic cat i had one of the legs of a kitchen table entirely torn to pieces by my cats and after much observation i came to the conclusion that it has nothing whatever to do with sharpening the claws but is done to stretch the muscles and tendons of the feet so that they work readily and strongly as the retraction of the claws for lengthened periods must tend to contract the tendons used for the purpose of extending or retracting therefore the cats fix the points of their claws in something soft and bear downwards with the whole weight of the body simply to stretch and by use to strengthen the ligatures that pull the claws forward it is also to be noted that even the domestic cat goes to one particular place or tree to insert the claws and drag forward the muscles perhaps even in the leather of an armchair a costly practice why one object is always selected is that they may not betray their presence by numerous marks in the neighborhood if wild to other animals or their enemies i have mentioned this to my brother john jenner weir f l s and he concurs with me throughout i find in struts sports and pastimes that of the names applied to companies of animals in the middle ages several are still in use though many have become obsolete and also a few of the beasts have ceased to exist in a wild state some were very curious such as skulk of foxes a seat of badgers a husk or down of hares 
a nest of rabbits, and a clouder of cats, and a kindle of young cats. Now cats are said to kitten, and rabbits kindle. The following shows the value of the cat nearly a thousand years ago. It is to be found in Bewick's quadrupeds. In the time of Hole the Good, King of Wales, who died in the year 948, laws were made as well to preserve as to fix the different prices of animals, among which the cat is included, as being at that period of great importance, on account of its scarcity and utility. Quote, the price of a kitten before it could see was fixed at one penny till proof could be given of its having caught a mouse two pence after which it was rated at four pence which was a great sum in those days when the value of specie was extremely high it was likewise required that it should be perfect in its sense of hearing and seeing should be a good mouser have its claws whole and if a female be a careful nurse if it failed in any of these good qualities the seller was to forfeit to the buyer a third part of its value if any one should steal or kill a cat that guarded the prince's granary he was either to forfeit a milch ewe her fleece and lamp or as much wheat as when poured on the cat suspended by its feet its head touching the floor would form a heap high enough to cover the tip of the former End quote. Buick remarks, Hence we may conclude that cats were not originally natives of these islands, and from the great care taken to improve the breed of this prolific creature, we may suppose were but little known at that period. I scarcely think this the right conclusion, the English wildcat being anatomically different. In Hone's popular works it is stated that Cats are supposed to have been brought into England from the island of Cyprus by some foreign merchants who came hither for tin. Mr. Hone further says, Wild cats were capped by our ancient kings for hunting. The officers who had charge of these cats seem to have had appointments of equal consequence with the masters of the king's hounds. They were called catatores. Beaumont and Fletcher in The Scornful Lady allude to the hunting of cats in the line. Bring out the cat hounds, I'll make you take a tree. But although large and ferocious, the wild cat was not considered a match for some of the lesser animals, for in Salmon's English Physician, 1693, we read that the weasel is an enemy to ravens, crows, and cats, and although cats may sometimes set upon them, yet they can scarcely overcome them. Nevertheless, we find in Daniel's Rural Sports, 1813, that, quote, wild cats formerly were an object of sports to huntsmen. Thus, Gerard Camville, 6 John, had special license to hunt the hare, fox, and wildcat throughout all the king's forests, and 23 Henry III, Earl Warren, by giving Simon de Pierpont a goshawk, obtained leave to hunt the buck, doe, hart, hind, hare, fox, goat, cat, or any other wild beast in certain lands of Simon's. But it was not for diversion alone that this animal was pursued, for the skin was much used by the nuns in their habits as a fur. End quote. Still, it appears from Mr. Charles Darwin's Voyage of the Beagle that tastes vary. Quote, Dr. Shaw was laughed at for stating the flesh of the lion is in great esteem, having no small affinity with veal, both in the color, taste, and flavor. Such certainly is the case with the puma. The guachos differ in their opinion whether the jaguar is good eating, but were unanimous in saying the cat is excellent. End quote. It is also stated that the Chinese fatten and eat cats with considerable relish, but of this I can obtain no reliable information, some of my friends from China not having heard of the custom, if such it is. Again referring to the skin of the cat, vide strut, quote, 
In the thirty-seventh year of the reign of Edward III, it was decreed, after enumerating the various kinds of cloth that were to be worn by the nobles, knights, dames, and others, that, Article 2, tradesmen, artificers, and men in office, called yeomen, their wives and children, shall wear no kind of furs excepting those of lambs, of rabbits, of cats, and of foxes. Further, no man unless he be possessed of the yearly value of forty shillings shall wear any furs but black and white lambskins lambs and cats skins were equivalent in value and order in the twenty-second year of this monarch's reign all the former statues against excess in apparel were repealed my old friend Fairholt, in his useful work on costume, says of the Middle Ages, the peasants wore catskins, badger skins, etc. One of the reasons why the skin of cats was used on cloaks and other garments for trimming, being that it showed humility in dress, and not by way of affectation or vanity, but for warmth and comfort, it being of the lowest value of any, with the exception of lamb's skin and badger's, and adopted by some priests as well as nuns, when wishing to impress others with their deep sense of humility in all things, even to their wearing apparel. The proof of which, Strutt's Habits of the Anglo-Normans, circa 12th century, fully illustrates. Quote, William of Malmesbury, speaking of Wolfston, Bishop of Worcester, assures us that he avoided all appearance of pride and ostentation in his dress, and though he was very wealthy, he never used any furs finer than lamp skin for the lining of his garments. Being blamed for such needless humility by Geoffrey, Bishop of the Constance, who told him that, he not only could afford, but even ought to wear those of sables, of beavers, or of foxes, he replied, It may indeed be proper for you politicians, skilful in the affairs of the world, to adorn yourselves in the skins of such cunning animals, but for me, who am a plain man, and not subject to change my opinion, the skins of lambs are quite sufficient. If, returned his opponent, the finer furs are unpleasant, you might at least make use of those of the cat. Believe me, answered the facetious prelate, the lamb of God is much oftener sung in the church than the cat of God. This witty retort put Geoffrey to the blush, and threw the whole company into a violent fit of laughter. End quote. Of a very different character was the usage of the cat at clerical festivals. In Mill's History of the Crusades, one reads with some degree of horror that, quote, In the Middle Ages, the cat was a very important personage in religious festival. At A in Provence, on the festival of the Corpus Christi, the finest hecat of the country, wrapped like a child in swaddling clothes, was exhibited in a magnificent shrine to public admiration. Every knee was bent, every hand strewed flowers or poured incense, and pussy was treated in all respects as the god of the day. On the festival, however, of St. John, June 24th, the poor cat's fate was reversed. A number of cats were put in a wicker basket and thrown alive into the midst of a large fire, killed in the public square by the bishop and his clergy. Hymns and anthems were sung, and processions were made by the priests and people in honor of the sacrifice. End quote. While the foregoing was about being printed, Mr. Edward Hamilton, M.D., writing to The Field, May 11th, 1889, gives information of a wild cat being shot in Invernessshire. I therefore insert the paragraph, as every record of so scarce an animal is of importance and value, especially when it is descriptive. He states, quote, A fine specimen of the wild cat, Felis Silvestris, was sent to me on May 3rd, trapped in Invernessshire on the Ben Nevis range. It was too much decomposed to exhibit. Its dimensions were from nose to base of tail, one foot, eleven inches. 
length of tail, one foot, height at shoulder, one foot, two inches, the length of small intestine, one foot, eight and a half inches, and the large intestine, one foot, one inch. End quote. It will be seen by these measurements that the animal was not so large as some that have been taken, though excelling in size many of the domestic varieties. End of section 23。Section 24 of Our Cats and All About Them this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Thomas Kuz Kuzmarski. Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir. 24. Concerning Cats. Cat. Irish. Cat. French. Sha. Dutch. Cat, Danish, cat, Swedish, cat, German, cati or cats, Latin, catus, Italian, cato, Portuguese and Spanish, gato, Polish, cot, Russian, cots, Turkish, kitty, Welsh, cuff, Cornish, cat, Basque, catua. American, gaz or gats, in Armenic, kita or keta is a male cat. Abram cat. This I first thought simply meant a male cat, but I find in Nares, Abram is the corruption of Auburn, so no doubt a red or sandy tabby cat is intended. A ween cat. A queen cat, catus femina. Queen was used by the Saxons to signify the female sex, in that queen fugal was used for hen fowl. Farmers in Kent and Sussex used also to call heifers little queens. Carl cat, a boar or he cat, from the old Saxon Carl or Carl, a male, and cat. Cat. It was used to denote liberty. No animal is more impatient of restriction or confinement, nor yet seeming to bear it with more resignation. The Romans made their goddess of liberty holding a cup in one hand and a broken scepter in the other, with a cat lying at her feet. Among the goddesses, Diana is said to have assumed the form of a cat. The Egyptians worshipped the cat as an emblem of the moon, not only because it was more active after sunset, but from the dilation and contraction of its orb, symbolical of the waxing and waning of the night goddess. But Bailey, in his dictionary, says cats see best as the sun approaches, and that their eyesight decays as it goes down in the evening. Yet, on this account, says Mr. Thieselton Dyer, in his English folklore, it was so highly esteemed as to receive sacrifices, and even to have stately temples erected to its honor. Whenever a cat died, Brand tells us, all the family shaved their eyebrows, and Diodorus Sicilus relates that a Roman happening accidentally to kill a cat, the mob immediately gathered round the house where he was, and neither the entreaties of some principal men by the king, nor the fear of the Romans, with whom the Egyptians were then negotiating a peace, could save the man's life. In so much esteem also was it held that on the death of its owner, the favorite cat, 
or even kitten was sacrificed, embalmed, and placed in the same sarcophagus. Some few years ago, Mr. E. Long, R.A., exhibited at the Royal Academy a very fine picture of Egyptians idol-making, idol-worshippers, and sellers, the lines from Juvenal being descriptive. All knows what monsters Egypt venerates. It worships crocodiles, or it adores the snake-gorged ibis and sacred ape, graven in gold is seen whole cities prey to cats and fishes or the dog invoke cat a metal tripod for holding a plate or dutch oven before the fire so called because in whatever position it is placed it is supported by the spokes as it is said, a cat will always light on its feet, so the plate holder will stand firmly in any position. Those old brass appliances have now gone out of use and are seldom seen. The new mode of handing round not requiring them. Another reason, doubtless, is the lowness of the fire compared with the stove of former years, which was high up in the bygone parlor grate. Cat. A cross old woman was called a cat, or to a shrewish the epithet was applied tauntingly. But will you woo this wild cat? Taming of the Shrew, Act One, Scene Two. Cat. A ship formed on the Norwegian model, having a narrow stem, projecting quarters, and a deep waist. It is strongly built from four to six hundred tons burden, and employed in the coal trade. Cat. A strong tackle, a combination of pulleys, to hook and draw in the anchor perpendicularly up the cat head of the ship. Cat. A small kind of anchor is sometimes called a cat or catch by the Dutch cat. Cat. At the edge of the moat opposite the wooden tower, a strong penthouse, which they called a cat, might be seen stealing towards the curtain and gradually filling up the moat with facings and rubbish. Red Cloister and Hearth, Chapter 43, Davis's Glossary. Catacide, a cat killer, Bailey, 1726. Catamount, cat of the mountain, the ordinary wild cat when found in the mountains, among the rocks or woods. Cat and Trap, a game or play, Ainsworth. This is probably that known as Trap, Bat, and Ball, as on striking the trap, after the ball is placed on the lever, it is propelled upwards, and then struck by the batsman. Catapult, a military engine for battering or attacking purposes, a modern toy, by which much mischief and evil is done by unthinking boys. Cat bird, an American bird whose cry resembles that of a cat, the Turdus philovox. Cat block, a two- or threefold block with an iron strap and large hook used to draw up an anchor to the cat head. Cat call, a tin whistle. The ancients divided their dramas into four parts. Protasis, introduction. Epitasis, continuation. Catus tasis, climax. And catus strophe, conclusion or denouement. The cat call is the call for the cat or catastrophe. Brewer's Dictionary of Phrase and Fable. 
Sound, sound, ye vials, be the cat called dumb. Dunciade, one, three, oh, three. The modern imitation of cat calls is caused by whistling with two fingers in the mouth, and so making an intensely shrill noise with wallings imitating caterwaulings. Also, a shrill tin whistle, round and flat, set against the teeth. Cat Eden Street, in London, properly Cat Street, Stowe. Caterpillar, Caterpillvirm, among fruit, is corrupted from an old French shot, Pelus, Palsgrave, 1530. Hairy cat, the last part of the word was probably assimilated to piller, a robber or despoiler. Palmer's folk etymology. Caterwauling, the raw of cats in rutting times, any hideous noise. Topsail gives caterwauling to rawl, rawl to rail or quarrel with a loud voice. Hence the Yorkshire expression, raising a row, meaning a row or quarrel. There is also the archaic adjective rawr, angry. Caterwaul, therefore, is the wall or roll of cats, the er being either a plural, similar to childer, children, or a corrupted genitive. Brewer's Dictionary of Phrase and Fable. What a caterwauling do you keep here? Shakespeare, Twelfth Night, Act Two, Scene Three. To yawl, to squall or scream harshly like an enraged cat. Holloway, Norfolk. Thou must be patient. We came crying hither. Thou knowest the first time that we smell air. We wall and cry. King John, Act 4. Cat-eyed, sly, gray eyes, or with large pupils, watchful. Cat fall, a rope used in ships for hoisting the anchor to the cat head. Catfish, a species of the squalus or shark, Felis marinus. The catfish of North America is a species of cotus or bullhead. Cat gut, a corruption of gut cord, the intestines of a sheep twisted and dried, not that of a cat, as generally supposed. Also, it is stated by some, the finger strings for vials were made from the cat Mr. Timms says the original reading in Shakespeare was calves gut, a sort of linen or canvas with wide interstices. Webster. Cat hanged or hammed. Awkward, sometimes applied to a horse with weak hind legs and which drops suddenly behind on its haunches, as a cat is said to do. Cat handed a Devonshire term for awkward. Cat hairpings, rope sewing to brace in the shrouds of the lower masts behind their respective yards, to tighten the shrouds and give more room to draw in the yards when the ship is close-hauled. Marine Dictionary. Cat harping fashion, drinking crossways, and not, as usual, over the left thumb. Sea term, gross. Cat head, a strong beam projecting horizontally over the ship's bows, carrying two or three sheaves, above which a rope, called the cat fall, passes, and communicates with the cat block. Marine Dictionary. Cat hood. The time when a kitten is full grown, it is then a cat and has attained maturity, that is, cathood. Cat hook, 
a strong hook fitted to the cat block. Catlap, weak tea only fit for the cat to lap, or thin milk and water. In Kent and Sussex, it is also often applied to small, very small beer. Even thin gruel is called catlap. Weak tea is also called scandal broth. Cat-like, stealthy, slow, yet appertaining more to appearance. Catlings, down or moss, growing about walnut trees, resembling the hair of a cat. Catonine tails, so-called from being nine pieces of cord put together, in each cord nine knots, and this, when used vigorously, makes several long marks, not unlike the clawing or scratching of a cat, producing crossing and recrossing wounds, a fearful and severe punishment, formerly not often exercised for trivial offences. Cat or dog wool, of which cot or coarse blankets were formerly made. Bailey, cot gase, refuse wool. Cat, no doubt, was a corruption of cot. Cat pear, a pear, shaped like a hen's egg that ripens in October. Cat pellet, the pop gun of boys, one pellet of paper driving out the other. Davis, in his glossary, thinks it means tip cat. Probably it may be the sharpened piece of wood, not the game, that is different altogether, he quotes. Who beats the boys from cat pellet and stool ball? British Bellman, 1648. Cat salt, a salt obtained from butter. Cat salt, a sort of salt beautifully granulated, formed out of the bittern or leech brine, used for making hard soap. Encyclopedia. Cat's eye, a precious stone resembling, when polished, the eye of a cat. It has lately become fashionable. A large collection of Burmese, Indian, and Japanese curiosities was lately sold by auction. The great attraction of the sale was the Hindu Lingam God, consisting of a crystal barrel cat's eye fixed in a topaz, and mounted in a pyramidal base studded with diamonds and precious stones. This curious relic stood two and one quarter inches in height. It was preserved for more than a thousand years in an ancient temple at Delhi, where acts of devotion were paid before it by women anxious to have children. The base is of solid gold, and around it are set nine gems or charms. Pyramid is a plinth set with diamonds. On the apex is a topaz, one ten sixteenths inch in length, and nine sixteenths of an inch in depth, shaped like a horseshoe. In the center of the horseshoe, the great chrysoberyl cat's eye stands upright. There is fifteen sixteenths of an inch in height, and dark brown in color, and shaped like a pear. An extremely mobile opalescent light crosses the length of the stone in an oblique direction. When Bad Shah Bahadur Shah, the last king of Delhi, was captured and exiled to the Andaman Isles, his queen secreted this gem, and it was never seen again until, being distressed during the mutiny, she sold it to the present owner. The gem was finally knocked down at 2,450 pounds to Mr. S.J. Phillips, 
Jeweler, New Bond Street. Cat's Foot. To live under the cat's foot. To be under the dominion of a wife, henpecked. Cat's Foot, a plant of the genus Glecoma pes felinus, ground ivy or gill. Cat's Head Apple, a large culinary apple, considered by some in form to bear a resemblance to a cat's head. Phillips, in his poem, Cider, thus describes it. The cat's head's weighty orb, enormous in growth, for various use. Cat Silver, an old popular name for mica or talc. Cat sleep, a light doze, a watchful sleep, like that of a hare or of a cat who sits in front of a mouse hole, a dozy or a sleeping wakefulness. Cat's paw, any one used by another for getting them out of a difficulty, and for no other reason, is made a cat's paw of. The simile is from the fable of the monkey using the cat's paw to take his chestnuts out of the fire. A light breeze just ruffling the water in a calm is called a cat's paw. Also, a particular kind of turn in the bite of a rope made to hook tackle on. Cat's tail. Typha latifolia, a kind of reed which bears a spike like the tail of a cat, which some call reed mace. Its long flat leaves are much used for the bottoms of chairs. Cat's tails, mare's tails, equisetum. Cat stain, battlestone, a monolith in Scotland, sometimes falsely called a druidical stone. The Norwegian term, banta stein, means the same thing. Celtic, cath, battle, Brewer's Dictionary of Phrase and Fable. Cat sticks, thin legs compared to the thin sticks with which boys play at cat. Gross. Catsup or ketchup, a corruption of the English name Kit Jap. Is then the syllable cat a pun on kit, or kitten a young cat? Surely not. Cateria, Nepita Cateria, Mentha felina, the herb catmint. Cattery, a place where cats are kept. The ordinary name when a person keeps a collection of cats. Catish, having stealthy ways, slow and cautious in movements, watchful. Catwater, Plymouth. This is a remarkable instance of mistranslation. The castle at the mouth of the Plym used to be called the Chateau, but someone, thinking it would be better to anglicize the French, divided the word into two parts. Cha, cat, O, water. Brewer's Dictionary of Phrase and Fable. Catwin. Rosa spinosissima. Burnet rose is the name of the plant. Cat with two tails. The earwig. Northumberland. Holloway. Gill cat. A male cat. Some say an old male. Nair says an expression exactly analogous to jackass. The one being formerly called Gill or Gilbert as commonly as the other jack. Tomcat is now the usual term, and for a similar reason. Tybert is said to be the old French for Gilbert. From Tybert, Tib, Tibby, also was a common name for a cat. Wilkins, in his Index to Philosophical Language, has Gil, male, cat, 
in the same way as a male cat is called a tom cat. In some countries, the cock fowl is called a tom. It is unknown whence the origin of the latter term. Grimalkin, poetical name for a cat. Bailey, Malkin signifies a hare in Scotland. Gross. In Sussex, a hare is often called puss or pussy. Puss is also a common name for a cat. Grinagog, the cat's uncle. A foolish, grinning fellow. One who grins without reason. Gross. In Norfolk, if one say she, the reply is, who is she? The cat's aunt. Hang me in a bottle like a cat. Benedict. If I do, hang me in a bottle like a cat, and shoot at me, and he that hits me, let him be clapped on the shoulder, and called Adam, meaning Adam Bell, the famous archer. Much Ado About Nothing, Act One. A note in the Percy Relics, Volume 1, 1812, states, Bottles were formerly of leather, though perhaps a wooden bottle might be here meant. It is still a diversion in Scotland, 1812, to hang up a cat in a small cask or firkin, half filled with soot and then a parcel of clowns on horseback try to beat out the ends of it in order to show their dexterity in escaping before the contents fall on them. From Demands Joyusis, Amusing Questions, 1511. Q. What is that that never was and never will be? A. A mouse nest in a cat's ear. Q. Why does a cat cross the road? A. Because it wants to get to the other side. Mrs. Evans, a local name for a she-cat, owing, it is said, to a witch of the name of Evans, who assumed the appearance of a cat. Gross. Nine lives like a cat. Cats from their great suppleness and aptitude to fall on their feet are commonly said to have nine lives. Hence, Ben Jonson, in Every Man in His Humour, says, "'Tis a pity you had not ten lives, a cat's and your own." Thistleton Dyer's English Folklore. Tib, what wouldst thou have with me? Mare, good king of cats, Nothing but one of your nine lives. Romeo and Juliet, 3, 1. Middleton says in Blurt Master Constable, 1602, They have nine lives apiece, like a woman. Pussy cats, male blossom of the willow. Salt cat, or salt cate. A mixture of salt gravel, clay, old mortar, cumin seed, ginger, and other ingredients in a pan which is placed in pigeon lofts. Sick as a cat. Cats are subject to sickness or vomiting for the purpose of throwing up indigestible matter, such as the fur of mice, feathers of birds, which would otherwise collect and form balls internally. For this reason they eat grass, which produces the desired effect, hence arises the phrase, as sick as a cat. Tabby, an old maid, either from Tabitha, a formal antiquated name, or else from a tabby cat. Old maids, by the rude, weak-minded, and vulgar, being often compared to cats. To drive tab, to go out on a party of pleasure with wife and family. Grossest glossary. The neighborhood's old cat often came to pay us a visit. We made her a bow and courtesy, each with a compliment in it. After her health, we asked our care and regard to events. We have made the very same speeches 
to many an old cat since. Mrs. B. Browning, translation of Hein. Tip Cat. A pleasant name for those engaged in it. Not so, too often, for others. Medical reports of late tending to show that many cases of loss of sight have occurred. To turn cat in pan. This phrase has been a source of much contention, and many different derivations have been given. But all tend to show that it means a complete turn over, that is, to quit one side and go to the other, to turn traitor, to turn coat, to turn cat in pan, pray vericor, Ainsworth. Bacon, in his essays on cunning, page 81, says, There is a cunning which we in England call the turning of the cat in the pan, which is when that a man says to another, he lays it as if another had said it to him. This is somewhat obscure in definition. Tune says, the proverbial expression, to turn a cat in a pan, denotes a sudden change in one's party or politics or religion for the sake of being in the ascendant. As a cat always comes down on its legs, however thrown. The Viker of Bray is quoted as simply a turncoat, but this does not affect the argument. I quite think, and in this others agree with me, that it has nothing to do with the cat, but was originally Kate. In old times, and until lately, it was the custom to toss pancakes to turn them over. It was no easy matter. Frequently the cake, or Kate, went in the fire or lodged in the chimney. To turn the cat, or Kate, in the pan was to toss and turn it completely over, that is, from one side to the other. The meaning given to the phrase helps to prove this view. I merely introduce this because so many have asked for an explanation as regards the cat in pan. I consider the far-fetched origins of the term are complete errors. It was a custom to toss pancakes on Shrove Tuesday, and it required great skill to do it well, cleanly and completely. Some cooks were noted for it, and thought clever if it was done without injury to themselves or clothes. It appears from the Westmoreland dialect by A. Walker, 1790, that cockfighting and casting of pancakes were then common in that county. Thus, war there war te be cockfighting, for it war pancake Tuesday, and we met some lads and lasses ganging to kest their pancakes to whip the cat to practice the most pinching parsimony grudging even the scraps and orts or remnants of food given to the cat holloway norfolk a phrase applied to the village tailor going round from house to house for work to be drunk Haywood's Philo Conothista, 1635, page 60. An itinerant parson is said to whip the cat. A trick practiced on ignorant country fellows, vain of their strength, by laying a wager with them that they may be pulled through a pond by a cat. The bet being made, a rope is fixed round the waist, of the party to be catted, and the end thrown across the pond, to which the cat is also fastened by a pack thread, and three or four sturdy fellows are appointed to lead and whip the cat. 
these on a signal being given seize the end of the cord and pretend to whip the cat haul the astonished booby through the water gross seventeen eighty five the following are called from the well-known and useful book jameson's scottish dictionary cat a small bit of rag rolled up and put between the handle of a pot and the hook which suspends it over the fire to raise it a little rocks b cat a handful of straw with or without come upon it or of reaped grain laid on the ground by the reaper without being put into a sheaf roxby dumfra perhaps from the belgian word caten to throw the handful of corn being cast on the ground whence cat a small anchor cat the name given to a bit of wood a horn or anything which is struck in place of a ball in certain games to cat a chimney to close event by the process called cat and clay tiviotl cat and clay the materials of which a mud wall is constructed in many parts of s straw and clay are well wrought together and being formed into pretty large rolls are laid between the different wooden posts by means of which the wall is formed and carefully pressed down so as to incorporate with each other or with the twigs that are sometimes plaited from one post to another s cat and dog the name of an ancient sport s it seems to be an early form of cricket query is this the same as cat and trap cat band one the name given to the strong hook used on the inside of a door or gate which being fixed to the wall keeps it shut two a chain drawn across a street for defense in time of war germ cat a chain and band catfish sea cat the sea wolf s anarchicus lupus lin s w half cat i e sea cat sibold cat gut thread fucus or sea laces fucus phylum lin orkney Niels tour cat harrow they draw the cat harrow that is they thwart one another loth ang lindsay cat heather a finer species of heath low and slender growing more in separate upright stalks than the common heath and flowering only at the top a bird cat hole one the name given to the loopholes or narrow openings in the wall of a barn s two a sort of niche in the wall of a barn in which keys and other necessaries are deposited in the inside where it is not perforated cat hud the name given to a large stone which serves as a back to a fire on the hearth in the house of a cottager dumfra s w g cat denotes a small cell or apartment which corresponds to the form of the country fireside also a bed a pen hud might seem allied to tut hoid en conserver as the stone is meant to guard this enclosure from the effects of the fire cattling a small cat gut strings for musical instruments also a kind of knife used in surgery cat's loop one a very short distance as to space s 
Q. As far as a cat may leap. Hog. 2. A moment, as eyes be we ye in a cat loop, i.e. instantly. I will be with you as quickly as a cat can leap. Cat maw. To tumble the cat maw. To go topsy turvy. To tumble. S. B. Catmint. An herbaceous plant. Mentha felina. The cat's delight to roll on. Cat's carriage. The same play that is otherwise called the king's cushion. Q. V. Loth. Cat's cradle. A plaything for children made of pack thread on the fingers of one person and transferred from them to those of another s cats crammocks clouds like hairs streaming from an animal's tail shetland cat's hair one the down that covers unfledged birds fife synonym paddock hair the down on the face of boys before the beard grows. Yes. 3. Applied also to the thin hair that often grows on the bodies of persons in bad health. Yes. Cat siller. The mica of mineralogists. Yes. The katzen silber of the vulgar in Germany. Tut. Catin silver, amiantus, mica, vulgo argentum, filium, Killian. Cat slug, the name given to the auricula ursi, Lynn Roxburgh. Cat stairs, a plaything for children, made of thread, small cord, or tape which is so disposed by the hands as to fall down like steps of a stair. Dimfer Gull. Catstone. One of the upright stones which support a grate, there being one on each side, rocks be. Since the introduction of Karen grates, these stones are found in kitchens only. The term is said to originate from this being the favorite seat of the cat. See Catstone English. Catstone head. The flat top of the catstone. I bid. Cat steps. The projections of the stones in the slanting part of a gable. Rocks B. Corby steps. Synonym. Cat's tails, hairs, tail rush, aeriforum, vaginatum, Lynn Mairns, also called Canna Down, Cat's tails, Galloway. Cat and Clover, Cat and Clover, the Lotus, south of S, SW, Cat Clor, Cat's Claws. Catter, 1. Catar, Bellenden, 2. A supposed disease of the fingers from handling cats. Catterbatch. A broil, a quarrel. Fife. Toot. Cater, a he cat, and boats. Rendered cavalatio. Q, a cat's quarrel. Catwitit. Harebrained, unsettled. Q. Having the wits of a cat. S. Kitty, a North Country name for a cat, male or female. Kitling, sharp, kitten like. His kitling eyes begin to run quite through the table where he spies the horns of papery butterflies. Herrick Hesperides. Kittenhood, state of being a kitten. For thou art as beautiful as ever a cat, that one tongued in the joy of kittenhood. Southey. Kittenish. Kitten like. Such a kittenish disposition in her, I called it. The love of playfulness. Richardson. 
Kit or kitten? A young cat. A young cat is a kitten until it is full grown, then kittenhood ceases. A schoolboy being asked to describe a kitten replied, A kitten is chiefly remarkable for rushing like mad at nothing whatever, and generally stopping before it gets there. Puss Gentleman, an effeminate man, Davis, Glossary. I cannot talk with Sivet in the room. A fine Puss Gentleman, that's all perfume. Cowper's Conversations. End of section 24. Recording by John Thomas Kuz Kuzmarski. www.validateyourlife.com Section 25 of Our Cats and All About Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore. Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Ware. Section 25. Cat Proverbs. A blate cat makes a proud mouse. Scotch. An idle or stupid or timid foe is never feared. A cat has nine lives. A woman has nine lives. In Middleton's Blurt Master Constable, 1602, we have, They have nine lives apiece, like a woman. A cat may look at a king. In Cornwall they say a cat may look at a king if he carries his eyes about him. A cat may look at a king is the title of a book on history published in the early part of the last century. On the front's piece is the picture of a cat, over it the inscription, A cat may look at a king and a king's head and shoulders on the title page, with the same inscription above. A cat's walk, a little way and back. Cornwall, no place like home, idling about. A dead cat feels no cold, no life, no pain, nor reproach. A dog hath a day, Haywood. In Essex, folks add, and a cat has two Sundays. Why? The shape of a good greyhound. A head like a snake, a neck like a drake, a back like a beam, sided like a bream, a foot like a cat, a tail like a rat. Ale that would make a cat talk, strong enough to make even the dumb speak. A spicy pot, then do's us reason, would make a cat to talk high treason. Durfee. A halfpenny cat may look at a king. Scotch. A jeering saying of offense, one is as good as another. And, as a Scotchman once said, and better. A muffled cat is no good mouser. Clark, 1639. No good workman wears gloves. By some is said muzzled. A piece of a kid is worth two of a cat. A little of good is better than much that is bad. A scalded cat fears cold water. Once bit, always shy. What was may be again. As cat or cap case... Bowser I am not, but mild sober Tuesday, as cat and cap case, if I like not St. Hugh's Day. The Christmas Prince, 1607. As gray as Granham's cat, Hazlitt, so old as to be likely to be doubly gray. As melancholy as a gib cat, Scotch, as an old worn out cat, Johnston. I am as melancholy as a gib cat or a lugged bear, Shakespeare. A lugged bear is a bear with its ears cut off, so that when used for baiting there is less hold for the dogs. Gibcat, an old, lonely, melancholy cat. Before the cat can lick her ear. Nay, you were not quite out of hearing ere the cat could lick her ear. Ovidus Exultance, 1673, page 50. That is never. Done, besides being the name of one who arrested for debt in Henry the Seventh's time, was also the name of the hangman before, Jack Ketch. Gross. And presently a halter got, made of the best strong tear, and ere a cat could lick her ear, had tied it up with so much art. 1664, Cotton's Virgil, Book 4. By biting and scratching, dogs and cats come together. Haywood, quarreling oft makes friends. Care claimed a cat. Sir G. C. Lewis's Heffordshire Glossary. 
Clammed means starvation, that is, care killed the cat. For want of food, the entrails get clammed. Care killed the cat, but you cannot live without it. To all some trouble, though not all take heed. None know another's burden. Care will kill a cat. Then hang care and sorrow, tis able to kill a cat. Durfee. Alluding to its tenacity of life and the carking wear of care. Cats after kind good mouse hunt. Hayward. Letter by F. A. Touching the quarrel between Arthur Hall and Melk Mallory in 1575 through 6. Reprinted of edition 1580 in Miscellany Antiquarian Anglican. 1816, page 93. For never yet was good cat out of Kindle. English Proverbs, Hazlitt. Cats and Carlin sit in the sun. When work is done, then warmth and rest. Cat eats what hussies spare. Nothing is lost. Also refers to giving away and saying the cat took it. Cats hide their claws. All is not fair that seems so. Trust not to appearances. Cry you mercy, killed my cat. Clark, 1639. Better away than stay and ask pardon. Every day is no yule. Cast the cat a castock. The stump of a cabbage in the proverb means much the same as Spare no expense, bring another bottle of small beer. Denham's Popular Sayings, 1846 Of false persons. He bides as fast as a cat bound with a sacer. He does as he likes, nothing holds him. Of witty persons. He can hold the cat to the sun. Bold and foolish enough for anything. Inconstant persons. He is like a dog or a cat, not reliable. He looks like a wild cat out of a bush, fiercely afraid. He's like a cat. Fling him which way you will, he'll not hurt. Some are always superior to misfortune, or fortune favors many. He's like a singed cat, better than he's likely. He's better than he looks or seems. He stands in great need that borrows the cat's dish. Clark, 1639. The starving are not particular. The hungry cannot choose. He lives at the sign of the cat's foot. He is henpecked. His wife scratches him. Ray. He will gall the man true that the moon is made of grand cheese, or the cat took the heron. Never believe all that is laid to another. Honest as the cat when the meat is out of reach. Some are honest, but others not by choice. How can the cat help it when the maid is a fool? Often things lost, given, or stolen are laid to the cat. If thou scapest, thou hast cat's luck. In Fletcher's Night of Malta, alluding to the activity and caution of the cat, which generally stands it in good stead. I'll not buy a cat in a poke. French. Chat en pouche. See what you buy. Bargain not on another's word. Just as quickly as a cat up a walnut tree. Durfee. To climb well and easily, to be alert and sudden. Let the cat wink and let the mouse run. For want of watching and care, much is lost. Hazlitt's. Dodsley. I, 265. The first portion is in the interlude of the world and the child, 1522. Like a cat, he'll fall on his legs. To succeed, never to fail, always right. Like a cat round hot milk. Wait and have, all things come to those who wait. Little and little the cat eateth the stickle. Haywood, constant dropping, weareth a stone. Long and slender like a cat's elbow. Hazlitt, a sneer at the ill-favored. Love me, love my cat. This refers to one marrying, and taking a wife he must take her belongings, or where you like you must avoid contention. Never was a cat or dog drowned that could see the shore. To know the way often brings a right ending. None but cats and dogs are allowed to quarrel here. All else agree. No playing with a straw before an old cat. Haywood, 1562. Every trifling toy age cannot laugh at. Youth and folly, age and wisdom. Rats walk at their ease if cats do not see them mees. Wadrofe, 1623. Rogues abound where laws are weak. Send not a cat for lard. George Herbert. Put not any to temptation. So as cat is after kind. Near friends are dearest. Birds of a feather flock together. Take the chestnuts out of the fire with the cat's paw. Making use of others to save oneself. That comes of a cat will catch mice. What is bred in the bone comes out in the flesh, like father, like son. 
The cat and dog may kiss, but are none the better friends. Policy is one thing, friendship another. The cat invites the mouse to her feast. It is difficult for the weak to refuse the strong. The cat is in the cream pot. Any one's fault but hers, a row in the house, northern. The cat is hungry when a crust contents her. Hunger is a good sauce. The cat is out of kind that sweet milk will not lap. One is wrong who forsakes custom. History of Jacob and Esau, 1568. The cat, the rat, and Lovell the dog rule England under one hog. A Mirror for Magistrates, edition 1563, folio 143. This couplet is a satire on Richard the Third, who carried a boar in his escutcheon, in his Myrmidons, Cat, Espy, Rat, Cliff, and Lovell. The cat would eat fish and would not wet her feet. Hayward, 1562. Fain would the cat fish eat, but she is loath to wet her feet. What cat's averse to fish? Gray. Dr. Trench has pointed out the allusion to this saying in Macbeth, when Lady Macbeth speaks of her husband as a man. Letting I dare not wait upon I would, like the poor cat in the adage. The cat sees not the mouse ever. Haywood. Those that should hide see more than they who seek. The fearful eye sees far. The licorice cat gets many a rap. The wrongdoer escapes not. The more you rub a cat on the back, the higher she sets her tail. Praise the vain, and they are more than pleased. Flattery and vanity are near akin. The mouse lords it when the cat is not. Manuscript, 15th century. The little rule where there are no great. The old cat laps as much as the young. Clark, one evil is much like another. They agree like two cats in gutter. Hayward, to be less than friends. They argue like cats and dogs. That is to quarrel. Thou wilt strip it as Stack strips the cat when he pulled her out of the churn, to take away everything. Though the cat winks a while, yet sure he is not blind. To know all and pretend ignorance. To grin like a Cheshire cat. Said to be like a cheese cat, often made Cheshire. But this is not very clear and the meaning doubtful. To go like a cat on a hot bakestone. To lose no time, to be swift and stay not. To keep a cat from the tongs. To stop at home in idleness. It is said of a youth who stays at home with his family when others go to the wars abroad. In a health to the gentlemanly profession of serving men. 1598. Too late repents the rat when caught by the cat. Jean danger, nor dare too long. To love it as a cat loves mustard. Not at all to abhor. Two cats and a mouse, two wives in one house, two dogs and one bone never agree. No peace when all want to be masters, or to possess one object. Well might the cat wink when both her eyes are out. Somewhat it was say at the proverb old, the cat winked when her eye was out. Jack Juggler, edition, 1848, page 46. Those bribed are worse than blind. Well what in her cat what's bird he licketh. Writes Essays, volume 1, page 149. The cat knoweth whose lips she licketh. Haywood, 1562. The first appears the most correct. What the good wife spares, the cat eats. Favorites are well cared for. When candles are out, all cats are gray. In the dark, all are alike. That is said of beauty in general. When the cat is away, the mice will play. The Bachelor's Banquet, 1603. Haywood's Woman Killed with Kindness, 1607. When danger is past, it is time to rejoice. When the weasel and the cat make a marriage, it is very ill presage. When enemies counsel together, take heed. When rogues agree, let the honest folk beware. When the maid leaves the door open, the cat's in fault. It is always well to have another to bear the blame. The way to do ill deeds oft makes ill deeds done. Who shall hang the bell about the cat's neck? Hayward, 1562. Who shall tie the bell about the cat's neck low? Not I, quoth the mouse. For a thing that I know. The mice, at a consultation, held how to secure themselves from the cat, resolved upon hanging a bell about her neck, to give warning when she was near. But when this was resolved, they were as far to seek, for who would do it? R. Who will court danger to benefit others? A. Douglas, in the olden time, at a meeting of conspirators, said he would bell the cat. Afterwards the enemy was taken by him, he retaining the cognomen of Archibald Bell the Cat. You can have no more of a cat than its skin. 
You can have no more of a man but what he can do or what he has, or no more from a jug than what it contains. The Cat of Shakespeare Shakespeare mentions the cat forty-four times, and in this, like nearly all else of which he wrote, displayed both wonderful and accurate knowledge, not only of the form, nature, habits, and food of the animal, but also the inner life, the disposition, what it was, of what capable, and what it resembled. How truly he saw, either from study, observation, or intuitively knew, not only the outward contour of men and things, but could see within the casket which held the life and being, noting clearly thoughts, feelings, aspirations, intents and purposes, not of the only one, but that also of the brute creation. How truthful he alludes to the peculiar eyes of the cat, the fine mark that the pupil dwindles to when the sun rides high in the heavens. Hear Grumio in the taming of the shrew. And so disfigure her with it, that she shall have no more eyes to see withal than a cat. As to the food of the cat, he well informs us that at this distant period, domestic cats were fed and cared for, to a certain extent, for besides much else he points to the fact of its love of milk. In the Tempest, Antonio's reply to Sebastian in Act Two, Scene One. For all the rest, they'll take suggestion as a cat laps milk. And in Henry the Fourth, Act Four, Scene Two, of its pilfering ways, Falstaff cries out, I am as vigilant as a cat to steal cream while Lady Macbeth points to the uncertain, timid, cautious habits of the cat, amounting almost to cowardice. Letting I dare not wait upon I would, like the poor cat in the adage. And in the same play, the strange superstitious fear attached to the voice and presence of the cat at certain times and seasons. Thrice the brinded cat hath mewed. The line almost carries a kind of awe with it, a sort of feeling of what next will happen. He noted also, as he did most things, its marvellous powers of observation, for in Coriolanus, Act Four, Scene Two, occurs the following, Cats that can judge as fitly, and of the forlorn loneliness of the age-stricken male cat, in King Henry the Fourth, Falstaff murmuring says, I am as melancholy as a gib-cat. He marks, too, the difference of action in the lion and cat in a state of nature, a crouching lion and a ramping cat, of the night-time food-seeking cat in Merchant of Venice, old Shylock talks of the slow and profit, and he sleeps by day, more than the wild cat. In the same play, Shylock discourses of those that have a natural horror of certain animals, which holds good till this day. Some men there are love not a gaping pig, some that are mad if they behold a cat. And further on, as there is no firm reason to be rendered why he cannot abide a gaping pig, why he a harmless necessary cat. Note the distinction he makes between the wild and domestic cat. The one evidently he knew the value and use of, and the other its peculiar stealthy ways and of nature dread. In all well that's end well, he gives vent to his dislike. Bertram rages forth, I could endure anything before me but a cat, and now he's cat to me. The feud with the wild cat intensifies in Midsummer's Night Dream. Tis Leander speaks, Hang off, thou cat, thou burr, thou vile thing. And Gremio tells of the untamableness of the wild cat, which he deems apparently impossible. But will you woo this wild cat? Romeo in Romeo and Juliet looks with much disfavor, not only on cats, but also dogs. In fact, the dog was held in as high disdain as the cat. And every cat and dog, and every little mouse, and every unworthy thing. Here is Hamlet's opinion. The cat will mew, the dog will have his day. In Cymbeline there is, in killing creatures vile as cats and dogs. The foregoing is enough to show the great poet's opinion of the cat. End of section 25。section 26 of Our Cats and All About Them by Harrison Weir。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you today by Don Larson in Minnesota. Section 26. Superstition and Witchcraft and Weather Notions A very remarkable peculiarity of the domestic cat, and possibly one that has had much to do with the ill favor with which it has been regarded, especially in the Middle Ages, is the extraordinary property 
which its fur possesses in yielding electric sparks when hand rubbed or by other friction the black in a larger degree than any other color even the rapid motion of a fast retreating cat through rough tangled underwood having been known to produce a luminous effect in frosty weather it is the more noticeable the coldness of the weather apparently giving intensity and brilliancy which to the ignorant would certainly be attributed to the interference of the spiritual or superhuman to sensitive natures and nervous temperaments the very contact with the fur of the black cat will often produce a startling thrill or absolutely an electrical shock that carefully observant naturalist gilbert white speaking of the frost of seventeen eighty five notes during those two siberian days my parlor cat was so electric that had a person stroked her and been properly insulated the shock might have been given to a whole circle of people possibly from this lively fiery sparkling tendency combined with its noiseless motion and stealthy habits our ancestors were led in the happily bygone superstitious days to regard the unconscious animal as a familiar of satan or some other evil spirit which generally appeared in the form of a black cat hence witches were said to have a black cat as their familiar or could at will change themselves into the form of a black cat with eyes of fire shakespeare says the cat with eyne of burning coal and in middleton's witch act three hecate says i will but noint and then i'll mount a spirit like a cat descends voice above there is one come down to fetch his dues later on the voice calls hark hark the cat sings a brave treble in her own language then hecate now i go now i fly malkin my sweet spirit i etc one of the frauds of witchcraft says timbs is the witch pretending to transform herself into a certain animal the favorite and most usual transformation being a cat hence cats were tormented by the ignorant vulgar rudderkin was a famous cat a cat who was cater cousin to the great 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 grandmother of grimalkin the first cat in the cattery of an old woman who was tried for bewitching a daughter of the countess of rutland in the beginning of the sixteenth century the monodus connects him with cats of great renown in the annals of witchcraft a science whereto they have been allied as poor old women one of whom it appears on the authority of an old pamphlet entitled news from scotland etc printed in the year fifteen ninety one confessed that she took a cat and christened it etc and that in the night following the cat was conveyed into the middle of the sea by these witches sailing in their riddles or sieves and so left the cat right before the town of leith in scotland this done there did arise such a tempest at sea as a greater hath not been seen etc again it is confessed that the said christened cat was the cause of the king's majesty's ship at his coming forth of denmark had a contrary wind to the rest of the ships then being in his company which thing was mostly strange and true as the king's majesty acknowledgeth for when the rest of the ships had a fair and good wind then was the wind contrary and altogether against his majesty etc in some parts black cats are said to bring good luck and in scarborough henderson's folklore of the northern counties a few years ago sailors wives were in the habit of keeping one thinking thereby to ensure the safety of their husband at sea this consequently gave black cats a value that no one else could keep them as they were nearly always stolen there are various proverbs which attach equal importance to this lucky animal as for example when the cat of the house is black the lasses of lovers will have no lack and again kiss the black cat and twill make ye fat kiss the white and twill make ye lean in scotland there is a children's rhyme upon the purring of a cat durdum drum three threads and a thumb 
thrum gray thrum gray in devonshire and wiltshire it is believed that a may cat or in other words a cat born in the month of may will never catch any rats or mice but contrary to the want of cats will bring into the house snakes and slow worms and other disagreeable reptiles. In Huntingdonshire it is a common saying that a May kitten makes a dirty cat. If a cat should leap over a corpse, it is said to portend misfortune. Gaw, in his sepulchral monuments, said that in Orkney, during the time of the corpse, remains in the house, all the cats are locked up and the looking-glass is covered over. In Devonshire a superstition prevails that a cat will not remain in a house with an unburied corpse, and stories are often told how, on the death of one of the inmates of the house, the cat has suddenly made its disappearance and not returned again until after the funeral. The sneezing of a cat, says Brand, Popular Antiquities, 1849, Volume 3, page 187, appears to have been considered as a lucky omen to a bride who was to be married on the succeeding day. In Cornwall, says Hunt, those little gatherings which come on children's eyelids, locally called Wilkes, and also warts, are cured by passing the tail of a black cat nine times over the place. If a ram cat, the cure is more certain. In Ireland it is considered highly unlucky. Sailors are very superstitious as regards cats. If a black cat comes on board, it is a presage of disaster. If the ship's cat is more lively than ordinary, it is a sign of wind. But if the cat is accidentally drowned, then there is consternation, which does not wear off until the vessel is safe in harbor. Lady Wilde, in her Irish legends, gave a cat story quite of a fairy type, and well in keeping with many of witchcraft and sorcery. One dark, cold night, as an old woman was spinning, there came three taps at her door, and not until after the last did she open it, when a pleading voice said, "'Let me in! Let me in!' And a handsome black cat with a white breast and two white kittens entered. The old woman spun on, and the cats purred loudly, till the mother puss warned her that it was very late, that they wanted some milk." and that the fairies wanted her room that night to dance and sup in. The milk was given, the cats thanked her, and said they would not forget her kindness. But ere they vanished up the chimney, they left her a great silver coin, and the fairies had their ball untroubled by the old woman's presence, for the pussy's warning was a gentle hint. If a kitten comes to a house in the morning it is lucky, if in the evening it portends evil of some kind, unless it stays to prevent it. A cat's hair is said to be indigestible, and if one is swallowed, death will ensue. Milton, in his Astrologaster, page 48, tells us, that when the cat washes her face over her ears, we shall have a fine store of rain. Lord Westmoreland, in a poem, To a cat bore me company in confinement, says, Scratch but thine ear, then boldly tell what weather's drawing near. A cat sneezing appears to be a lucky omen to a bride. It was a vulgar notion that cats, when hungry, would eat coals, and even to this day, in some parts, there is a doubt about it. In the tamer tamed, or woman's pride, is almost says to Moroso, I learned to eat coals with a hungry cat. And in Bodica, the first daughter says, They are cowards, eat coals like compelled cats. The crying of cats, ospreys, ravens, or other birds upon the tops of houses in the night are observed by the vulgar to pre signify death to the sick. Brand. There is also superstition that cats will suck the breath of infants. Nothing could be more ridiculous. The formation of the cat's mouth is not well adapted for such action, the under jaw being shorter than the upper, which is one reason why it laps fluids instead of drinking. Cats will creep into cradles, but for no other purpose than that of sleep, the bed and clothes being warm and soft, 
and of course comfortable. Yet, instead of doing harm, they help to keep the child's temperature more even in cold weather. Of course, if they lie on the infant, it is a different matter. Weather Notions Signs of Foul Weather by Dr. Erasmus Darwin In a poem, the well-known relatives of the eminent Charles Darwin describes the various natural indications of coming storms. Among the animals and birds, he notes the cat. Low o'er the grass the swallow wings, the cricket too, how sharp he sings. Puss on the hearth with velvet paws, sits wiping o'er his whiskered jaws. In England, says Mr. T. F. Thistleton Dyer, the superstitious still hold the cat in high esteem, and oftentimes, when observing the weather, attribute much more importance to its various movements. Thus, according to some, when they sneeze it is a sign of rain. And Herrick, in his Hesperides, tells us how True calendars as puss's ear, Washed o'er to tell what change is near. It is a common notion that when a cat scratches the legs of a table, it is a prognostic of change of weather. John Swan, in his Speculum Mundi, Cambridge, 1643, writing of the cat, says, she useth therefore wash her face with her feet, which she licketh and moistened with her tongue. And it is observed by some that if she put her feet beyond the crown of her head, in this kind of washing, it is a sign of rain. Indeed, in the eyes of the superstitious, there is scarcely a movement of the cat which is not supposed to have some significance. Cats are exceedingly fond of valerian, and in Topsell's Four-Footed Beasts, 1658, page 81, we find the following curious remarks. The root of the herb valerian, called foo, is very like to the eye of a cat, and, wheresoever it groweth, if the cats come thereunto, they instantly dig it up for the love thereof, as I myself have seen in mine own garden, for it smelleth moreover like a cat." There is also an English rhyme on the plant marum to the following effect. If you see it, the cats will eat it. If you sow it, the cats will know it. In Suffolk, cats' eyes are supposed to dilate and contract with the flow and ebb of the tide. In Lancashire, the common people have an idea that those who play much with cats never have good health. Mr. T. F. Thistleton, Dyer's English Folklore. If tincture of valerium is sprinkled on a plant or bush, the neighboring cats roll and rub themselves on or against it, often biting and scratching the plant to pieces. H. W. In Lancashire it is regarded as unlucky to allow a cat to die in a house. Hence, when they are ill, they are usually drowned. Harlan and Wilkson's Lancashire Folklore, page 141. At Christ Church, Spitalfields, there is a benefaction for the widows of weavers under certain restrictions called cat and dog money. There is a tradition in the parish that money was given in the first instance to cats and dogs. Howard's Old English Customs, page 54. If a cat tears at the cushions, carpet, and other articles of furniture with its claws, it is considered a sign of wind. Hence the saying, the cat is raising the wind. Mr. Parks notes in his copy of Born and Brand's Popular Antiquities, page 92, says, Cats sitting with their tails to the fire, or washing with their paws behind their ears, are said to foretell a change of weather. In Pooley's play, The Novice, is the line, Air Gill, our cat, can lick her ear. This is from Brand, and I do not think it refers to the weather, but to an impossibility. End of section 26